Hey, do it here. Welcome back. Week in review. Good to be back. And uh, some interesting re research to share this week. So uh, let's jump right in. And, you know, so last week I was talking about uh, Judaism and uh, truth concepts in Judaism. You know, I've been uh, doing the last few weeks on uh, truth. And you know, I saw, so I've covered the main philosophical theories of truth, like the correspondence theory of truth, the coherence theory of truth, uh, pragmatism. And then last week I, I looked at the Judeo concept. And in fact, you know, over two weeks, I, I read some of uh, you know, the basic uh, truth as a virtue, you know, in terms of. Uh, the biblical precepts of the Ten Commandments. Hey, Michael, good to see you. Um, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, the biblical precepts, if you want to uh, chat, feel free to uh, hop on. Yeah, so the biblical precepts, you know, the Ten Commandments focus on um, truth as a virtue and falseness as a sin. So, you know, the Ten Commandments of don't uh, give false testimony, and that would either be causing damage to another person or financial crimes. You know, usually the damage of false testimony is financial, but you know, like you know, God forbid, it could also be testifying that some someone did something that they didn't, in terms of trying to get someone uh, punished for a crime that they didn't commit, or trying to uh, get someone exonerated from a crime that they did commit. God forbid. But uh, most of falseness in the Mosaic law is related to um, not being fair in business and things that would give you a financial advantage uh, unfairly, or that would uh, you actually be a method of like stealing, of damaging property, of getting the better end of a financial deal that would be in line with stealing. And then later in the rabbinic commentary, you have truth as a virtue, and you know the sense that uh, truth should be a character a trait that a person aims towards, in the sense that it's near impossible. Like the perfect person is truthful, and uh, truthfulness in relation to how good of a person are you in terms of uh, corresponding to the law, following the law, and various aspects. And you then also mentioned truth in relationship to you know the famous expression broke dynamis, uh, you know, blessed are you, as the true judge. And Claire came on and we talked about the book of Job in relationship to the question of evil and the problem of suffering, in the sense you know the truth behind God's judgment that God's judgment is true, and even though we can't decipher how God is just. We believe that God is all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing. And if things appear to be operating in a different fashion, you know, God forbid, like uh, suffering, the righteous suffering or the righteous being rewarded, that ultimately God is truthful. And you know, when the truth is revealed, that it will be seen that God was right, God was just, all the judgment was accurate. And then you know, then you have the Kabbalist, and I was mentioning the modern-day readership on rabbinic understandings in uh, terms of God's will being manifested through the Jewish people, and the expression in the Talmud, like, Elu ve, Elu divre Elohim chayim, in terms of, like, truth is like a process, or multiple truths, pluralism, and the Jewish people somewhat as God's partner in the truth, that, uh, you know, there's, like, an ultimate truth from the God's eye perspective, but in the lower realm, the material realm, that truth is somewhat foreign within you, know, the Jewish people. And then, uh, you know, so today we're going to get more into some of the Germanic thinkers, Kant and Heidegger and Frege, and their conception of truth. And you know, to some extent, um, you know, they claim to come the Greek tradition and in opposition to Judaism. That uh, you know, Kant. Frege and Heidegger in their conception of truth is in their own words, and we'll look into this, 
some sort of self-proclamation is that it's the opposition to Judaism and that Judaism intrinsically has some sort of falseness or opposition to their understanding of truth. And then also we see like you know the Greek tradition of mathematics, soundness, coherence, logical form of you know the Hilbert uh, Frege debate that we're going to talk about more also in terms of truth in a mathematical logical sense um, as opposed to the religious sense or the moralistic sense that uh, you know Judaism mostly collects connects truth to morals and doing the right thing being honest although there is a connection to a correspondence that you know you're honest when you correspond to reality specifically to uh, financial, uh, transactions and being fair in your financial dealings. However, the logical, the Greek school, the Germanic school, the science, uh, uh, logical mathematics school is that truth is more about the understanding of the material realm and pragmatic. So there's a lot to cover. I have a lot of, uh, interesting articles and let me make a blessing. And, uh, you know, this truth is a big topic, and this might be the last week, I guess it's uh, four, th four weeks now, basically a month, on truth, so this might be the last week that I will be doing the deep dive into truth, um, although it will be a topic I will be coming back to, especially you know, in, you know, maybe more the mathematical, logical form which could be more important than, the, you know, the hypothetical morality form. And, you know, God forbid the, the nine days, Thursday is Tish above, and, you know, the, the serious 25-hour fast day, uh, commemoration of the destruction of the temple. So to talk about uh, your Judaic issue, Jewish suffering, and a lot of these issues with, like, Heidegger, and we'll look at some of this in terms of... Uh, Kant and Heidegger are at the heart of levels of rising anti-Semitism. We'll look at Heidegger in depth in his uh, views on Jews and compare it to the rising New Right or various uh, elements. So hope to stick around. And so let me... Uh, at my screen share, just show a few links. I was just watching this. Uh, you know, I saw a lot of media this week on Barbie and Oppenheimer, Barbenheimer, or whatever they're calling it. And like all over the media, like every single newspaper was focusing on the release of like Barbie is going to be the biggest movie ever. And in Oppenheimer, the importance Oppenheimer is such an important movie. And you know, across the boards had like positive reviews, uh, New York times, almost every paper was just, uh, you know, for this whole week was hyping up Barbie and Oppenheimer. And I'm not sure how, like, I'm not going to go see the movies. I'm not sure there's much values in movies. I think, you know, the Hollywood strike movies are on the decline in general, although, you know, it's interesting why there was so much hype around these movies and, you know, whether they actually will be such big movies or have an impact. Um, you know, Oppenheimer is tangential to what we're talking about today because, uh, you know, the mass migration of uh, German Jews out of Germany into the United States and, uh, you know, Judeo-Germanic uh, conflict in the sciences. Um, but I didn't watch Opp Oppenheimer, didn't prepare anything for it. Uh, so, yeah, I saw Ben Shapiro... I actually watched the whole thing of Ben Shapiro and Two Speed on his like uh, bashing Barbie. And it's tough to say, like, I, you know, I'm not a movie guy nor like Barbie. Uh, yeah, but uh, I did notice it's being hyped. And like on the news article, like everything is like glaring positive about it. And, you know, then some of like the right wing complaints and the, the gender wars in various aspects it could be coming into the elections in terms of uh society trying to move society forward um 
racial dynamics and gender dynamics are at the heart of the culture wars. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, politics in terms of uh, your gender equality and various things. So not sure. I thought that was randomly, you know, noteworthy that it was so much in the news this week. Um, here was a video I found on as if ism, mathematics and method without metaphysics and talks a little bit about the Frege Hilbert uh, controversy. It's actually hard to find too much good material on it. Um, Richard Lynn um, passed away this week, uh, who had done work with Ed Dutt. And I have Richard Lynn's book on Jewish intelligence, Jewish achievement. And I guess he was from like the Jared Taylor um, race realist right school of philo-Semitism. And we'll see some more of this in the, you know, like Heidegger and Frege, where, um, you know, he was convinced that Jews genetically had superior intelligence and that was the largest explanatory effect in the disproportionate uh, success of Jews and historical impact, although also that uh, that there was group conflict and that uh, Jews were distinct um, non-European or mixed European group that had a conflicting interest with Europeans. So Richard Lynn into his 93, I saw that he was publishing like 20 papers in his 80s. So Richard Lynn, the life of a work, study of intelligence, controversial figure uh, there with Edward Dutton. Edward Dutton, by far um, my most popular video besides for the Ask the Rabbi number seven, with a handsome truth, God forbid. But, uh, you know, recent times, you know, Edward Dutton, uh, that constantly gets views on my channel. And uh, so... You know, God bless, rest in peace, Richard Lynn. I was reading a book on truth theory, and um, here's a little chart on deflationary theory, robust theory. You know, so does truth have a nature? Uh, if no, does true express a property of any sort? If uh, yes, that's a minimalistic theory of truth. If no, a redundancy theory disquotionalism, performative theory, or pro um, is a does truth have a nature? If yes, does it have more than one nature? So yes, if the truth has more than one nature, it's a pluralistic theory. The multiple truth hypothesis is not necessarily a pluralistic theory. theory. It's just saying we as humans and the problem of empiricism can't know whether truth has one or more natures and have to treat the possibility that truth could be pluralistic without declaring that truth is pluralistic and say, if no truth is not pluralistic is truth at least partly epistemic and say, yes, then it's a pragmatist verificationist coherence or postmodernist theory. And if no, it's a not epistemic uh, theory, then it's truth in relation between mind and the world. So if yes, that's correspondence theory uh, or no, then you have identity theory and in the middle primitivism, um, or Heideggerian theory. So I thought that chart was a little bit helpful. Okay, so here's some links related to some of the things we're going to be talking about. This is a famous book related to mathematics in Germany and um, German mathematicians fleeing Germany, Nazi Germany, largely to the West. So um, this book by Reinhard Sigmund Schultz uh, is one of uh, you know, like the main books on the issue. So I located a free copy online. Here's another book I read this week in preparation for the stream. Um, Transcending Tradition, Jewish Mathematicians in German-Speaking Academic Culture. I also read a general history of Gattingen, um, one of the major, major mathematical institutes. And you could see some of the, you know, the history you know, with the uh, Gattingen was uh, where Gauss was, uh, you know, stationed in mathematics and uh, Riemann and Dirschet, uh, Dirschlet and Pankier, and then, you know, Felix, uh, Felix uh, Klein and David Hilbert 
and um, and then at a certain point became overwhelmingly Jewish. So I think Riemann was one of the first people to not publish scientific papers in Latin. And so there are two things. One, that they no longer forced Jews to convert to Christianity. And this wasn't like the Royal Society, but uh, you know, just uh, university and studies in mathematics. So they didn't require the conversion to Christianity, and they didn't require publications to be in Latin. And so you just see a list of names of some of these you know, Jewish uh, mathematicians and you know, the war period where more than half of them left uh, most to the U.S., some to um, Israel and, and you know, a handful of other places. And you know, little maps of uh, you know, the Halley and uh, Bonn, Heidelberg, Berlin, um, Göttingen. Göttingen will be one of the key centers of mathematicians that teamed up with Einstein on the theory of relativity. And we'll be looking quite a bit at Göttingen today and the rise of Jewish mathematicians to where before the war, it uh, you know, could have been 30, 40% uh, Jewish in some of these math departments in Germany and, you know, also physics with, uh, um, you know, like Oppenheimer, the big uh, name this week. So here is an article. These are things I read in preparation for today's stream, if people want to look at uh, the rise and fall of the Aryan physicist, referring to um, Stark. Um, and we're going to look more at Stark and uh, his your rise and fall and his critiques of Judaism. You know, he won the Nobel Prize. And so we're going to look more at Stark, but here's a longer article. Um, here's another article about mathematics and uh, Göttingen. In this, you know, uh, Felix, uh, sorry, uh, um, yeah, Felix Klein, Christian Felix Klein, who uh, happened to be the son-in-law. Uh, he married the daughter of Hegel, so the connection between. Hegel's historicism and mathematics that Felix Klein, um, who was not Jewish, although Klein generally um, is a popular Jewish name, Felix Klein married the daughter of the granddaughter of Hegel. And he headed the mathematics uh, department before Hilbert in Göttingen, which was previously headed by your know, big names such as Gauss and uh, other big names were there, such as uh, Riemann. And, you know, we'll try to look a little bit at, at the mathematics. And so this is, uh, you know, interesting history. Um, we'll also try to look a little bit here at Hermann Cohn and Kant. And, you know, we're looking at the differences between Jewish and Germanic understandings of the sciences. So Hermann Cohn, um, who taught at Jewish schools is one of the main founders of neo-Kantianism and uh, was uh, you know, largely taken over by Cassier. We'll look at Cassier's 1929 Davis uh, debate, Davos debate with uh, Heidegger. Uh, but you know, Herman Cohn is the shift from Kantianism to neo-Kantianism and we'll look at some of this. Was Neo-Kantianism a Judaic movement? And we'll look at Cohn's, um, how he interpreted Kant's critiques of Judaism, even though Cohn was, you know, the leader of the Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism and tried to take a philo-Semitic approach or even a, a pro-Jewish approach to Kantianism. So we'll look a little bit more about this. So this article a little bit different on uh, Herman Cohn's uh, monotheism and uh, theological uh, takes we'll look, you know, a little of his interpretation of Judaism. And here is 
another article by Jacques Derrida um, on Kant interpretations at war, Kant the Jew and the German, looking at uh, you know some of these issues of the disputes between Jewish and German understanding of philosophy, mathematics, and logic. Um, here, related to one of the book that I just shared, is was an exhibit at uh, the Frankfurt uh, Museum that traveled around a few years and was at different institutes and in Israel on transcending tradition, Jewish mathematicians and Jew German-speaking academic culture, and just a history of Jewish science before the war. And uh, you, you so pictures, and I'm not sure if uh, you could see an online exhibition or if it's still around, but uh, you know, we're going to look more into uh, you the glory day of German Jewry before the war, and not necessarily religious Jewry. A lot of these Jews were largely assimilated. Many of them had converted to Christianity or married uh, non-Jewish spouses, but uh, still um, um, and here we have combinatorics. So this is just a short article about the founding of Hebrew University, which was largely also founded by German Jews who had left Israel for left Germany for Israel. Although we'll see that the majority of German Jews, like Einstein and Oppenheimer, left Israel for, left Germany for America. But the foundational Ashkenazic stock of like Barlan University, Hebrew University, um, and you know, the Supreme Court and various things were largely German Jews. Um, a Sandra, thanks for tuning in. Greatest merchants in history. Um, well, the Jews were more the middlemen of the financial aspects. So, I mean, Jews to some extent are the greatest merchants, but it's more from the financial aspects. And to a certain aspect, um, the merchant aspect of the Jews is the Semitic, the Arabness. So you have the financial aspect and Jews somewhat creating the financial system, um, a large part of uh, the stock market, the joint stock exchange, the insurance exchanges, um, banking. However, the generic merchantism of Judaism largely comes from our Semitic blood and Arab culture and the Silk Road. So I, mean, I don't know if I'd call Vikings great merchants, I mean, they might have been great merchants to a certain uh, you know, respect, but I think the Silk Road and it's really Arabs at the center of the Silk Road. So, I mean, you have China, obviously, and, and various merchants, but I, I, I would put Arabs. And even in today's society, like here in Metro Detroit, Arabs, um, you know, dominate many of uh, import, export. And it's like Jews are merchant, merchant culture. However, you wear small people, and it's a lot more the financial aspect of um, the merchant trade. And a lot of our partners are, you know, in fact, Arab and rely on the Silk Road, which uh, you know, is, is global. And also, I'm not sure the Vikings are enough of a global people. So, you know, maybe Vikings to a certain extent. I don't know much about their merchant history. Um, but you know, say, were they global merchants? How well are Vikings known today? I mean, obviously, have like Ikea, if, if you want to call it like Viking culture or the Wallenbergs or, or things like that. But, uh, you know, I would say Judeo-Arab Silk Road. Um, here's another longer article on Kant, foreign spirits in the nation of Kant, racializing anti-Semitism and the secularization of German philosophy. And, you know, so we're going to look at Herman Cohn and the pro-Jewish understanding of neo-Kantianism, and then also try to see the counter-Semitic understanding of Kant and how Kant became important for uh, National Socialism and the Nazi Party. Um, I couldn't find a really good article 
on your Frege. Frege passes away, um, I think, in the 20s. Euphrates dies in 1925, um, and Frege, in his diary that comes out much later, writes some semi-counter-Semitic things. It's unclear how counter-Semitic it is. Um, you know, more like group theory, or or uh, so. There's different aspects of Frege's counter-Semitism. One, hey Dave, good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Got a lot of interesting material here. So Frege, um, and we're going to look at why Frege is so important for the foundation of mathematics and logic and more at Frege's dispute with Hilbert and a little bit of the racialist counter-Semitic interpretations of Frege. And Frege, you know, so to say that uh, Kant, Frege, and Heidegger, in their own words, phrase their theories of truth as an opposition to Judaism. Their understanding, whatever Judaism stands for, and their understanding, their theory of truth is an opposition to Judaism. And you will see that there's a lot of Jews who like Heidegger. And Frege is not as well known outside of mathematics and logic as someone like Heidegger, who you know is well-read and popular, his uh, being in time, as opposed to Frege, is more abstract, but in terms of like the rise of modern mathematics and logic, Frege is probably one of the top three, top five important names, probably more important than Heidegger. Um, you know, Frege, like Heidegger, we're going to see Heidegger has his diary that gets translated and comes out 50 years, you know, like 1990s. So Frege's diary comes out, um, you know, like in the 1990s, and there's a lot of counter Semitic statements including his support for Hitler and National Socialism, although he dies in 1925. So um, Frege early comments on being a significant difference between Jews and German and claiming that there's a connection between truth, philosophy, logic, scientific way of looking at the world and race and that uh, the way Jews look at things is different from the way that Germans look at things. And in opposition, so to say, to Hilbert, who Hilbert is a pacifist, Hilbert is an internationalist, and Hilbert is philo-Semitic. Hilbert is also much more prominent in social circles and university and teaching students. Frege is more an intellectual. I'm not sure if Frege so much was a position where he headed universities, where he was prominent in societies, and he taught students and uh, nurtured students. Uh, you know, so Hilbert, uh, you know, we've talked about him at length, and we're going to talk about him more. But however, Frege's works on the foundation of arithmetic is, till today, really the basic foundation of modern arithmetic, modern logic. And uh, so we'll look a little bit at this, I couldn't find a really good article. Um, this has some of the information here. Um, this article, and he mostly is quoting this book of um, Hirsch, What is Mathematical Reality? That uh, I didn't have a chance to look at this. Um, of Ruben Hirsch. That I guess you know, he classifies Frege as a Platonist and he has you know, so Hirsch here is critiquing it. And so that it wasn't the greatest article. So um and mention I'm not sure if you've heard of this Dave if you're familiar with the Cassier Cassier Heidegger debate of 1929. So we're going to talk about Hermann Cohn. And Hermann Cohn is the founder of the Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism. And Neo-Kantianism, extremely important, leading into the Vienna Circle. And, uh, you know, so we said Göttingen was one of the centers of mathematics. And you have the Vienna Circle, which is 
Ernst Mach and the foundation of the philosophy of science. And Heidegger is um, in Fried, Friedberg. So you know, the various schools and, and Heidegger takes over the chair of Herschel, who in Herschel is Jewish. Herschel, like one of the fathers of phenomenology. And so Heidegger, when he was relatively young, in his 40 years old, two years after he had published Being in Time, he debates Ernst Cassier. At that time, Ernst Cassier um, was 55 years old, so he was uh, and more established. So Ernst Cassier had taken over for Herman Cohn as the head of the Marburg School and one of the leaders of neo-Kantianism. He also had the Southwestern School of neo-Kantianism and leading into like the Vienna Circle and the philosophy of science. And, uh, you know, I've talked about that at length and we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So they had a conference at Davos University, like, uh, you know, now you have the Davos Forum. So, you know, Davos was a place for conferences. And, you know, at that point, Cassier was a big name. Heidegger was a new big name because he had published Being in Time, which had immediately became very popular. And, um, yeah, we're going to talk about Hannah Arden also. And, uh, you know, the Black Diaries. I have a lot about Heidegger today. So, you know, good. We got our friend from uh, Switzerland or Sweden. I'm not sure if you're near Davos uh, or if, uh, or if you, if you're familiar with the Cassier Heidegger debate. And Heidegger refutes neo Kantianism. And, you know, Heidegger remained friends with Cassier for the remainder of his life. Cassier lived into the early 40s. And I think he remained in Germany. And, you know, he would have been in his 70s when he passed away. And uh, um, the debate was about Kantianism. And, you know, so your Cassier argues that while Kant's critique of pure reason emphasizes human temporality and finitude, he also sought to situate human cognition within a broader conception of humanity. Cassius challenges Heidegger's relativism by invoking the universal validity of truths discovered by the exact and moral sciences. After the series of debates, Heidegger wrote Kant, and the, prob and the problem of metaphysics, perhaps in response to this encounter of Cassier and Continental Divide, Heidegger, Cassier, and Davos by Peter Gordon from Harvard. I was looking at that book, Reconstruction of the Debate, and of note, Rudolf Carnup and Joseph B. Salvechik, Rabbi Salvechik, uh, uh, eventually the rabbi at Yeshiva University, who ordained thousands of rabbis and set up modern orthodoxy in the United States, was present in the audience at Davos. And we're going to look at the effect of Heidegger on Rabbi Salvechik. And we'll see that although Heidegger has some levels of counter Semitism, we're going to look a little, we're going to look quite a bit about Heidegger's counter Semitism. And Heidegger becomes a Nazi, supports the Nazi party, uh, looks at there being a competition of Jews and Germans and um, a group strategy of Jews being counter the best interest of Germans. However, he has positive, warm relations with Jews. Uh, you know, even uh, you know, Cassier through the end of his life, you know, Hannah Ardent, many of his students. And in many ways, Heidegger's philosophy is held in high regard by many Jews. And you know, Rabbi Salvechik, um, Sholem Hartman, you know, the being and becoming, um, some reform Judaism, and various aspects. So um, you are know, gonna look deeper into Heidegger, but uh, you know, just if you're not familiar with this pivotal event, the 1929, some people claim that it's like Jewish versus German debate. The the main difference here is you know the like the Neo-Kantian um Judeo interpretation versus the Kantian anti-Semitic interpretation. And say like Kant himself is opposed to Judaism. So Herman Cohn, and we're going to look at Herman Cohn's defense of Kant and his kind of whitewashing of Kant's anti-Semitism. And 
although you know Heidegger and you know God forbid we're gonna, like Heidegger's view on the Holocaust, where to some extent Heidegger has the views that God forbid the Jews did it to ourselves, that we caused it upon ourselves, and it's a nature of what he, he considers this opposition to truth that Judaism represents. So um, we're going to cover this today. And I have some PowerPoint. So that is my introduction there. And you want to look at some slides. So let's start. I have three slide shares I want to show. And let's start with this on. Okay, let's first look at this article, Story Maps, that just talks about a little bit about um, Jewish and uh, Jews' prominence in German math and science and academics and the foundation for setting up science in America that partially relates to the exodus of, Ger of Jews from Germany and you know, with Oppenheimer being the big news this week, uh, although I'm not sure this mentions Oppenheimer. Um, so you know, just a little history. The Emergency Committee Fueling a Mathematical Immigration. On January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler assumed the chancellorship of Germany, marking a culmination of the Nazi Party's rise to power. Violence and terror ensued, and as Hitler launched a devastating genocide against the Jews and other non-Aryans and initiated a ruthless rampage through Europe, Hitler's reign brought immense pain, suffering, and destruction to millions throughout Europe and across the world. However, amidst the dark injustices perpetrated by Hitler and the Nazis, he made a dramatic ground-shifting impact on global mathematics and beauty. The, this project aims to explore Hitler and the Nazis' effect on mathematics, especially that brutal anti-Semitism facilitated a migration of the mathematics community from Germany to the United States. To establish this causal link, I will analyze the forces that pushed Jewish mathematicians out of Nazi Germany, the mechanisms by which Jewish mathematicians emigrated to the United States, and the subsequent impact of the migration on the American mathematics community. Specifically, first, I will show how anti-Semitic legislation and social bigotry forced Jewish mathematicians out of Nazi Germany. Then I will explore how American mathematicians and other scientists formed alliances and raised funding to aid displaced foreign scholars and find them a home in American universities. Lastly, I will investigate how this migration resulted in the passing of the mathematical torch from Germany to the United States and the establishment of renowned institutions to the positive impact of the high-quality migrant scholars on PhD student success. Anti-Semitism in Germany. Hitler's rampage through Germany did not stop at academic institutions. His rise to power culminated in the expulsion of over 145 Jewish mathematicians. Many of these expelled mathematicians came from Göttingen University, the premier mathematics institution in Germany, and perhaps the entire world. Ludwig Bierbach, a former Felix Klein graduate student from Göttingen helped lead the attack on intellectual Jews as a mouthpiece for the Nazi party. Bierbach decried the Jewish influence in mathematics. He proudly echoed the anti-Semitic stereotypes that Jews thought in the abstract while Arians focused on the real world application. He explained, for example, that while the thought process of Gauss is always deep and clear and inclined to the intuitional and its application, that of Jacobi, and on the other hand, is ever willfully abstract full of intellectual arrogance and a diabolic cleverness in general, a juggling with concepts, and the unmistakable craftiness are distinguished marks of Jewish mathematics. On April 7th, 1933, Hitler introduced a law for the restoration of the professional civil service, excluding Jews, among others, from employment, including involvement in organizations and professorships later that month. Okay, God forbid. Sorry, I lost my screen share. I think I'm still live for whatever reason. I'm using two computers here. 
and I'm sharing from my PC and using the sound from my MacBook. So apologize about that. I'm not sure what happened. There was some sort of StreamYard error. Okay, so we should be back. Sorry about that. So on April 7th, 1933, Hitler introduced the law for the restoration of the professional civil service, excluding Jews, among others, from employment, including involvement in organizations and professorships. Later that month, the Nazis introduced legislation to drastically limit the number of Jews permitted at students at universities. Hitler's rise also brought tremendous anti-Semitism to Göttingen as it did seemingly everywhere in Germany. By April 1933, the majority of the student body identified with the Nazi party. Most Jewish professors either were fired or quit, and those remained faced immense backlash and boycotts. For example, Jewish Gottinger professor Edmund Landau attempted in September 1933 to push through the anti-Semitism and continued to hold lecture. Gottingen students boycotted his course and subsequently forced his resignation aiding display scholars. Meanwhile, as Hitler launched into his master plan, the Great Depression ravaged the United States of America. Many Americans lost their jobs and faced extreme poverty. Yet the conditions in the United States far ex exceeded those for non-Aryans living under Hitler's Reich, thus an abundance of Jews, for an abundance of Jews, including many Jewish scholars and other non-Aryans desperately tried to cross the Atlantic and seek refuge within the border of the United States, Unfortunately, strict immigration quotas imposed severe difficulties on moving to the United States. However, luckily for mathematicians and other scholars, a special amendment exempted professors appointed to American universities from the quota. This special amendment came in the form of a Section 4D of the Immigration Act of 1924, signed by Private President Calvin Coolidge. While the exemption certainly helped, it did not ease the difficulty for displaced Jewish scholars in actually finding a university position in the first place. The Great Depression, Depression stifled the growth of American academia. Mathematicians enjoyed few research opportunities and received little pay. Few scholars, the research projects positions were available, and to make matters worse, anti-Semitism in American academia added yet another hurdle for Jewish mathematicians fleeing Europe. For example, American academics often concluded that the number of Jews in a given institution must be limited, and preferably limited to one. Despite these tremendous barriers to success, many Jewish scholars found employment when they fled the United States. This they owed uh, in large part to Oswald Veblen uh, and RGD Richardson and the Rockefeller Foundation. Apologize, I lost my screen share there again. I think th this uh, thing is very visually intensive and it's eating up huge amounts of my memory. So uh, apologize about that. But uh, so I'm just trying to get through this and because this, uh, this uh, particular article is eating huge amounts of memory. In May of 1933, Veblen approached the Rockefeller Foundation with concerns regarding Nazi attacks against German academia. That very same month, Veblen and the Foundation, reacting to the horrors of Nazi Germany, worked together to found the Emergency Committee to Place Foreign Scholars. Veblen served as the mathematical mind of the committee, while the Rockefeller Foundation provided the funding. Veblen, along with his committee colleague, Herman Weil, Work to place European refugee scholars in academic positions, specifically research-oriented positions on American soil. These research positions were usually temporary, but would ideally become permanent down the line. Veblen scrupulously granted information on each and every applicant. He assessed their scholarship, personality, adaptability, and teaching ability, and reached out to European colleagues if this information was not readily available in the States. Through this work, the Emergency Committee facilitated a tremendous movement of mathematics Matic scholars from Gottingen to the east coast of the United States. Interestingly, mathematicians found some of the earliest targets for rescue by the emergency committee as they were quick, quickly recognized not just for their importance to science as a whole, but also for their influence in organizations and for many of their active stances 
against the Nazi party. In fact, mathematics received more aid from the committee than any other field of science. In May of 1933, just weeks after the founding of the committee, R.G.D. Richardson, the chairman of the Brown University Mathematics Department, took notice of the committee's work. Richardson proposed to cooperate with the committee and accept displaced scholars fleeing Nazi Germany at Brown University. Other universities soon followed suit. The president of Illinois established a group to work with the emergency committee, and New York University accepted Richard Current, a committee appointee, to lead their graduate mathematics program. On a personal level, Richardson felt a strong animus towards the Nazi party, for example, he wrote to the president of the American Jewish Congress that our organization views with dismay and utmost, almost incredulity the developments in Germany. Nearly all German mathematicians aided by the committee held post at Göttingen. This is not particularly surprising as Göttingen was the focal point of mathematics in early 20th century Germany. However, that the committee relocated so many Göttingen scholars in America and at such prominent institutions is certainly reflective of a foreign impact on the American mathematical community. This impact came not just from the sheer number of mathematicians from Göttingen, but also from the culture they brought with them, the mathematical philosophy of Göttingen that once attracted so many young Americans to German Germany physically migrated to American soil. While the committee's work for German mathematicians predominantly encompassed Jack Gattingen scholars. They also relocated German mathematicians from the University of Frankfurt and the University of Breslau to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the University of Pennsylvania, respectively. In his piece, Quality Matters, the Expulsion of Professors and the Consequences for PhD Student Outcome in Nazi Germany, Fabian Wallinger attempts to show a link between faculty quality and success of PhD students. To do this, Wallingen gathered data from faculty productivity based on his publication, top academic journals. He then averaged the quality rating of each faculty member at an institution to determine the overall quality of the institution. Then he compares the data to the success markers of PhD students, such as published dissertations in top academic journals and assumptions of a full-time scholarship. His results show that faculty quality is found to have a very sizable effect on the career of former PhD students. More specifically, his results suggest that PhD student outcomes in affected departments deteriorate after the dismissal of high quality professors. Prior to 1933, Germany sat at the forefront of global mathematics. Germany institutions enjoyed high educational quality and produced impressive doctoral students. However, after the 1933 expulsion of German scholars by the Nazi party, German institutions, which led the world in mathematics, experienced a sharp decline in faculty quality and in turn a sharp decline in PhD student success. Students graduating from departments with high quality dismissals saw a much lower probability of publishing their dissertations in a top journal after 1933 and saw a relatively sharp drop in their likelihood of acquiring full-time professorship. The United States functioned as a premier destination for displaced German mathematicians. Many of these mathematicians came from top German institutions. Göttingen lost 60% of its mathematics faculty, while Berlin lost 40% of its mathematics faculty. This signals that not just any mathematicians left Germany, but that many of the best mathematicians left Germany. And as the faculty quality at Göttingen, Berlin, and other German institutions declined, measurable success of PhD students declined correspondingly. Richard Current. The career of Richard Current offers excellent anecdotal evidence supporting the conclusion. Current, a premier faculty member at Göttingen, found his way to the United States and settled at New York University. As the loss of high-quality faculty continued to damage German institutions, New York University, under the leadership of Current, began to produce impressive PhD students. While Current's mathematical abilities played a role, his talents as an educator and as an administrator deserve immense credit in NYU success. Current, from his time at Göttingen, understood that a coherent mathematical community is essential for a program's success. Current was very articulate about the needs of a community of mathematicians for good work, as evidenced by his time not only in Göttingen, but also in his institutional building efforts in New York. Such efforts were not strictly dedicated to intellectual development of mathematics per se, but also include classical music events and gatherings in the current family garden in their home in New Rochelle, about 20 miles outside of the city. Current learned from his time in Germany that a tight-knit mathematical community is crucial to the flourishing of a mathematics department. Current's excellence as an educator, as a faculty member, and as administrator, which he developed during his time in Germany, proved essential to the success of NYU and its PhD students. Conclusion, thus the United States' dominant position of the mathematics community, at least in large part, traces back to Adolf Hitler's expulsion of Jewish academics from Germany. 
However, there is more to the story than the bare narration of Hitler's anti-Semitic policies, the heroic actions of the Emergency Committee, and the positive impact of migrant scholars on American mathematics. This fascinating piece of history discloses a deeper message that is the ties that bind the scientific community can withstand racism, anti-Semitism, and discrimination. The story ought to serve as a warning. Nations that choose to enact discriminatory policies will, in the same stroke, effectively abandon the pursuits of scientific knowledge and innovation. The true scientific community unites in the quest for knowledge and innovation. It cares not for differences in belief, color, ethnicity, and nationality. An attempt to divide persons based on such differences may stifle the pursuit of scientific knowledge that relies so heavily on diversity, cooperation, and community. As this story shows, scientists can rise above discrimination and will protect fellow scholars as brother and sister. Germany, once the force of mathematics, suffered at the hands of Hitler and the Nazis. The United States, through principles of inclusion and generosity, developed a thriving community that remains in place today. But do not just take my word for it. At a banquet in Gottingen in 1934, the Nazi minister of culture asked Gottingen professor David Hilbert whether the Mathematics Institute at Gottingen had indeed suffered since the removal of Jews. Hilbert responded, suffered. It hasn't suffered. Air minister, it doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so we'll look a little bit more at that. And possibly a more apt comparison today would actually be Chinese in America, and you would have more excellence among Chinese Americans and um, the you know, Biden administration and trade wars between China, expulsion or um, xenophobia of Chinese scientists in America would uh, might be, you know, if you're following like the semiconductor or chip crisis, uh, could conceivably be a parallel in the modern debate. And you know, also Russia, when, you know, already in the 80s, to possibly today with uh, the war and the further brain drain. Okay, so let's look at some slides on Heidegger, and we'll see the long-lasting effect on Heidegger and his views as interpreted by nationalists, specifically German nationalists, till today. Um, so Heidegger, after liberalism, Heidegger's influence from the AFD to elements of the new left via metapolitics. So Heidegger and the German new right, so there's the table of contents here. So 1927, being in time, all design, not human beings, have an understanding of being which is historical, thrown into historical culture, members of particular peoples, we are purposeful beings who care for our being, which is an issue for us, but all design can be authentic or inauthentic, misunderstanding or indeed losing any sense of the meaning of being. Authenticity comes from encountering finitude, the inevitability of death. In section 74 of Being in Time, it invokes understanding oneself as part of a generation to achieve a Gemeinschaft of the folk engaged in the struggle for being and identity. So by 1930, Heidegger sympathizes with the National Socialist Party. Um, 1932, the same noted by his teacher, the Jewish uh, Protestant Edmund Herschel, um, that uh, his diaries will show that Heidegger had been writing anti-Semitic things as early as 1916. In 1932 is the year that he sends, mein, that Heidegger sends Mein Kampf to his brother as a gift. And you know, Frege passes away in 1925, and I guess the Beer Hall push where Hitler was put in prison, Frege had written support for Hitler and the Beer Hall push in his diary before he passed away. That would have been 1925. So you have 1932, Heidegger sends a copy of Mein Kampf to his brother as a gift. 1933 joins the National Socialist Party as rector for Friedberg University, gives a series of inflammatory, fiercely pro-Nazi, pro-Hitlerite speeches, delivers highly political lectures and seminar series in which he depicts Nazism as the means to recovering German identity and authenticity, as well as the spiritual renewal of the West. Um, Heidegger here claims linguistic and ethnic linkage of 
Germans and ancient pre-Socratic Greeks, identifies Nazism with the second inception of Western culture, which will undo the first inception's devolution after Plato into rational metaphysics, which has sort of lost the meaning of being. Heidegger on the Shoah, the Holocaust, God forbid, as we know from the Black Notebooks, identifies Jews as the landless, rootless, worldless, history-less people. The Jews profit from an advent of liberalism and socialism, which uproot peoples from their homelands. Modernity led by liberalism is par excellence the Judaized condition. Heidegger knows of Shoah no later than 1941 or two. The highest political act consists in insensibly implicating the enemy in a situation where he finds himself constrained to organize his own self-destruction. What we'll call Shoah in um, the his notebooks, so-called crime for which no one should apologize in the future, in action, which is as nothing also in comparison with Germany's failure to realize its transhistoric mission and enable the second to uh, Anflang conception, the inner truth and greatness of Nazism. So Heidegger's Black Notebooks, which in reality, only like less than 1% of it writes, uh, has anything to do with Jews. I think it's even less than 1% is Heidegger writing about Jews. Although Heidegger refers, God forbid, to the Shoah as an act of Jewish self-destruction and something that the Germans should not apologize for, God forbid. So the new African National Party, the AFD, Heidegger and the AFD. So Bjorn Hack, the AFD leader in Thuringia, um, Germans need, need for the reinvention of traditions through the rediscovery of what he calls authentic history. At the AFD's 2015 National Congress in Hanover, Hack openly referred to Heidegger as Germany's, Germans, we have to ask who we are. We need a yes to the us. The German people has to step out of its forgetfulness of being and return to its order of being. Yes, he concluded, this is Heidegger. And also, is a regular speaker of patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of the accident. So Heidegger and Mark Jungen, a former assistant to the philosopher Peter Sludergic, uh, is now a member of parliament and AFD speaker in the state of Baden-Württemberg. Initially seen as the AFD party philosopher, Jungen wrote his PhD on Heidegger, talks of the great existential menace of the perishing of German culture. What is the menace? The danger today is not so much that we will freeze our identity and commit to an aggressive nationalism, but rather that we lose what is proper to us. So Heidegger and these uh, anti-immigrant organizations and the introduction to uh, the Heidegger issue, uh, the new right proposes a Heideggerian interpretation, evokes the meaningful history of our people in whose heritage we stand. The aim is to include the whole folk in our caring, a key Heideggerian term. The common historical Dasein is presented as the common basis for collective being. Even protesters against the anti-immigrant uh, movement symbolize the existence of the German folk by expressing their care about the German future. Heidegger and the Trans-European Identitarian Movement. The Identitarian Movement was formed around the year 2002, German basis, European scope. Martin Sellner, a philosophical student, leader of the Identitarian Movement, describes his path as thinking to Heidegger, 2015 special edition uh, of the magazine, Heidegger as the essential for real understanding of our time, the mission of our Identitarian camp. Heidegger is a spiritual king. The concept of Dasein is the only true and last enemy in the project of the planetary human state, imperialistic rationality and totalitarian enlightenment. And you know, part of the Heideggerian, like you know, John Morgan, who Duvid knew from University of Michigan, and then went to Hungary and you know, worked with Arctos and uh, Countercurrents and Greg Johnson and Richard Spencer, um, I think refer to themselves as identitarian. And although you know, Spencer is more in terms of the Nietzschean camp, uh, the you know the certain elements of the not just the German New Right but the global New Right of this identitarianism is largely based on Heidegger, and you know now they might be framing it as anti-immigrant or pro-German, um, 
Heidegger himself frames it as counter-Semitic in many ways, and we'll see that later. So into the cultural metapolitical new right, Michael Klanowski, author of the popular German new right blog, Acta de Nura, directs AFD Link's advisor to Frock Petri, former leader of the AFD and assistant of Alexander Gulen, co-leader of the AFD with George Muthen from 2017. Uh, Klanowski calls Heidegger being in time one of his favorite books, quotes Heidegger disciple Ernst Nolte, a Holocaust revisionist, hope that our descendants don't fully dissolve in what Heidegger has called the world civilization. The Metapolitics, German's New Right magazines, uh, the Sessionis Heidegger issue to that February 2015, at the height of the anti-immigrant impact, authors from historians Ernst Nolte to the leader of the identitary movement, Martin Sellner, as per below, the far-right populist magazine Compact argues national sovereignty is needed to overcome the currently widespread idea of historylessness and rule of technology in the shape of global digital totalitarianism. Compact interview with French New Right thought leader Alain de uh, Benoist, globalization as spread of individualism, the religion of human rights, the preeminence of self-interest, the regression of all value for the profit of the market society, and thus the permanent spread of the capitalist uh, Gestell. Gestell is directly Heideggerian term for the immediately post-war works. New Right Art Criticism, the magazine Tumult Review of the Exhibition, The Invention of the Human Races in the Dresden Hygiene Museum, exhibition criticized for suggesting that races are cultural constructs. As so, such suggest equality of equally constructed races, the exhibition implies that any form of thinking human design, like Heidegger, as asserting and unfolding itself in a vertical way through different kinds of being human is illicit. The German New Rights Intelligentsia, Lawrence Jaeger and Martin Lichmetz in Tumult Magazine editorializing the 2017 German elections. Lorenz Jaeger, Jaeger quoted Heidegger's alleged last handwritten words, what is needed is a reflection if and how the era of a technological homogenous world, civilization, a homeland can exist. According to Jaeger, the idea of such an era represents the madness that today enjoys highest recognition by the mainstream. The author can only a God save us. Title refers directly to Heidegger's claim uttered in the famous 1966 Spiegel interview. Total criticism of a modern science and technology, a planetary total and quasi-sacral religion leading to the disenchantment and the vanishing of the mysterious, the mythical, the miraculous, the sacral, the numinous, all of the irrational sources that allegedly nurture meaning. Modern technological existence inframes humanity enacting the uprooting of the human life based on the meaningless shaping of the planet through technology. So Heidegger as the German New Right uh, mastermind. So Julian Gopfarth in Rethinking the German Nation as a German Design. The German New Right intellectuals use Heidegger's vernacular terminology to legitimize an exclusive nationalism based not on the illicit idea of race, but on history, non-biological rational essentialism. The German essence is historical, hence cultural. It involves self-assertion of the folk self-assertion is existential and decisional as the rectorship speech put it no one can make us will this we must do it ourselves not simply biological but like biological conceptualizations this implies that peoples who do not share german historicity like semitic nomads or even slavs cannot ever be german julian and gopfarth reconceptualizing an exclusive nationalism in such a way may allow them to appeal to greater audiences and intellectual circles alike Heidegger becomes increasingly critical from within National Socialists of the direction of the National Socialists, like many Nazi intellectuals, divides inner truth and greatness of the Biwungung from its actuality, a turning that can be dated between 1934 and 1942. Nazism for Heidegger promises release from modernity within twin Judaized rootless technological poles of liberalism and socialism, Germans, the middle metaphysical people, caught in the pincers, have rolled historical responsibility to overcome these twin avatars of modernity. Requires a post philosophical overcoming of accidental metaphysics, which had uprooted people from on troops of being from Plato to Nietzsche to Marxism. Yet actual Nazism failed to do, hence, it failed its world historical mission. Hence, Heidegger could be appealed to as not a Nazi, 
a critic from the acceptable right of Nazism. You see also Heidegger is extremely popular in Israel and among Zionist thinkers in that many of Heidegger's philosophy has been, you know, sort of say deracinated from Germans and applied to Jews in Israel. In many ways, Israel might be the pinnacle of Heideggerian thought put into praxis today. And we'll see that, uh, you know, later when we read about uh, Rabbi Salvechik. Why Nazism as a modern, so legitimate AFD. Uh, Heidegger associates Nazism after 1938 with modern technic and Judaization. Looked to as exit, it became more of the same, hence Heidegger gives an optic called by critics ontological denialism, which revisions Nazi crimes, which have delegitimated the right as products of modernity. Nazi biological racism as a modern liberal reality, even the culmination of Western thought going back to Plato, nationalism, Europeanism, identitarianism is hence the way to be an anti-Nazi. You might see in line with like Christopher von Jorkness or concepts of, uh, you know, God forbid, like Hitler being a Zionist stooge, that uh, you find elements of that in Heidegger in the late 1930s even. Heidegger licensed the German New Right for one more effort to exit modernity despite Nazism's history of trying to do that. Heidegger's philosophy questions all modes of nationalism and fascism as well as all conservative religious or traditionalist ideas, the nationalist brotherhood wars, the biological misconceptions of the ethnos, the fascist excess of statehood, the Fuhrer cult, the megalomania, the ecstatic political religions, and last but not least, the enterprise to eliminate the alienation with modernity through the exterminations of biological Jew as modernity's demon. All this appears as the expression of the forgetting and the oppression of the questions of being and truth, which naturally leads to the loss of center and to spiritual and political extremism, as Martin Sellner. Nazism is hyper-modernity. Modernity is to blame. Hence, we need one more effort, Germans, to actually overcome modernity. The same motive that led Heidegger to Nazism is repackaged now as anti-Nazi at the same time as anti-liberal, since the categories of technology and the principle of biological race supposedly unite Nazism and modern liberalism. Metapolitics, Heidegger as the bridge between the new right and the new left. The metaphysics of, desi metaphysics of design must become deeper in accord with the innermost structure of that metaphysics and must expand into the metapolitics of the historical people. Philosophy as historical is always political and never solely theoretical or extra political. It is tied to the identitarian project as a people, the German people who have linguistic kinship with the archaic pre-Socratic Greeks of the first beginning of the West for the Germans to own their own most destiny as seen by the great thinker, they must embrace this philosophical understanding of being and their historicity. So in the 1933 lectures, he will talk of the philosophizing of the German people in coming to awaken to their sense of national mission amidst the distress of the loss of the Great War and the Versailles Treaty. Philosophical metapolitics is esotericism, a lost in translation issue. Philosophical translation of political claims characterized of the conservative revolution into the philosophical field uh, from Pierre Bourdieu divides merely antic existential phenomenon of the kind we ordinarily account, er, encounter and can study empirically. Ontological existential phenomenon, these provide the grounding conditions of the possibility. Uh, then describes ostensibly antic and even political terms having ontological valences. Many of these terms are reactionary, counter revolutionary, anti modern, anti liberal staples. This move makes the them discloses of underlying structures as against merely antic claims, allows plausible deniability. If someone says, hey, you're just echo echoing Kierkegaard, Spangler, the, gar the guard, the Heideggerian can answer, but I mean these terms ontologically. Metapolitics beyond left and right. Heidegger had remarkable success reaching the new left despite being designated by allied authorities in 1945 as 100% Nazi, half-truths, publications of redacted 1936 to 40 lectures, 
with directly political passages simply excise suppression of the 1933 to 6 materials until the mid 1980s suppression of anti-semitic letters and most militant lectures and advanced seminars until 2000 suppression of the black notebooks until 2014 the 100th anniversary of world war one when germany's efforts to break out began post-war published writings almost completely ceased making any direct reference to political and historical events with at least two very notable exceptions on whether world war ii decided anything no on the showa as in essence the same as mechanized agriculture the berlin back blockade and the hydrogen bomb how do we get a new left heideggerianism abstract heidegger from historical political context minimizes nazism and anti-semitism as non-existent irrelevant and even banal except heidegger's pessimism echo epic of the forgetting of being an uprooting of man culminating per 1940 to two in the principle of race functions to equate fascism with liberalism and socialism it's all modernity to me meant for heidegger himself and now the german new right to animate urgent call to german and european rebirth add to a post-colonial criticism of the western crimes against non-western humanity from the 15th to 20th century west is metaphysical and exclusionary thus martin heidegger uses used by the new left to animate notions of indigenous and non-western indeed anti-european movements hence to see fascism per heidegger as just western modernity and extremists which also means in its truth which bleeding heart liberals avoid for the new right we must redo the west and get it right this time for elements of the new left we should undo the west the heideggerian critique of the west from heidegger can be more or less identical Prima facie in a paradoxical and critics say comprised position, a position wherein a card carrying Nazi who depicts the show as Jewish self destruction, since Judaism is characterized by self destructed uprooting principle, who wished for a German led European civilization rebirth to arrest modern nihilism uprooting, who is embraced as a guide for the AFD and generation identity uh, movements, anti immigration, is appealed to by elements of the intellectual new left as a way of challenging Western hegemony. The not, new left faces the same eschus as the German new right in using Heidegger, the whole Nazi issue, and it draws on the same apologetic apparatus to continue doing so. In the meanwhile, by accepting Heidegger's grand narrative, purged by German, German essentialism and overt anti-Semitism, we have equated liberalism and socialism, modern post 1789 projects with fascism without attempts to use modern means to reshape modernity and replace the ideas of 1789 with those of 1914 martial masculinity the front experience is a crucible of higher existential troops national community total mobilization hence people can sit who oppose the new right authoritarian populism find themselves compromised by embracing heidegger's premises uh, mutatas mutandis if we critique the new right new left apologetics as misguided us, we undermine the basis of new right uses or else show the new rights more ambivalent relations with interwar past than apologists admit okay so we're going to look more into heidegger and uh i found those slides were pretty interesting um you know and somewhat of a relation to modern right-wing politics so Let's look at one more slides on this one's more straight logic and mathematics, the Frege Hilbert correspondence. I hope you're going to look at this some more. And you know, this is going to be important moving forward. I'm going to cover a lot about uh, you know German Jewish conflict, but I want to get a little bit in of the pure mathematics and logic also of the Frege Hilbert axiom debate, which will become important. And as I said, we'll look also, is this a racialized concept, at least from its founders who Frege, Kant, Heidegger, who came up with a lot of these principles that modern society, modern logic is based off of, uh, forwarded in somewhat of a racial terminology. So Frege and Hilbert, corresponded with each other. Um, during the 19th century, several important developments in the axiomatic method were tied 
two advances in the foundations of geometry, Bolya and Lobachevsky independently discovered non-Euclidean geometry while Klein, pursuing ideas of the latter, produced the basic method for obtaining arithmetic models for non-Euclidean geometry. However, Klein's work was still incomplete since all geometries still lack rigorous axiomatic foundations. Hilbert's uh, Foundations of Geometry, the important work uh, of 19, 1899, the book not only dramatically fulfilled the incompleteness of other mathematicians' work, but also became a landmark in the foundations of mathematics as a whole. This small book contained both the first rigorous axioms for Euclidean geometry, their consistency and independence proof. The success of Hilbert's project had profoundly influenced 20th century mathematics, logic, and philosophy. The text of Hilbert's book proposes a formal set called Hilbert's axioms substituted for the traditional axioms of Euclid. Hilbert enumerates the undefined concepts, for example, point, line, plane, the relations are indicated by such words as are situated between congruent. Hilbert arranges his axioms in five groups according to the relationships to which they give meaning. Um, one to seven axioms of connection <coughs> involving the term are situated. Two, uh, one to five axioms of order involving the term between. Three, axioms of parallel. Four, one to six axioms of congruence. And five, axioms of continuity. There are thus 20 axioms in Hilbert's system. Frege's ideas on the Hilbert's book. Frege was dissatisfied with Hilbert's book and initiated a correspondence with him. The correspondence communications by exchanging letter. Frege published two series of articles, both entitled um, Uber de Grundlegen de Geometry, Over the Foundations of Geometry, in which he analyzed Hilbert's methods and presented his own theories concerning axioms and their consistency and independence. Hilbert himself did not react to Frege's comments. Uh, Corsell undertook the defense of Hilbert's position, and Frege replied to Corsell in a new series of articles. Frege's preconceptions prevented him from appreciating the importance of Hilbert's work. As a consequence, Frege seemed critically short-sighted, and little notice has been taken of his essays. The beginning of the correspondence, David Hilbert accepted a professorship of mathematics at Göttingen in 1895. In the same year, he met Frege at the Convention of German Scientists and Doctors in Lübeck. They had conversations, which is continued in the first two letters. The first letter written by Frege on the 1st of October, 1895, it starts like this. Dear colleague, if I remember right, you told me in Lübeck that you were trying to decrease rather than increase formalization in mathematics. Since we were interrupted in our conversation, I should like to explain my views to you in Writing summary. In his first letter, Frege speaks about the nature and purpose of symbolism in mathematics. In defense of formalism, Frege says, line of thought can be perfectly expressed in symbols. It will appear briefer and more uh, perspicuous in this form than in words. Frege mentions that the need comes first and then the satisfaction, the contrary approach that first creating a symbolism and then looking for an application for it would seem to be less beneficial. He ends his letter saying, in the hope that I have not bored you with these explanations, I remain your sincerely, Dr. Uh, Goldfrege. Hilbert replied to his letter four days, and it was very brief. Hilbert says, dear colleague, your valuable letter was of extraordinary interest to me. I regret all the more that I only spoke to you briefly in Lubeck. I hope there will be more of an opportunity some other time. Hilbert also adds that he's intended to bring Frege's letters for discussion in his mathematical society. He says that he has agreed with the views of Frege about symbolism, especially with the point that symbolism must come in response to a need. He claims whoever wants to create or develop a symbolism must first study these needs. The second letter. The second letter was written almost two months after and mostly as a response to new published work by Hilbert's foundations of geometry. Frege says that he had some problems with understanding several points and asked Hilbert to enlighten him about them. For Frege, the difference between explanation and definition is not clear. Here Frege refers to the explanation given in Hilbert's book for the relationship between the points on the line stand in certain relations to one another, which can be described by making use of the word between. Frege says that he cannot take it for a definition. He also critiques the use of the word axiom. It does not seem to me a good thing to add the confusion by also using the word axiom in a fluctuating sense and similar to the word definition. Further, Frege explains his thoughts on definition, explanation, axiom. He excludes the term explanation, saying that he divides up the totality 
of mathematical propositions into definitions and all the remaining propositions, axioms, fundamental laws, theorem. The definition, every definition contains a sign, an expression, a word, which has no meaning before and which is first given meaning by the definition. We must never present as a definition something that is in need of proof or of some other confirmation of truth. Axioms, the other propositions, axioms, fundamental laws, theorems, must not contain a word or a sign whose sense and meaning was not already completely laid down so that there is no doubt about the sense of the proposition and the thought it expresses. I call axioms propositions that are true but are not proved because our knowledge of them flows from a source very different from the logical source, a source which might be called spatial intuition. From the truth of axioms, it follows that they don't contradict one another. There is therefore no need for a further proof. The definitions, too, must not contradict to one another. Hilbert's reply about definition, explanation, axiom, concept. Hilbert starts his letter by a preliminary remark. If you want to understand, if we want to understand each other, we must not forget that the intentions that guide the two of us differ in kind. Hilbert's intention is to set up a system of geometry which satisfies the strictest demands of logic. You say my explanation in section three is not a definition of the concept between since it fails to give its characteristic marks, but these characteristic marks are given explicitly in axioms 2, 1, and 2, 5. However, if one wants to use the word definition precisely in the customary sense, one will have to say between is a relationship, a relation which holds for the points on a line and which has the following characteristic marks. Axiom of order. If a point B is between points A and C, B is also between C and A, and there exists a line containing the points A, B, C. Given two points A and C, there exists a point B on the line AC such that C lies between A and B. Given any three points contained in one line, and one and only one of the three points is between the other two. Given any four points on a line, it is always possible to assign them the names A, B, C, and D such that B is between A and C and A and D. Likewise, C will be between A and D and also between B and D. In Pax axiom, given three points A, B, and C not contained in one line, and given line M contained in the plane ABC but not containing any of ABC, if M contains a point on the segment AB, then M also contains a point on the segment AC or on the segment BC. Replied by Hilbert about definition, explanation, axiom, concepts. Hilbert, on the other hand, to try to give a definition of a point in three lines is, to my mind, an impossibility, for only the whole structure of axioms yields a complete definition. Every axiom contributes something to the definition, and hence every new axiom changes the concept. After a concept has been fixed completely and unequivocally, it is on my view completely illicit and illogical to add an axiom. Reply by Hilbert about definition, explanation, axiom, concepts. Continue. Frege, the explanations in section one are apparently a very different kind. For here, the meanings of the word point line are not given, but are assumed to be known in advance. Hilbert, I do not want to assume anything as known in advance. I regard my explanation in section one as the definition of the concept of point line plane. If one adds again all the axioms of groups one to five as characteristic marks, Frege, I call axioms propositions. For the truth of the axioms, it follows that they do not contradict one another. Hilbert, I found it very interesting to read this very sentence in your letter. For as long as I've been thinking, writing, and lecturing on these things, I've been saying the exact reverse. If the arbitrary given axioms do not contradict one another with all their consequences, then they are true and things defined by the axioms exist. The last objection by Hilbert to Frege's letter, there's only one more objection I must touch on. You say that my concepts like point between are not unequivocally fixed. A between is understood differently on page 20 and a point is there a pair of numbers, but it's surely obvious that every theory is only a scaffolding or schema of concepts together with their necessary relations to one another and that the basic elements can be thought of in any way one likes. In the third letter by Frege. Frege writes his third letter very soon after the response by Hilbert, as usually starts very polite, showing gratitude for Hilbert's wish to reply to him. He also thanks Hilbert for sending him Munich's uh, lecture and adds, I can see a little more Clearly what your plan is, it seems to me that you want to detach geometry entirely from spatial intuition and turn into purely logical science like arithmetic. I also agree with you that definitions of a point, which paraphrase it to a terms of extensionless 
are of little value, but I would not be reluctant to confess that a point cannot properly be defined at all. Your explanation of between for your axioms of order also contained the word point and line whose meaning are also unknown. In the end of his letter, Frege proposes to publish their letters because he thinks it would be great importance for the whole of mathematics. Um, reply by Hilbert. Hilbert reply, replies quite soon, only in a week. Hilbert is very short, saying that Frege's discussion is much interest and great value to him, but he excuses himself for not replying to Frege in detail by being extremely busy at the moment. A very big pause between the last letter and the new one. Frege wrote his next letter only after nine months on the 16th of uh, September. He thanks Hilbert for sending him two publications of mathematical problems. He mentions that after reading them, he again found many divergences in thinking, but he would not touch upon them because remarks from the previous correspondence are quite big. Frege kindly asked Hilbert to reply for his previous letter. Hilbert's answer for letter four. Hilbert again answers very short. This time the reason for his brief response is being busy for preparing a new lecture on partial differential equations in physics. Hilbert tries to answer Frege's misunderstandings on difference between axioms and definition. I call axioms are the definitions of the concept. Hilbert also says that personal communication is surely preferable to the written kind. Frege on the foundations of geometry. It is two series essays, but for today's presentation, I will consider only the first series. Frege mostly rewrites his ideas presented in letters to Hilbert and also gives Hilbert's answers on them. He begins with questions, what is an axiom? What is the definition? And what relations might these stand to one another? After he arrives to Hilbert's book, section three, the axioms of this group define concept between how axioms define something. The same remark in section six, the axioms of this group define the concept of congruence or of motion. Frege, due to Mr. Hilbert's kindness, I'm now in position to say in what sense he used the word axiom. For him, the axioms are components of his definitions. Frege claims that the concept point is of the first is of the first level and consequently that all of its characteristics must be of the first level. Frege objects that characteristics stated in Hilbert's axioms, considering them as parts of the definition of points, are not of the first level. Last objection by Frege is that the questions of consistency of the axiom and their independence from one another requires re-examination. Some of the most important conclusions, some of the most important concepts of logic and the methodology of mathematics were introduced or received significant clarification during the Frege-Hilbert controversy. Frege maintained that all axioms should be axioms in the classical sense. They should have a truth value. They should be true, and we should be able to take their truth for granted. Further, the tr terms of the axiom should not in general be left undefined. He held that the undefined terms, the primitive terms, should in some sense have their meanings fixed. Hilbert's view of the nature of function of axioms that was quite different to the view of Frege. Hilbert was only interested that there had to be a stronger prospect of getting from the axioms to the theory in question. As already mentioned, Hilbert placed emphasis on the consistency rather than on the truth. So the Hilbert style axiom set, axiom one, every line is a collection of points. Axiom two, there exists at least two points. Axiom three, if P and Q are points, then there exists one and only one line containing P and Q. Axiom four, if L is a line, then there exists a point not on L. Axiom five, if L is a line and P is a point not on L, then there exists only a one and only one line containing P that is parallel to L. Undefined terms, point line two. This example provides an illustration of the contrast between Fragian axiom system and Hilbert style axiom systems. Since the meanings of the undefined terms are left indeterminate, we can assign any meaning that we choose. An example given by Wilder is to let point mean book and to let line mean library. Once the axioms take on meanings, they take on truth values. If we find an assignment of meaning that makes all of the axioms true, then we call this assignment an interpretation of the for the axiom system. For Hilbert, the existence of an interpretation for the axiom system is sufficient for providing for proving the consistency of the axiom system. As stated above, axioms and Fragian axiom system should be axioms in the classical sense. They should have truth value. They should be true, and we should be able to take their truth for granted. If all axioms are known to be true, then it's manifest that the system is consistent. Consistency proof for Frege are on necessary. So in conclusion, it's unfortunate that Frege's approach to philosophical matters led to a dogmatically negative estimation of Hilbert and discouraged the latter from engaging in further discussion. As a result, instead of a fruitful collaboration, Ensuing from the controversy, the very existence of this exchange passed unnoticed into history. Okay, so 
I have one more article that will be technical in the manner of actual mathematics and logic. Um, but let's look at some more slides on like a history of logic and in the sense of the connection between logic and race and group identity. So Orfeo, you're the whole chat. God bless. So uh, only Orfeo in the chat, but a handful of people watching. So, you know, God bless. Thanks, Orfeo, for being active. So here from um, Miriam Francella at the University of Milan in Italy, towards pluralism from Pankier to hating different kinds of intuition behind logic. Henry Pankier. Pankier was deeply convinced that mathematical proofs come out of intuition. In the Lair de la Science, Pankier listed three types of intuition. First, the appeal to the senses and the imagination. Next, generalization by induction, copied, so to speak, from the procedures of the experimental sciences. Finally, we have the intuition of pure number, whence arose the second of the axioms just enunciated, which is able to create the real mathematical reasoning and divided mathematicians into two types, geometers that rely on the first type of intuition, analysis that rely on the third. Still, he added, the analysis, in order to be inventors, must, without the aid of the senses and imagination, have a direct sense of what constitutes the unity of a piece of reasoning, of what makes, so to speak, its soul and inmost life. In his Science and Method, 1908, Pankier gave a psychological reconstruction of the mathematical process and started from the fact that man has two selves, one unconscious and one conscious. Then he proceeded by metaphor. He described concepts as atoms which stand still in the, when the mind is resting, attached to one of its walls, then during unconscious work carried out on the basis of what he had reflected consciously. Some atoms will detach themselves from the wall and thus be able to meet and hook up in combination with others set in motion are still hooked on to the wall. The mobilized atoms are therefore not any atoms whatsoever. They are those formed which we might reasonably expect the desired solution. The mobilized atoms are those from which the solution sought can reasonably be expected. All goes on as if the inventor were an examiner for the second degree who would only have to question the candidates who had passed a previous examination. The combinations whose beauty Elegance and harmony have the greatest impact on us and are capable of rousing in us an intense aesthetic emotion, emerge into consciousness. The sensitivity to such emotions, typically of mathematicians, once aroused, will call our attention to them and thus give them occasion to become conscious. Beauty, elegance, and harmony emerge from the specific combination because the mind, without effort, can embrace their totality while realizing the details. This is the core of Pankier's definition of intuition, the ability to grasp the unity of a demonstration, it's being ordered in a certain way at a glance. In the same work he stressed, Pankier stressed a mathematical demonstration is not a simple juxtaposition of syllogism. It is syllogism placed in a certain order, and the order in which these elements are placed is much more important than the elements themselves. If I have the feeling, the intuition, so to speak, of this order, so as to perceive at a glance the reasoning as a whole, I need no longer fear lest I forget one of the elements for each of them will take its allotted place in the array and that without any effort of memory on my part, the intuition of mathematical order that makes us divine hidden harmonies and relations cannot be possessed by everyone. The author affirmed that people can be divided into the following three categories. One, those lacking in this delicate and diff difficult to define sensibility and above average mnemonic and concentration strength, uh, the majority, Two, those who possess the sensibility to a limited extent but have extraordinary memory. And three, those whose sensibility is prodigious and accompanied by a non-significant memory advantage. The former are seen as incapable of understanding or creating mathematics. The second group can only understand it, and the latter can also create it and will be its inventors. Without intuition, there will be no invention. Mathematics novelty and without a minimal intuition, one cannot understand the mathematical demonstrations of others. Therefore, even logicians in the inventive stage must appeal to intuition. Pure logic could never lead us to anything but tautologies. This shows us that logic is not enough, that the science of demonstration is not all science, and the intuition must retain its role as 
complement, I was about to say, as counterpoise or as antidote of logic. Such intuitions, though very different, nevertheless, the intuition is a unified vision, namely reasoning by recurrence. Mathematical induction contains, as it were, condensed into a single formula and infinity of hypothetical syllogisms arranged in a cascade. The theorem is true for the number one. If it is true for one, then it is also true for two. Therefore, it is true for the number two. If it is true for two, it is also true for three, and so on. The conclusion of each syllogism is the premise of the next syllogism in mathematical induction. We simply lay down the minor premises of the first syllogism and the general formula that contains the major ones as special cases, thus a unitary look at the sequence that would be infinite is provided. He specified, Pankier specified further, both the logicians and the inst intuitionalists have achieved great things that others could not have done. Who would venture to say whether he preferred the Weir Strauss had never written or that there had never been a Riemann? Pankier, who classified himself as a geometer, expressed admiration for analysts who work without the aid of the imagination, the majority of us, if we wish to see after the pure, fired by pure intuition alone, would soon feel ourselves seized by with vertigo. He named two Germans with different mentalities and two Frenchmen with equally different mentalities. The Frenchmen were Bertrand and Hermite. They were scholars of the same school at the same time. They had the very same education, were under the same influence. Yet what a difference. Bertrand is always in motion. Now he seems in combat with some outside enemy. Now he outlines with a gesture of the hand the figures he studies. Plainly he sees and he is eager to paint. This is what he calls a gesture to his aid. With the Hermite, he is, it is just the opposite. His eyes seem to shun contact with the world. It is not without. It is within. He seeks the vision of truth. For the Germans, he offered us the analytical Wiesenstrauss. You may turn through all his books without finding a figure and the geometer Riemann. Each of his conceptions is an image that no one can forget once he has caught its meaning. Racist intuition. Pankier did not link being an analyst geometry to a race. We feel the need to specify this fact to the famous Klein's lecture where racial difference in um, its own approach to mathematics was introduced. Hey, Peter, thanks for tuning in, being in the chat. God bless. Felix Klein, in the Emerson Lecture of 1893, had expressed the following views. Finally, it must be said that the degree of exactness of the intuition of space may be different in different individuals, perhaps even in different races. It would seem as if a strong, naive space intuition were an attribute preeminently in the Teutonic race, while the critical, purely logical sense is more fully developed in the Latin and Hebrew races. A full investigation of the subject somewhat on the line suggested by Francis Gelton in his researches on heredity might be interesting. Notice that Klein did not blame anybody for his race. He, For example, he praises James Joseph Sylvester with numerous adjectives. Sylvester was extremely engaging, witty, and effervescent. He was a brilliant orator, often distinguished himself with his pithy, agile, poetic skills to the merit of everyone, and then considered Sylvester's best traits to be typical of his race by his brilliance and the agility of mind he was generally representative of his race he hailed from a purely jewish family which having been nameless before had adapted the surname sylvester only in his generation he also expressed uh klein felix klein also expressed positive views of jewish mathematicians uh chronicler and that he was mainly concerned with arithmetic and algebra in later years however setting up definite intellectual norms for all mathematical work he appears as the specifically Jewish talent, but in a special individual enhancement for he has foreseen many relationships of a fundamental nature of his fields of work without being able to work them out uh, clearly. Klein reserved the same treatment for the Jewish Jacobi, as well known in the year 1812 brought with it the emancipation of the Jews of Prussia. Jacobi was the first Jewish mathematician to take a leading place in Germany, and in doing so, he was again at the forefront of a great and for our science significant development, this measure opened up a large reservoir of new mathematical talent for our country, whose powers along with those of French immigrants very soon bore fruit. It appears to me that our science has won a strong stimulant throughout this type of blood replenishment, along with this already mentioned law regarding shifts of productivity from country to country. I would like to designate this phenomenon as the effect of national infiltration. 
However, this distinction was taken up by others, starting with uh, Ehrlich Rudolf uh, Jentz, the former student of his, who stated that Klein was intrigued by the conflict between the German spirit and the preponderance of the completely different type of thinking of mathematics, and continually returned to this theme in his seminar, despite the fact that it was intentionally repressed by several of the participants. According to Rowe, it is doubtful that Jentz ever attended the seminar. Later, Theodore Valen, who was an executive official in the ministry, 1933, and a professor in Berlin, gave an address on assuming his office as rector of the University of Griswold on the 15th of May, 1923, entitled uh, Wiesen in Wirt der Mathematik, where he quoted Klein, one of our greatest geometers, stating that modern people have a strongly developed fertile view of space, which is a particular advantage of the Teutonic race, and that a purely logical, sharply critical sense characterized by the Jews, generating a disintegrating criticalism. Cited in this way, Klein's distinction within mathematics culminated in open anti-Semitism. A quarter of a century after writing his thesis under Klein, Ludwig de Bierbach, a Nazi mathematician, transformed this one in a pure German mathematician inside his own classification of mathematical types. Thus, Bernbach attributed his own views concerning German mathematics to Klein himself. In 1933-34, Bierbach gave a racial orientation to his mathematician classifications, writing two articles on the subject, the structure of personality and mathematical creation and styles of mathematical creation. He was inspired by the racist works of Eric Jens, uh, Jens in particular, by which the psychologist from Marburg had written in 1931 in Foundations of Human Knowledge, Jantz did not simply compare Germans and non-German Jews using the capital letters I and S with I standing for integration stipus and S for strolotypus, but he also analyzed a number of possible nuances within them to enable him to reconcile the theme with historically historical reality, returning on various occasions as writing to his classifications to change them. He then defined the Germanic I-types, which let the influence of experience steam into them, and the S-types, the radiating type, which only value those things in reality, which their intellect infers in it. The latter group he included, uh, like Genetz, the French and the Jews, in particular Jacobi, Pankier, Minkowski, and the Jure Dirschlet. In the former group, he, group he placed Klein with uh, Weir, Strauss, Gauss, Euler, and even Dedekind and Hilbert, who do show a certain preference for thinking over intuition, but this is distinct from the S-type who denies the connection to an outer reality that is not mentally constructed. Ultimately, he proclaimed, I'm of the opinion that the whole dispute over the foundations of mathematics is a dispute over the contrary psychological types. Therefore, in the first place, the dispute between races, the rise of intuitionism, seems to me only a corroboration of this interpretation. Bierbach was also dismissed from his teaching post uh, war in 1945, and the Aryan intuition disappeared. L.E.G. Brouwer. Brouwer's first particularly significant comment regarding intuition can be identified in his 1907 doctoral thesis, Foundation of Mathematics. To exist in mathematics means to be constructed in intuition, and mathematics is created by a free action independent of experience. It develops from a single aporistic basic intuition, which may be called invariance and change, as well as unity in multitude. This is the first understanding of intuition as a means of construction whose action is described in the case of a theorem asserting a property of some mathematical objects. In the following terms, usually mathematics is expressed by means of a chain of syllogisms, but the conceptions which are evoked by the words used in such as consist of the following, where mathematical objects are given by their relations to the basic or complex parts of mathematical structure. This means that the objects in question is built in connection with the components to which is said to be related. We transform these given relations by a sequence of tautology by fixing one's attention to different substructures of the mathematical system and thus gradually proceed to the relations of the object to other components of the structure. In the case of the affirmative theorem, which seems to start from a structure defined via certain relations embedded within another structure whose construction is not immediately clear, 
It happens that one starts by setting up a structure which fulfills part of the required relations. Thereupon, one tries to deduce from these relations by means of tautologies, other relations in such a way that the new relations combined with those that have not yet been used yield a system of conditions suitable as a starting point for the construction of the required structure. In the case of a theorem denying that a property belongs to a mathematical entity, the construction comes to an end. I simply perceive that the construction no longer goes, that the required structure cannot be embedded in the given structure. It should be noted that for Brouwer, mathematics is made up of constructions. That is, it is alinguistic and based on attempts at constructions which may succeed or fail. They are creative attempts. They do not follow any fixed rule. So mathematics does not follow logic. It does not use logic. Logic records the regularities present in expressions of mathematical constructions, which are carried out to support memory and communicate one's results with an awareness that there are no guarantees of success in other person's same mathematical construction and that the emotions accompanying the mathematical experience are inevitably linked to the subject and hence not repeatable. The second meaning of intuition is the one that originates basic mathematical entities. First of all, natural numbers, Brouwer describes the meaning of intuition as the basic phenomenon, the simple intuition of time in which repetition is possible in the form thing in time and thing again, as a consequence of which moments of life break up into sequences of things which differ qualitatively. In a note, he calls that intuition, intuition by tuity. It is a prior that in that it is independent of experience. Well, it is not a necessary condition for experience because mathematics and experience exist independently of each other, but it is a necessary condition of the mathematical receptacle of, receptacle of experience. In 1918, Brow expands the mathematical content of this intuition, highlighting the way that is a foundation to the concept of species. This is initially described with reference to the universal tree thought of as a growing structure, a tree with all the possible branches at each branching point called node. One assigns either sterilization or a term of nothing, the possibility of assigning a sterilization, which causes the sterilization of the entire branches introduced to model the tree. By cutting out the branch, the possibility of assigning nothing, generating finite successions, was used to homologate their construction to that of infinite succession. Later, after Gris's criticism of his definition of uh, Nagatiani from his Cambridge lectures on, Brouwer replaced his sterilization procedure with a direct indication to prosecute only certain nodes, describing the construction of the tree without passing through the universal tree by saying that it has for initial nodes either all natural numbers or only those not exceeding a certain given, and for nodes of a different order n plus one, all or immediate descendants of the node p of order n, or only those whose n plus 1, the constituent join to the constituents of p, does not exceed a certain number m to achieve the spread to each node, either objects or nothing are attached. With the production of the spread during the construction of the tree, Brouwer contemplated freedom of choice in the continuation and intended each branch a succession of free choices. Still, freedom encompasses everything and therefore can also allow for its progression, restriction, and even restriction of restriction. Brouwer had Numerous second thoughts on the subject, but from 1946 onward, he maintained a definitive opinion, saying, in some form or publications, the author restrictions of freedom of future restrictions of freedom, restrictions of freedom of future restrictions of freedom of future restrictions of freedom, and so on were also admitted. But at present, the author is inclined to think this admission superfluous and perhaps leading to unnecessary complications. Finally, Brower rethought his definition of temporal intuition, contextualizing it within the original uh, Weltanschauung context that had not been allowed, he had not been allowed to make explicit in his 1907 thesis, man can find serenity only in the interiority of his own consciousness. He is compelled by karma to go out, but it is appropriate for him to do so only minimally. In particular, scientific work must avoid being applicative and take inward form for mathematics and perfect starting point is the intuition of time. It was in the 1948 conference, Consciousness, Philosophy, and Mathematics, that Brow set out the steps from the inner self to the sciences in greater depth. On that occasion, Brow explained temporal intuition within the description of the path of man's consciousness towards externality 
consciousness oscillates between sensation and tranquility, followed by another sensation and therefore distinguishes between present and past. Then it distinguishes itself from both, becoming mind. It identifies complexes of sensations to repeat themselves in the order, never changing. They are called things, among which there are human bodies driven by causal attention, the desire to know and to obtain objects. Mathematics comes into being when the tuity created by a move in time is divested of all quality by the subject, and when the remaining empty form of the common substratum of all tuities as being intuitions of mathematics is left to the unlimited unfolding, creating new mathematical entities in the shape of predeterminately or more or less freely proceeding infinite sequences of mathematical entities perceived previously acquired and in the shape of mathematical species. Brouwer, far from setting up questions of race, tried to impose this type of foundation on the European and even world mathematical sense, leading to periods of suspension from research activity due to serious disputes with colleagues for general well-being, despite the fact that at the conference in 1948, he came to support the impossibility of plurality of minds while a plurality of bodies can be observed. It is not unreasonable to derive this behavior of individuals in general from reason, but unreasonable to derive it from mind. For by the choice of this term, the subject in its scientific thinking is induced to place in each individual mind with free will dependent of this individual, thus elevating itself to a mind of second order experiencing incognizable alien consciousness as sensation, quod non est, and which moreover would have the consequence that the mind of a second order would causally think about the plurified mind of the first order, then cooperatively study the sciences of the plurified mind, and in consequence of the study assigned a mind of second order with sensation of alien consciousness to the other individuals, thus once more elevating itself, this time to a mind of third order, and so on. In default of plurality of mind, there is no exchange of thought either. Thoughts are inseparably bound up with the subject by so-called exchange of thought with another being. The subject only touches the outer wall of automation. This can hardly be called mutual understanding. Only through the sensation other souls, sometimes a deeper approach is experienced. The problem remains open as to how it's possible to certain that in every human being there is a conscious in which he can rest peacefully, but Brouwer mentions neither the problem nor possible answer. Arend hating. In the 30s, Brouwer's student Arend Hating came onto the mathematical scene. His first approach was one he would never abandon building bridges for the sake of understanding and cooperation among mathematicians. He wrote a series of articles of the formal presentation of arithmetic and intuitionist logic, despite sharing with Brouwer the idea that mathematics is a mental construction and that in it language serves solely expressive, not demonstrative purposes. Moreover, he took part of the mathematicians meeting at Koenigsberg, the round table on foundational currents where John von Neumann represented formalism and Rudolf Carnap represented logicism. The atmosphere was one of cooperation to the extent that individual speakers expressly sought meeting points with the thought of the others and hating entered the stage effortlessly as a representative of intuitionism, avoiding propaganda. In his volume, uh, B. Weiss Theory, Intuitionism of 1934, hating stated that mathematics has its only source and intuition which sets before our eyes its concepts and its conclusions is immediately clear. It is no, no more the faculty of considering concepts and conclusions that habitually occur in our thinking separately it is a faculty that one must train oneself to exercise a peculiar mental aptitude that allows mathematics to develop in full anatomy from any philosophical presupposition. Hating described intuition in his 1956 book, Intuitionism, an introduction as follows a mathematical construction ought to be so immediate to the mind and its results so clear that it needs no foundation whatsoever. One may very well know whether a reasoning is sound without using any logic, a clear scientific conscious suffices. Then he specified in the course of various writings entities that intuition can attest to regarding two oneness. He wrote, we know how to build up the sequence of natural numbers in such a way that we begin to think in terms of a unity in the same spiritual constructive way they that had to be done in forming the observation of pencil. Then we think another unit. And finally, we think that this last step is repeated again and again. The three concepts, one, another one, and again and again, are sufficient to explain the theory of natural numbers. Hating constructed the same mathematical entities with his teacher, 
but he felt the need to specify with respect to alternative label choice sequences for them that he preferred infinitely proceeding sequences because to arrive at the notion of infinitely proceeding sequences, we did not introduce new ideas, in particular the notion of choice, which seemed to hating overtly linked to psych the psychology of the subject. In particular, when Broward died, he stated that he had glimpsed in the letters 1948 writing a slipstick turning point with a pronounced role accorded individual psychology that he could not share. That is, in 1948, Broward introduced the expression creative subject. The GFC crisis, GFC Gris, sorry, GFC Gris. Hey, Mark, thanks for tuning in. God bless. Gris has arrived at intuitionism from his own work on Welton Chung that had outlined his 1946 book, Ideal and Stiffen Philosophia. There he had based his Welton Chung on the original datum that consciousness grasps by attaining its own fullness. The subject distinguishes himself from the object, but one has no meaning without the other. Mathematics is the specific way to analyze the original datum that focuses on subject-object link. For this reason, mathematical objects cannot be thought of independently of a mathematician that proceed, produces them. A platonic existence for them is excluded. Gris's Weltanschauung had led him to intuitionism. Still, this did not imply a total acceptance of Brouwer's system. In particular, he criticized Brouwer's definition of negation as a reasoning that ends in contradiction that cannot be carried out by explaining that to assume that a proof is given while this proof appears to be impossible, it is incompatible with the constructive and evidential starting point because the existence of a proof is identical to the fact that it has been given. Gris criticizes the Browerian definition of negation because an intuitionist demonstration must start with something evident and end with something evident. Browerian negation had been described as arriving at the proof of impossibility of construction. The point of which the proof stops can be considered as evident because one sees that metaphorically one hits a wall, but no status of evidence can be attached to the starting point of the proof. Otherwise, there would be an evidence that is then disproved, which would remove all formal foundation and intuitionist mathematics. Hence, Brouwer's definition of negation cannot be considered acceptable within mathematics. It can only be kept at a pre-mathematical stage. A new definition of negation within mathematics is needed. Gris suggested a comparison between two already constructed entities and the realization that one has more properties than the other. Brouwer responded by constructing a real number, which was certainly not zero, regarding which a negative property was known, but which could not be said to be greater than or less than zero positive properties to show that it's not always possible to find a positive substitute for a property defined through a disputed negation. He responded to Gris' criticism by arguing that it would be a loss for intuitionist mathematics if the properties defined through the disputed negation were to be eliminated because some properties would be irrevocably lost. Haydick did not follow or comment on Brouwer's continuous second thoughts regarding limiting freedom of choice while he took seriously the doubts that even from the intuitionist side, one could ever arrive at some of the constructions presented by Brouwer. In particular, reflecting on Gris's critique, he realized that its core was directed against hypothetical constructions, which fail as he grouped together the various types of conditional constructions present in the intuitionist concepts. He began drawing up a list of these in 1949, redefining in 1958, and providing a detailed and final version of it in 1962 within a scale of degrees of evidence. The highest grade is that of such assertions as 2 plus 2 equals 4, 1,000 plus, and 2 plus 2 equals 1,004 belongs to a lower grade. We show that it's not by actual counting, but by a reasoning which shows that in general, n plus 2 plus 2 equals n plus 4, such general statements about natural numbers belong to the next grade. They have already the character of an implication. This level is formalized in the free variable calculus. I shall not try to arrange the other levels in linear order. It will suffice to mention some notions which, by their introduction, lower the grade of evidence. One, the notion of the type order uh, omega, which it occurs in the definition of the constructible ordinals to the notion of negation, which involves a hypothetical construction, which is shown afterwards to be impossible. Three, the theory of quantification, the inter interpretation of the quantifiers themselves is not problematic, but the use of a quantified expression and logical formulas is. Four, the introduction of infinitely proceeding sequences. And five, the notion of species. 
Hayden stresses that individual's intuition is willingness to accept hypothetical constructions varies. The starting point is strictly finite mathematics, and then one decides how far the arc of mathematical entities acceptable as evident can be stretched, still accepting the existence of entities of which we only know the impossibility of non-existence would be very different. That would not be stretching the arc, but going in a completely different direction from the others on the scale. I would it would be a leap into the metaphysical darkness, saying show the peaceful and benevolent attitude within intuitionism, accepting the various shades of constructability, but this did not mean he was considered Platonist as enemies, only he could not accept the entities they believe in. He considered this topic also in his unpublished manuscripts where he mentions an ascending scale of abstraction, ranging from one's consciousness to real numbers and beyond to God. He specified that some people stop early, on and do not accept even very large natural numbers, truly unconstructible by the human mind. And some others believe that there are also Platonic ideas of number or notion limits for human reason, such as God. As for he himself, Haitik did not feel up to taking the last step to the top, but he understood that others might on conscious grounds, and he let them do so without feeling the need to convince them forcibly, and at the same time declaring he could not be convinced. One might approximate this approach to Carnap's principle of tolerance. The principle of tolerance, we don't want to impose prohibition, but to make determinations. There is no morality in logic. Everyone may construct his logic, his form of language as he wishes. Carnap referred to logic, but we know that logic, according to intuitionism, is the expression of mathematics. Therefore, tolerance in logical mirrors tolerance in mathematics. However, it should be noted from a historical point of view that Hayting mentioned the principle of tolerance in the fictitious debate at the beginning of the 1956 volume, putting it into the mouth of the representatives of the formalist, but did not cite it as the source of his own pluralism. In addition, we must remember a warning that comes to us from the philosopher Elio Franzini in the context of the Enlightenment legacy, the Enlightenment taught with all its limitations, tolerance, a necessary value, and certainly not sufficient, which is nevertheless the basics for its dialogical evolution. If we recall this warning and apply it to our topic, we can state that tolerance simply means marking out one's own territory and those of others in order that each can cultivate their own garden separately and in isolation. It is this premise for, but not yet, the definitive step towards dialogue. Therefore, the word tolerance does not fully express Hayton's attitude. He draws he does not draw furrows in the mathematical ground in order to barricade himself inside his own territory and carry out his work in blissful isolation, but encouraged methodological self-awareness during mathematicians' research and suggested that each identity the most suitable ground for the growth of the seeds, showing an ever-lively desire to make their own seed shown, known to those near and far. Conclusion. Pankir cited two types of approach to mathematics, intuitive and analytic, but did not relate those to nationality or ethnicity. He saw them as on par with hair color. His opinion might be summed up as stating that your mathematical approach is in your DNA. They're flip sides of the same coin. However, the overall view of proof, there are people who see this abstractly and those who see it graphically, but it is, in any case, the, an overall view. Pankier considered this overview unteachable and thus condemned those without it to understanding mathematics, but not creating it if they have sufficient memory or even an ability to understand it and all in addition to not creating if they do not have a powerful memory. Berenbach, by referring to the racial mention of the Klein's Evanston lecture, distinguished between Germanic I types who let the influence of experience stream into them and S types who only value those things in reality which their intellect infers in. His teaching of mathematics was oriented towards the correctness of its application in order to educate German youth with the type of mathematics suitable for the Aryan race. It was therefore a racial, not DNA distinction, unlike Pankier's non-racial DNA concept, which did not in any case square well with the historical reality to the point of requiring continuous revisions and the addition of internal nuances in order to reconcile his descriptions of mathematicians with those who really existed. We have seen that Brouwer did not link intuitionism to race, but made an obligation for all men in order to practice mathematics without excessively compromising their mystical inner serenity. The purpose of his foundational vision might be said to have been for the sake of good, taking for granted that all men have the same inner lives, 
while at the same time failing to demonstrate the possibility of other minds. Gradually, over the course of his inner considerations of the intuition of time, he discovered the faculty to construct natural numbers, species, and free choices sequences from which he then proceeded to construct all mathematics in a creative way. He followed no specific rules, but rather checked the evidence, the intuitiveness of each step by experience, the sense of correctness that also an accountant had is when the results come to him. Haydig addressed the issue along with other criticisms of the intuitiveness of Brouwer in concepts, the notion of free choice sequences, organized the various notions along a scale of degree of evidence and admitted without specifically labeling it a kind of pluralism within intuitionism underlying, however, that the distinction between those who call themselves intuitionists while disagreeing with each other on the admissible mathematical entities and those who do not remain clearly physical, visible because intuitionism, intuitionists limit their acceptance of the existence of the mathematical entities proposed by classical mathematicians. Unlike Brouwer, moreover, Haitig did not claim that intuition ism was the mathematics to convince others of, but say that it was possible for some people to believe in the existence of entities and not only mathematical ones that were unacceptable for others. This is the crux of Haitig's logical pluralism derived from his mathematical pluralism and his adherence to a kind of principle of tolerance. Tolerance, however, may not be the most appropriate expression because it does not necessarily involve dialogue between the parties, whereas Haitig desired and sought dialogue in particular, wanted to be able to make the other side understand what his mathematics consisted of as well. And the most appropriate expression is dialogue. Haitig proposed logical pluralism and tirelessly sought dialogue following his example. Can be a good educational way to let people become used to look for a dialogue in all circumstances of life. Okay, so I thought those slides were pretty insightful. A lot of uh, information there. Some on the topic, uh, you know, I'm going to be covering, and others that hopefully we'll return to for further thoughts on, you know, the multiple truth hypothesis, consciousness, and you'll likely very soon I will return to the topic of the philosophy of mathematics, Platonic forms in relationship to truth. So. I have one more paper I want to look at on Michael Cisco reaching out to me. So, yeah, I look forward to talking to Michael Cisco. Um, yeah, I want to look a little bit more at the pure mathematic and logic of the Frege Hilbert controversy. And then the rest of the program, you know, if I have strength, it might even go till one, two in the morning. I have a lot of material to cover. But we'll see how much strength I have. But I want to cover this paper that's also a little bit long, might be 30, 45 minutes on the Frege Hilbert controversy in context. And this one's going to be almost all mathematics and logic in philosophy, although it's not much, um, it's more the philosophy of mathematics and logic than the mathematics and logic itself. The Frege Hilbert Controversy in Context by To Be a Roar. This paper aims to show that Frege and Hilbert's mutual disagreements resulting from different notions of Anschlung on and their relations to axioms. In the first section of the paper, evidence is provided to support that Frege and Hilbert were influenced by the same developments of 19th century geometry, in particular the work of Gauss, Plauker, and Van Strout. The second section of the paper shows that Frege and Hilbert take different approaches to deal with the problems of the developments of 19th century geometry posed for the traditional Kantian philosophy of mathematics. Frege maintains that Anschong is a source of knowledge by which we acknowledge geometric axioms are true. For Hilbert, in contrast, axioms provide one of several correct pictures of reality. Hilbert's position is thereby deeply influenced by epistemological ideas from Hertz and Hemholtz, and in turn, influence of the neo-Kantian Cassier. Hey, Ricardo, God bless. Good to see you. If you want to hop on and chat, feel free to take the link, and I'll continue reading after we chat. 
In a couple of letters around 1900s, Frege and Hilbert discusses the status of geometry and geometric objects. After Hilbert terminated the correspondence, Frege published two series of paper, both entitled uh, Over the Foundations of Geometry to make his concerns about Hilbert's public attempt, uh, public attempt to Ricardo's in Detroit. Well, you still got my number. Give me a call. We could meet up. And I'm streaming now, but you know, you can hop on the stream or if you want to meet up tomorrow or something, uh, let me know. The controversy is widely conceived as one between a conservative 19th century mathematician. I mean, if you're really in Detroit, you want to meet up now. Like I could even, you know, like I could read these papers a different time and we could do IRL streaming. So uh, let me know. The controversy is widely conceived as one between a conservative 19th century mathematician, Frege, and the young man who represented New Age of Mathematics, Hilbert. Indeed, there's evidence that supports this picture. Um, in his Foundations of Geometry, Hilbert invented a completely new understanding of axiomization in mathematics. He seemingly detaches geometric axioms completely from intuition. As soon as 1899, he writes in a letter to Frege, if in speaking of my points, I think of some systems of things, the system, love, law, chimney sweep, and then assume all my axioms as relations between these things, then my propositions, Pythagorean's theorem, are also valid for these things. Frege, on the other hand, Okay, so Ricardo, maybe we'll, uh, I'll forward to your call tomorrow, your Twitter or whatever, you still have my cell phone. Um, so look forward to that. Frege, on the other hand, had trouble with this new picture, an unpublished note taken after the conversation with Hilbert. Frege writes that only one set of axioms could be true, either that of Euclidean or that of non-Euclidean geometry. If Euclidean geometry is true, then non-Euclidean geometry is not scientific, but has the same status as alchemy or astrology. However, this paper sheds new light on the relationship between Hilbert and Frege. In the first section of the paper, we show that both share the same heritage. Not only are they both deeply rooted in the geometry of the 19th century, but they both even react to the same authors such as Gauss, Finchstein, and Pluckner. We especially build on the pioneering work of Tapperden and Wilson on the geometric background of Frege's philosophy. It will become apparent that Frege's position on non-Euclidean geometry has been widely misconceived. Further, we will see that Frege in his mathematical writings used methods of his time from projective geometry to deal with extension elements, as well as higher dimensions, even though that contradicts our intuition. Hilbert, on the other hand, did not break as radically the connection between geometry and Anshong as some interpretations suggest he was deeply influenced by the discussions of the late 19th century geometry and the status of non-Euclidean geometry and projective geometry. In his lectures, he puts his own axiomatic approach in relation to the analytic and synthetic projective approach to geometry and calls his approach an analysis of Anschung. Nonetheless, Frege and Hilbert undoubtedly had have completely different philosophical convictions regarding geometry. In the second section of this paper, we show that despite the fact that both Frege and Hilbert were influenced by Kant, these differences emerge from fundamental disagreements regarding the concept of axioms and the role of Anschung. Hilbert's perspective on axioms and Anschung were heavily influenced by Hertz's picture theory of science, according to which scientific theories are not true statements about the world, but rather one among several possible pictures of the world. Hertz's picture theory later inspired the philosophic philosophy of symbolic forms of the neo-Kantian Cassier, and it enabled Hilbert to take very liberal approaches towards the plurality of geometries, whereas Frege maintained the traditional Kantian position that only Euclidean geometry is true, and Anshan is the source of knowledge to recognize this truth. The mathematical background of the Frege-Hilbert controversy, non-Euclidean geometry and the relationship between geometry and arithmetic. Before Frege started to work on the Begriff Schrift, he studied mathematics in Jena and then in Göttingen, where he received his PhD, and shortly afterwards he finished his habituation his habilitation back in Gina. His PhD thesis from 1873 is titled On a Geometric Representation of Imaginary Forms in a Plane. Considering Frege's later project to show that logic is the foundation of arithmetic, it might be surprising that Frege's PhD thesis was on a topic from geometry. However, it is less surprising when one takes the academic environment in Göttingen at this time into account. In the early 1870s, the influence of Gauss and Riemann was still strong, and it was Gauss's authority that led to a wide acceptance of non-Euclidean geometry within the mathematical community. Riemann, in his famous 
Tatian Vatsarang in 1856 um, laid out a totally new concept of geometry in geometric space. In this talk, Riemann introduced the notion of the curvature of space, which enabled him to systematically distinguish different kinds of non-Euclidean geometries. Furthermore, he introduced a new nation of dimension that is completely disconnected from intu intuition. According to this notion, a dimension is just an independent parameter that need not be either spatial or dense. Thus, Frege received his mathematical training in an environment where non-Euclidean geometry and geometries of higher dimension were objects of serious mathematical investigation. This is, of course, no proof that Frege's positive attitude towards non-Euclidean geometry. In Göttingen, there was also a prominent opponent of non-Euclidean geometry, Lutz. Lutz was not a mathematician, but a philosopher. However, in the 19th century, Göttingen and many other German universities, mathematics belonged to the philosophical faculty, so Lutz interacted with the mathematicians. For instance, he was part of the panel uh, for of Riemann. Felix Klein mentioned that Lutz's influence made it hard for him to discuss non-Euclidean geometry in the 1970s. Göttingen, in his philosophical writings, Lutz even discussed this notion of a curved space introduced by Riemann, arguing that other things in space, not space itself, can be curved. In his metaphysics, Lutz calls the non-Euclidean geometry one huge coherent error, so does the passage from Frege's unpublished note where he compares non-Euclidean geometry to alchemy actually sh uh, shows that Frege took Lutz's side in the discussion about non-Euclidean geometry. A passage from the Foundations of Arithmetic indicates something different. In uh, Frege writes, conceptual thought alone can after a fashion shake off this yoke when it assumes, say, a space of our four dimensions or positive curvature to study such a conception is not useless by any means, but it is to leave the ground of intuition entirely behind. By mentioning the space of positive curvature, Frege, just like Lutz, refers to Riemann. However, unlike Lutz, he endorses the possibility of grasping such space conceptually. Nevertheless, intuition can have a role in understanding alternative geometries, as Frege explains in the following sentence. If we make use of intuition here, even here, as an aid, it is still the same old intuition of Euclidean space, the only one whose structures we can intuit. Only then the intuition is not taken at its space value, but as a symbolic for something else. For example, we call straight or plane what we actually intuit as curve. The aforementioned example refers to Euclidean models of non-Euclidean geometries, such as those by Beltrami and Poncelet, as we will see in the next section. Frege does the very same thing with projective geometry in his PhD thesis, where he uses real lines in uh, the foundation's terminology as symbols for imaginary points. In the next paragraph, Frege even argues that this possibility reveals the epistemic nature of geometry. For purposes of conceptual thought, we can always assume the contrary of some or other of the geometric axioms without involving ourselves in any self-contradictions when we proceed to our deductions despite the conflict between our assumptions and our intuition. The fact that this is possible shows that the axioms of geometry are independent of one another and the primitive laws of logic and consequently are synthetic. Thus, Frege claims that geometry is synthetic because it is logically possible to negate an axiom of Euclidean geometry. A similar argument can be found in the work of Gauss and Riemann. According to Gauss, numbers are a product of our mind, whereas space has a reality outside of our mind whose laws we cannot prescribe completely a priori because we are convinced of the necessity of arithmetic, but not of geometry. Thus, for Gauss, geometry is an empirical science, just like physics, which can only be known a posteriori. Similarly, Riemann argues the propositions of geometry cannot be deduced from the general notion of number, but that the properties by which space can be distinguished from other thinkable threefolds extended magnitudes can only be gained from experience. These philosophical positions were clearly influenced by the mathematical developments just outlined from the fact that Euclidean geometry is non-contradictory. It follows that geometry cannot rest on logic alone. However, at that time, there was no real equivalent to non-Euclidean geometry and arithmetic. There was no alternative to the standard arithmetic. Hence, it should be no surprise that Frege was not the only mathematician who claimed different sources of knowledge for geometry and arithmetic. The same argument for different sources of knowledge of geometry and arithmetic can be found in Hilbert's early work on geometry in his lecture on projective geometry from 1891. Hilbert writes, I need nothing beyond purely logical thinking when I occupy myself with number theory or algebra. With geometry, it is totally different. I can just as little comprehend the properties of space Though mere thinking, I can recognize the basic laws of mechanics, the laws of gravity, and 
or any other physical law. Space is not the product of my thinking, but is given to me by my senses. Here, Hilbert highlights the dissimilarities between geometry and arithmetic to argue that geometry has a different epistemic status. Just like Frege, he advocates the logical nature of arithmetic. However, he does not attempt to prove this himself. Instead, he relies on Dedekind's work. Hilbert maintained the conviction that arithmetic is part of a logic at the time he wrote. In his lecture, he held in the year that, that, that he wrote his uh, Festschrift, he explicitly refers to Deakin's work as evidence. Projective geometry. Projective synthetic geometry developed from the end of the 18th century onward. Mangue was the first who attempted to introduce synthetic geometry that could catch up with analytic geometry at the, of the time. Analytic geometry is the kind of geometry that originated with Descartes, in which one of, uses methods from arithmetic and algebra to express improved geometric statements. In synthetic geometry, these methods are banned. Poncelet, a student of Mange at the Ecole Polyarithmetic, put this project forward as often referred to as the founder of synthetic projective geometry. Projective geometry differs from the usual affine geometry insofar as it considers only projective properties, a property is projective if it is preserved under projective transformation. A non-projective property is called metric. An important metric property is the distance ratio on which coordination in analytic geometry relies. There is, however, a property that is not invariant under the projection, but that synthetic geometers want to consider nonetheless the number of points of intersection. In order to classify the number of points of intersection as projective geometry, Poncelet introduces new points to a fine space, points at infinity and imaginary points. Their existence is demanded by Poncelet's principle of continuity, according to which the number of points should be invariant under continuous movements of parts of a figure. Another fruitful device for inferring geometric sentences within synthetic projective geometry is the principle of reciprocity, which later became known as the nature principle of duality. According to the principle, one can interchange the word point and line in the projective geometry of the plane while preserving truth and likewise the word point and plane in the geometry of space. Poncelet's principle of continuity is crucial for the strength of synthetic geometry as it allows sentences of great generality to be deduced without employing analytic methods. However, these extension elements are not based on intuition, unlike the usual points. Other mathematicians tried to equate extension elements with objects based on intuition. For example, Van Stout equates the expression meeting at a point in infinity with being parallel. According to him, the direction can be represented by a line out of a collection of parallel lines, an imaginary point is an involution to which a certain sense is attached. It is noteworthy that the role of intuition is highly ambiguous when it comes to the principle of continuity. On the one hand, the introduction of extension elements is not motivated by intuition. In fact, they lead to results that seem to contradict our intu intuition at first glance. For example, it holds that every pair of circles has two points of intersection. However, one can easily imagine a pair of circles that do not intersect in the intuitive understanding of intersection. On the other hand, the principle of continuity is central to the fruitfulness of synthetic projective geometry for the pioneers of synthetic projective geometry. This geometry is an attempt to reinforce the connection of geometry to actual figures. Extension elements are introduced by synthetic geometries by finding substitutes that are based on intuition, parallel lines for points in infinity, and involutions for imaginary points. In his doctoral thesis, Frege draws the same conclusions in the first paragraph he remarks that we seem well justified in questioning the sense of imaginary forms since we attribute to them properties which not infrequently contradict all our intuitions. A few sentences later, Frege mentions that possibility of taking points in infinity is just another expression for having the same direction. In the next paragraph, he also mentions the imaginary points can be defined by involution on a straight line. These solutions were, as we have seen, first suggested by Van Stout. The aim of Frege's thesis, as the title already suggests is to find geometric representations of imaginary objects. Frege explains the notion of a geometric representation as follows. By geometrical representation of imaginary forms in the plane, we understand according to a kind of correlation in virtue by which every real or imaginary element of the plane has a real intuitive element corresponding to it. In the following paragraphs, Frege presents a new method to represent imaginary points. According to this method, imaginary points in the plane are represented by lines in three-dimensional space. Therefore, Frege introduced two planes parallel to each other, the real plane and the imaginary plane. One finds the real line representing an imaginary point in the following way. 
an imaginary number can be thought of as a binary tuple of real name numbers with one of the, those numbers representing the real part and the other representing the imaginary part. The real point in the plane is analytically denoted by a binary tuple of real numbers. The coordinates analogously an imaginary point on the plane is analytically denoted by a four tuple of real numbers, two of which denote the real parts and two of the imaginary parts in Frege's representation, such imaginary points, is represented by a line going through one point in the real plane and one point in the imaginary plane. The point in the real plane is denoted by two real numbers and the four tuple denoting the real parts and the point in the imaginary plane is de denoted by two real numbers denoting the imaginary parts. A real point in the plane is represented by a real line in space, which goes through the origins of the imaginary plane. Thus, Frege indeed discusses the possibility of representing extension elements by different real intuitive elements. At first glance, this contrasts oddly with his later inability to understand Hilbert's method of reinterpreting geometric signs differently for metatheoretical investigations. However, Frege's representations are not models in the modern sense of the term. There are no, there are no uninterpreted signs that are interpreted in a particular domain like modern model theory. Instead, meaningful arithmetic expressions are represented by geometric objects. The geometric objects serve as symbols, as Frege would later call them. At this time, Frege had not yet employed the strategy to let abstract objects such as sets define other objects, which he suggests in the foundation, since he basically did not yet have a notion of a set, let alone his abstraction principle. Nevertheless, there is continuity between Frege's way of dealing with extension elements from his thesis of 1873 until his foundation of arithmetic, the influence of von Strauss' approach. As already mentioned, Frege refers positively to von Strauss' equation of extension elements with more intuitive objects in his thesis. In his foundations, Frege states his conviction that one should define directions by presupposing the notion of parallel lines and not the other way around. This is a conviction he shares with von Stout, who is always cautious about presupposing more intuitive concepts and defining less intuitive ones. In his uh, Geometry of the Line, Van Stout defines parallels as lines that have no point of intersection, line segments and parallels, if they are part of parallel lines. They are on an anonymously parallel if they are on the same side of the line connecting their starting points. Van Stout does not define the direction of a set of parallel lines or line segments, but directions or rays can be determined by any line segment unanimously parallel to it, and the line segment can be represented by another other line segment unanimously parallel to it in context. We have kept in mind that Van Stout lacked the concept of a set at this time. However, it is quite obvious that Van Stout inspired Frege. This becomes even more apparent when considering that Frege, in the same paragraph, mentions the notion of Stellung for what planes in space share if they are parallel. This notion also originates with Van Stout. There is a problem with the approach Frege presents in his PhD thesis, since lines can be greatly identified by generally identified by two points, and points in the projected plane are presented by lines in real space. Imaginary lines are rep respectively represented by pairs of real lines, with each representing an imaginary point that lies in the imaginary line. However, as Frege mentions, this representation violates the principle of duality. Therefore, Frege presents an alternative identification that preserves duality imaginary lines as well as imaginary points as represented by two real lines. Frege does not use drawings to lay down his approach, but continues purely analytically using homogeneous tratidicular Pluckter coordinates. These coordinates were introduced by Julius Pluckter, who tried to capture the results of synthetic geometry with an analytic geometry. Therefore, his task was not to avoid metric notions for his coordinations, but to find a coordination that allows the result of a synthetic projective geometry to de be deduced elegantly and efficiently. Thus, he developed an analytic foundation for the principle of reciprocity by introducing a coordinate system that is homogeneous. Coordinate systems in which coordinate tuples, those coordinates that have the same ratio are equal. In such a coordinate system, a point in the plane is denoted by three coordinates and a point in three-dimensional space by four coordinates. In the projective plane, every line can be expressed by an equation in the form ax plus by plus cz equals zero. In this equation, xyz and abc are interchangeable. Thus, one could be either, as usual, take ABC as constants and AX plus BY plus B CZ equals zero as a line equation with XYZ as a point variables, or one could take XYZ as constants and AX plus BY plus CZ equals zero as a point with the equation 
with ABC as point variables, thus projective planes duality between points and lines becomes trivial. In this thesis, Frege uses Pluckter's coordinates for space, where a point is represented by four variables. Frege also builds on the ideas of Pluckter later in his mathematical writings. For example, he uses Pluckter coordinates excessively, extensively in his lecture, which may which can be seen from the notes taken from Frege's first lecture in the winter semester, 1874-5, a lecture he gave seven times between 1874 and 1895. In this lecture, Frege provides an overview of three different coordinate systems, the distance coordinate systems, distance ratio coordinate systems, and general homogeneous coordinate systems. He points out that these systems are based on three different properties, distance between two points, distance ratio, and cross ratio. Moreover, he calls our Usual coordinates, a particular case in the more general coordinate system, the homogenous coordinate system. Similarly, in his talk from 1877, Frege identifies the properties that are preserved under the transformation of coordinate systems. For example, the transformation of classical coordinates preserves congruence and explains how different coordinate systems differ in this respect. Frege also follows the approach invented by Plucker when it comes to understanding a fourth dimension. Plucker uses four line coordinates to describe a point in space. Thus, we have a visual representation of analytical expression that uses four dimension. In his lecture on geometry of pairs and points in a plane, Frege develops a similar idea. He takes a pairs of points as the base, basic elements of the plane, which means that four coordinates denotes a pair of points in a plane. Frege applicates that in this way, we arrive at geometries of more than three dimensions without leaving the firm ground of intuition. Therefore, for Frege, these four coordinates do not refer to points in a four dimensional space. Frege does not want to acknowledge such objects. Instead, the four coordinates refer to pairs of points in the plane, which is an unproblematic geometric object for Frege. The strategy is the same as the one used by Frege in his PhD thesis, where he represents points in the imaginary plane by lines in three dimensional real Euclidean space. Therefore, we must conclude that Frege in his mathematical writings was heavily influenced by projective geometry of his time, especially by the work of Stott and Pluckter. Precisely, these two authors were also essential to Hilbert's work in the 1890s. According to Hilbert, the idol for his lectures on projective geometry from 1891 was Van Stout, who, according to Hilbert, solved the question of whether it's possible to free projective geometry entirely from measuring and calculating his lectures on the foundation of geometry from 19 1894. Hilbert presents Van Strout's way of introducing coordinates without relying on metric notations. notions. This method relies on the projective theorems of fourth harmonic point, which Van Stout expresses as follows. If three points A, B, and C are given in a straight line and a quadrangle is constructed so that one diagonal passes through the second of a given point and that each of the two remaining points, two opposite sides, cut each other, then the other diagonal cuts the line at either point D, which is determined by the three given points, this point D is called the fourth harmonic point. One can now use this theorem to set up a metric free coordinate system in the following way. So I'm going to skip through a little bit of this, this is quite long. Like Frege, Hilbert does not fully subscribe to synthetic geometry, but uses analytic and synthetic methods as two intersecting geometric toolboxes that address different needs. In the closing passage of his lecture from 1891, he lists the advantages in, of both disciplines. According to him, in analytic geometry, one arrives faster at propositions with highest generality, while projective geometry has the advantage of purity, closure, and conceptual necessity of its method. This distinguishes between projective geometry on the one hand, analytic geometry on the other is a bit odd because projective geometry can also be done with analytic methods. A prominent example is the work of the previously mentioned German geometer Pluckler. In fact, Hilbert was aware of Pluckler's work in 1894 lecture. He introduces homogeneous Pluckler coordinates as an alternative to Van Strout's metric free coordination and proves duality in Pluckler's way, although he does not explicitly mention Pluckler's name. Considering these two approaches to coordination, Hilbert draws the following conclusion. At the same time, one recognizes that projective and analytical geometry do not significantly differ at all, but rather only the starting points of the two branches of geometry are different, while their method surely comes to the same thing. This resembles Plucker's own evaluation of his results. The Plucker writes, the general analytical method and the methods which Poncelet developed are based on the one hand on essentially different ideas, but on the other hand, they coincide so completely in their results that the first method sometimes appears admittedly astonishingly enough to have been considered as a paraphrase of plagiarism of the second. The question should instead have been 
answered on whether there is necessarily a cause for the coincidence and where it is to be sought. Hilbert also builds on Pluckter's work. He presents a consistency proof for his axiom system and provides an analytical interpretation of the geometric notions that occur in his axioms, according to which points are identified with pairs of numbers and lines with triplets of numbers. Here, Hilbert takes over Pluckner's idea of the line coordinates. We have thus seen that Frege and Hilbert share the same mathematical heritage. However, the question remains of where their profound misunderstandings come from. In what follows, we argue that both have different conceptions about the relationship between axioms and on, on Chung, which make them evaluate the results of the 19th century geometry that they both acknowledge differently. So on Chung, I'm just going to translate his intuition. I'm having a hard time saying that word. Frege and Hilbert on axioms intuition. The polarity of different geometries poses a problem for Kant's philosophy of mathematics. For Kant's sentences of Euclidean geometry are a priori truths because Euclidean space is the intuition form of outer things. The possibility of alternative geometries is discussed neither in Kant's philosophy nor in the mathematical writings of his contemporaries. However, with the rise of non-Euclidean geometry, the epistic nature of Euclidean geometry came into question. As mentioned uh, for Gauss, geometry is an empirical science. It is empirical insofar as one could ask which geometry describes our universe form. According to Gauss, this can be investigated through physical experiments. Gauss builds his arguments on mathematical state of affairs. In non-Euclidean geometries, the inner angle sum is different from 180 degrees. The bigger the triangles are, the greater the difference from 180 degrees. Thus, Gauss concludes that measuring the angles of big triangles in physical space might eventually uncover the universe's geometry. The big triangles that he has in mind are triangles formed by light rays. Frege and Hilbert both have a more Kantian position insofar as they both, in a way, hold that geometric axioms are not empirical truths. According to Frege, we recognize the truth of geometric axioms through a particular source of knowledge, which he sometimes calls intuition. According to Hilbert, on the other hand, geometric axioms are not truths at all. However, we can ask which sets of axioms is more suitable for describing the physical world? The answer to this question is not merely an empirical one. We see that Hilbert is heavily influenced by Hertz and that his position resembles neo-Kantians such as Cassier. Frege's traditional no notions of axioms and intuition. Two crucial convictions about axiom shape Frege's philosophical discussion of non-Euclidean geometry. Firstly, Frege thinks that the mathematical sciences have a hierarchical order where the axioms of science that are lower in this hierarchy have to be consistent with the science, the axioms of sciences higher in the hierarchy but cannot be proven by them. Secondly, axioms express truth that rest on specific sources of knowledge which is related to the axioms position in the hierarchy. Frege's hierarchical structure from the top to bottom is as follows. One, logic, which includes arithmetic. Two, geometry, the axioms of which have to be consistent with the axioms of logic but cannot be deduced from them. And that is the reason why alternative geometries can be grasped by conceptual thought. And three, physics, the axioms, which must be consistent with the axiom of geometry, but cannot be deduced from them. And that is why fictional situations, which do not obey the laws of physics, can nonetheless be imagined as long as they are intuitable. This hierarchy can be illustrated as follows. Frege describes the hierarchy ordering in foundations. We have already discussed the relation between logic and geometry, which Frege explains in the passage um, quoted earlier. We have seen that according to Frege, Euclidean geometry is true, but non-Euclidean geometries are nonetheless perceivable by conceptual thought and thus by logical means because they obey the logical laws. One may recall Frege's conclusion that the axioms of geometry are independent of the primitive laws of logic and consequently are synthetic. Thus, we need intuition in order to recognize the true geometry among logical possible geometries. Logic is not sufficient for that. Similarly, in the same paragraph, Frege argues that alternatives to the true physical laws are intuitable. Empirical propositions hold good for what is physically or psychologically actual. The truths of geometry govern all that is spatially intuitable, whether actual or products of fantasy. The wildest version of delirium, the boldest inventions of legend and poetry, where animals speak and stars stand still, where men are turned to stone and trees turned into man, 
where the drowning hauled themselves up out of swamps by their own top knots. All these remain so long as they remain intuitable, still the subjects to the axioms of geometry. In other words, the axioms of physics have to be consistent with the axioms of geometry, but cannot be deduced from them. Otherwise, it would be impossible to imagine a world where alternative physics, ac physical axioms hold. Therefore, to determine the true axioms of physics among all the alternative axioms of physics that are intuitable, we need another source of knowledge, namely sense experience. According to this hierarchy of sources of knowledge, sense experience is not involved in the recognition of geometric truths. Thus, a geometrical sentence cannot be refuted by a physical experiment, in particular the Gaussian idea that physical experiments could challenge geometrical axioms makes no sense in Frege's conception of the sciences, thereby Frege follows Kant, for whom the idea that experiments could challenge the geometrical axioms is similar to the alien. However, unlike Kant, Frege does not have a profound philosophical explanation to justify this hierarchical order. Kant distinguishes between ding an sik and ding der erfahung. A ding an sik cannot be cognized. Space is the form of our outer experience. Thus, things are only spatial insofar as they are ding are ding der erfahung. Geometry expresses truths in the property of space. For a modern perspective, one can still criticize Kant for not presenting an argument for the Euclidean nature of space, which is inaccuristic since non-Euclidean geometry was discovered after Kant's death. However, Kant's conception allows him to argue why experiments cannot refute geometrical sentences. Physics deals with the Dinger der Erfenrung. Space is in the outer form of these Dinger der Erfenrung, and geometry is a science that determines the property of space. Thus, the laws of physics have to obey the laws of geometry. Frege never mentions this crucial Kantian concept. He simply claims that there is a geometrical source of knowledge, which he sometimes calls intuition. According to Frege, a source of knowledge is what justifies the recognition of truth, the judgment. In the case of logic, Frege makes how this works quite explicit. The basic laws of logic must be acknowledged as true because we cannot think their negation. Other logical truths that for Frege include all sentences of, the, of arithmetic can be acknowledged as true because they follow from the basic laws by simple rules, which are truth preserving. However, with the discovery of the paradox, this procedure turns out to be fallacious. The source of knowledge per geometrical sentence is intuition. Analogously, a geometric axiom is true if it is not intuitable that its negation holds. If we cannot imagine a world where they do not hold, not even the wildest vision of delirium or the boldest invention of the legend of poetry. However, how is this truth of geometric axioms justified by testing if its negation is not in intuitable? The decision procedure only makes sense if geometry only governs our dinge der Erf Erfenrung. Otherwise, it could be possible that alternative geometric axioms are true, even though we lack the capacity to imagine a world in which they do not hold. In the foundation, Frege himself indicates that there might be beings in a different spatial intuition. Unfortunately, Frege never discusses this distinction. Now, nevertheless, Frege does not doubt at all these Euclidean axioms, and the non-Euclidean ones are intuitable and thus true, even in his unpublished paper, from 1924, shortly before his death, Frege stresses that if we understand axioms in the old Euclidean sense as true statements, we need not fear their source of knowledge will be contaminated. Therefore, the geometrical source of knowledge is the most reliable source for Frege at this time, after the discovery of the Russell Paradox. When arguing for the truth of Euclidean geometry instead of non-Euclidean in his unpublished uh, note, Frege gives a merely historical argument by mentioning that Euclid's elements have exercised unquestionable sway for 2,000 years, the infamous comparison of non-Euclidean geometry to astrology, which occurs in this note, serves as an expression of the conviction, conviction that non-Euclidean geometry is false, since Euclidean geometry is true. However, this does not demonstrate that Frege dismisses non-Euclidean geometry completely. We have already seen that Frege, unlike Lutz, acknowledges the possibility of conceptually grasping non-Euclidean geometry. Moreover, we have already established that this is crucial for Frege's hierarchical understanding of the sciences. For example, we've seen that Frege presented a way to visually represent the results of analytical projective geometry in his thesis. 
we can use arithmetic to express alternative geometries that are not in accordance with our intuition. This is possible because Frege has a much broader notion of the analytical than Kant. Unlike Kant, Frege identifies being analytic with being deducible from logic. This resembles Kant's notion of analyticity insofar as Kant identifies analytical judgment with those that can be recognized by the principle of non-contradiction. Even so, Frege's notion of logic and analyticity goes well beyond Kant's. Most importantly, Frege can distinguish with his logic between concepts of different order and arity because he quant has quantifiers and relations. These tools allow him to build very complex notions from logic alone, such as having a successor and being a property inherited in the series. These notions stand in much more complex inferential relations than those expressed by solistic Syllogistic logic. AKL, thanks for tuning in. God bless. Syllogistic propositions have the form SSP that predicates S and P are composed of simpler notions by mere conjunction. We now may ask if P is among the simpler notions which S is composed by conjunction. If it is, SSP does not extend our knowledge because we only explain what is already there. Kant's famous example of is the sentence all bachelors are unmarried where unmarried is already contained in the definition of bachelor. Only this kind of sentence can be proven by the principle of non-contradiction. Frege argues that he can build complex notions that are not conjunctions of simpler notions, and that as a result, being logically deducible, thus in his terminology, analytic and just explicating the term subject terms, thus not extending our knowledge of Kant's terminology, do not coincide. Therefore, Frege for Frege, there are sentences that are analytic but nonetheless extend our knowledge. This contradicts sharply with Kant's original conception of logic and analyticity, which, according to Frege, is too narrow. It is only in the context of this broader notion of logic that it makes sense to call logic a source of knowledge. It is also essential for Frege's foundation project to deduce arithmetic from logic. However, in order to acknowledge the truth of geometry, we still need intuition. According to Frege, Frege never makes his notion of intuition explicit, even though it is the source of knowledge and geometry. Over in the preceding paragraph in Foundations, Frege provides a short explanation of what is particular about geometrical reasoning, which illuminates Frege's notion of intuition. One geometric point considered by itself cannot be distinguished in any way from another. The same applies to lines and planes. Only when several planes or lines or planes are included together in a single intuition, do we distinguish them in geometry? Therefore, it is quite intelligible that general propositions should be derived from intuition, the point of, or lines or planes, which we intuit are not really particular at all, which is what enables them to stand as representatives of their kind. This argument can be paraphrased as follows. What makes geometrical reasoning possible is that particular geometry Geometrical objects do not have specific properties besides their spatial relation. Consequently, general sentences can be derived from a single geometric construction. The ideas resemble Kant's conception of mathematical reasoning. According to this, it is crucial for mathematical proofs that they use constructions. In the chapter uh, from Transcendental Methods, Kant acknowledges that a figure as an empirical object is something particular. He argues that we can prove general statements through construction because we are simply considering the act of construction, thereby abstracting from all particularities, such as the absolute size of the figure. He thus sums up the difference between mathematical on behalf of constructions and philosophical on behalf of logical deductions, reasoning in the following way. Philosophical knowledge considers the particular only in the universal, mathematical knowledge the universal and the particular. This is exactly what Frege claims here regarding geometric knowledge. However, unlike Kant, Frege makes a sharp distinction between geometric and arithmetic knowledge. He states with, starts with the remark, we shall do well in general not to overestimate the extent to which arithmetic is akin to geometry. Then he refers back to a remark from Leibniz on arithmetic objects, which Frege quotes and endorses in foundations in, in number an even number can be divided into two equal parts, an odd number cannot. Three and six are triangle numbers, four and nine are squares, eight is a cube, and so on. This respect to arithmetical objects, such as numbers, differ significantly from geometric objects, which can only be distinguished in a single intuition. Frege concludes that the deduction of a single proposition from a single intuition is not possible in arithmetic. To what extent is a given particular number can be represent all the others? And at one point, its own special character comes into play. 
cannot be laid down generally in advance. Hence, arithmetic. Arithmetical knowledge allows no inference from the point to the general. It is purely logical. Thus, for Frege, the arithmetical reasoning is not like mathematical reasoning in the Kantian sense, but rather like Kant's philosophical knowledge. It is independent from intuition. The coherent Fragian conception of intuition aims to clarify why geometry and arithmetic rest on different sources of knowledge. It fails, however, to provide evidence for the truth of Euclidean ge geometry in contrast to non-Euclidean geometry. To summarize, Frege is aware that non-Euclidean geometries are without contradictions. Thus, his dismissive utterance about non-Euclidean geometry does not rest on mathematical ignorance. Philosophically, however, Frege does not present a good argument for the truth of Euclidean axioms and intuition is a source of knowledge for, for them. His notion of intuition clarifies why geometry and arithmetic rest on different sources of knowledge. However, it does not clarify why the axioms of Euclidean geometry are true and not those of non-Euclidean geometry. Hence, Frege's conviction that Euclidean axioms are true and that intuition provides a source of knowledge of these truths is philosophically dogmatic. Okay, down to two viewers. So, Orfeo, whoever's watching, hope you gain from this. Um, this is important for my future research. You know, really delve into what Frege and Hilbert actually said and the logic and especially the basis of axioms. And you know, this will refer back to truth. So this is uh, you know, relatively the most important part of uh, tonight's program. Heinrich Hertz's picture theory and Hilbert's late 1890s notion of an axiom. Like Frege, Hilbert was convinced at the time of their correspondence that arithmetic is part of logic and that geometry is not. However, the agreement between the two authors basically ends there. Hilbert opposes both of Frege's conviction about axioms when he wrote his Festschrift. Firstly, he holds that there is no hierarchical order of the sciences beyond the level of logic. In particular, physical experiments influence our choice of axioms for geometry. Secondly, for Hilbert, at this time, axioms does not express truths, but are merely a picture of reality. This is highly significant since different axiom systems contradicting each other can be pictures of reality. Finally, in the mid-1890s, Hilbert moves away from the idea that intuition is a source of knowledge that can be presupposed as given and on which our axioms rest. Instead, axiomization serves as a way to analyze intuition. In what follows, we will examine these three theses and show how all three are closely related to each other. The goal of his Festschrift is, according to his introduction, the logical analysis of our spatial intuition. The word intuition is of Kantian origin. The expression um, logical analysis, however, is not. Nonetheless, this term is not explained by Hilbert. However, we find an explanation of similar expression, logical analysis of our intuitive faculty in the notes on Hilbert's lectures on Euclidean geometry from the same year. Utilizing an expression taken from Hertz in the introduction to the principles of mechanics, we find we could formulate our main questions as follows. To which necessary and sufficient and mutually independent conditions must a system of things be subordinated so that to every property of these things corresponds a geometrical fact and vice versa. That is so that these things are complete in simple picture of geometric reality. We can finally call our task a logical analysis of our intuitive faculty. First, we need to clarify some of Hilbert's other expressions here. As becomes clear from the context, the necessary and sufficient conditions are the axioms. The word system can be found in Dedekind's work and roughly means set. In his foundation, Hilbert talks about three systems of things which he calls points, lines, and planes. Thus, these mathematical objects are not part of what Hilbert calls geometrical reality, but are mere pictures of it. Here, there is no direct relationship between axioms and reality, but the system of things serves as mediators. As Hilbert indicates at the beginning of this passage, he took the picture notion from Hertz's introduction to the principles of mechanics, a book published in 1894. Thus, to understand Hilbert's explanation, we must look closely at Hertz's picture theory. Hertz set up his picture theory in principles of mechanics, to explain why there can be different physical theories explaining reality, in his introduction, Hertz writes, we form for ourselves pictures or symbols of external objects, and the form which we give them is such that the necessary consequent of the pictures in thought are always the pictures of the necessary consequences in nature of the things pictured. In other words, pictures are what we would nowadays call scientific models. 
they allow us to predict future events. It is crucial for Hertz's conception that our pitcher has no ontological commitments. He writes in the same patch, passage, the pitchers, which we hear speak of our, our conception of things, which are things themselves, they are in conformity in one important respect, namely in satisfying the above mentioned requirement for a purpose it is not necessary that they should be in conformity with the things in any other respect whatsoever. Hertz's own theory of mechanics, for example, contains the so-called hidden masses. For Hertz, this does not mean that there is necessarily such an entity in the outer world, but only in the hidden masses fulfill the task within the theory, namely making good predictions about real world events possible. There is not only one picture of the world, but in order to classify it as a picture, a theory has to meet three criteria. First, it has to be logically permissible, consistent. Unlike Hilbert, Hertz did not have any formal tools to prove a theory's consistency. Of course, being consistent is not sufficient for a theory to be a picture of reality. Therefore, the theory also has to be correct in accordance with the empirical observation. This is the most important criterion. It also expressed in the aforementioned definition of a picture that the necessary consequent of the picture is thought are always the principle of the necessary consequence of the nature of the things pictured. Different mutual inconsistence theories can meet this criterion. In fact, at the time, there were several theories of mechanics that all met this criterion. His book first compares the classical Newtonian mechanics, the mechanics of Hemholtz, and his own with each other. Consequently, there can be several theories that are all correct. To pick one of several equally correct theories, one must have a different criterion. The third criterion is called appropriateness. A theory is appropriate if it is more distinct, if it pictures more of the essential relation of the object. Of two equally distinct pictures, the simpler picture, the one which has the smaller number of superfluous or empty relations, is the more appropriate. Whether a particular picture is appropriate or not is, however, disputable. Unsurprisingly, Hertz argues in Principles of Mechanics that his own theory for mechanics is the most appropriate one. Utilizing Hertz's expression of picture in the context of geometry, Hilbert extends Hertz's picture theory beyond its original scope, physics to geometry. Hilbert discusses all three criteria for being a picture when evaluating his axiom system for geometry. Both Frege and Hilbert would agree on the first criterion, a geometrical axiom system must be consistent in order to be considered to be scientific at all. The criterion for correctness, however, marks an important difference to Frege's conviction about the sciences. For Frege, it is crucial that we want to express true thoughts with scientific sentences. For Frege, there are also sentences which express thoughts that are neither true nor false, like Odysseus was uh, ashore at Ithaca sounds asleep, but these sentences belong to poetry, not science, because Odysseus does not refer to a real human. The logical laws tell us that if a sentence is true, its negation has to be false. Therefore, if the axioms of parallels is true, its negation has to be false. However, if the axioms of parallels had no truth value at all, it would not be a scientific sentence but belong instead to poetry. As Ulrich Major put it, Hertz was the first to notice that not all scientific sentences are either true or false, but some of them have a rather different and very peculiar relation to reality. These are the theoretical sentences of our theory. They are correct, not true in a Frege sense. The theoretical terms like hidden mass do not refer to a certain entity. Still, they fulfill the crucial task of enabling us to set up a theory where the necessary consequence of the image in thought are always the images of necessary consequence in the nature of the things pictured. Consequently, for Hertz and Hilbert, the fact that a sentence includes words that do not refer is a sign of its being non-scientific. In this context, we have to read Hilbert's claim that one could substitute the words point, line, and plane with the words love, law, and chimney sweep Hilbert was not interested in the philosophy of language, and neither did he conduct any own research on logic at this time. It is the picture theory of scientific theories that lies behind this claim. For Hilbert, there's no such thing as real points, planes, and lines, just as there's no real hidden masses. They are theoretical concepts that enable us to set up scientific theories that meet the correctness criteria. They have no existence outside their role in the theory. As we've shown above, appropriateness is a criterion that is only applicable if our theories are correct but not true, since different theories can be correct. Well, for Frege, only one can be true. In his lectures on the foundations of geometry from 1894, the year in which Hertz's Principle of Mechanics was published, Hilbert evaluates the Gaussian experience mentioned above, in which one measures the inner triangle sum of the astronomical triangles in order to determine the geometrical form of physical space. After criticizing Lutz for neglecting the possibility, absence of contradictions, non-Euclidean geometries, he discusses the Gaussian experiment in the following way. Of course, to come back to Lutz prejudice, no experiment can force us to acknowledge hyperbolic geometry. Rather, even if the angle sum 
appears from an experiment to be greater to less than pi, it is always possible to get by with the usual Euclidean space. Still, it would be simpler, more transparent, and would need fewer axioms if under these circumstances we were to postulate the hyperbolic nature of our space. From this quote, we can conclude two things. Firstly, that Hilbert acknowledges the possibility of classifying different geometries as correct, although one might be more appropriate, thus they are not true in the Fragan sense. Second, Hilbert at this time disagrees with the Gaussian idea that one can determine the geometric form of our universe by experiment. If we measure things smaller than pi, it would be easier, more transparent, and would be need fewer axioms. If we were to use hyperbolic rather than Euclidean geometry, this is a Hertzian idea applied to geometry. The hyperbolic geometry as well as Euclidean geometry could be part of a correct picture of space. However, claiming that space is hyperbolic would be the more appropriate choice since it is simpler. Likewise, Hilbert rejects the idea that one could ultimately determine the physical laws of our universe. He claims that nobody could force us to assume the Copernican model since one could also choose the Ptolemaean model. However, the description would be more complicated with the Ptolemaean model. Thus, Hilbert agrees with Frege in his rejection of Gauss. Empirical data cannot falsify geometric axioms. Even if we measure triangle sums smaller than pi, we're not forced to accept hyperbolic geometry. However, unlike Frege, Hilbert admits the empirical data inference influence our choice of axiom systems with geometry. He therefore rejects the Frege idea of a hierarchical order over geometry and physics. This shows that Hilbert and Frege have different convictions regarding not just geometry, but axiomatic theories in general. As seen earlier, Frege claims that geometric axioms cannot be refuted by physical experiments because they express truths about the knowledge source, intuition on which physics also rests. For Hilbert, intuition is not a knowledge source for the axioms, but an object of axiomatic analysis, which we have to presuppose to gain a picture of reality. This idea can be illustrated with an example. Hilbert in 1899 presents six groups of axioms in his Feschgriff. In what follows, we examine the meaning of, of analysis of intuition. For one example, namely a group of axioms of congruence, the group of axioms of congruence consists of five axioms. The first three concern line segments, while the last two concern angles. These axioms demand that segments and angles <coughs> can be moved in space without changing their shape and size or size. This is important because the axioms are not fulfilled in space with non-constant curvature. As we have seen in the first section, this property was first identified by Riemann. Riemann points out that the space of constant curvature, every line can be measured by every other line. This means precisely that one can take a segment and compare it to a size of any other line anywhere in space. One can further illustrate this property by saying that a segment should not change its form or size when moved in space. This is illustrated by Hemmoltz in his paper which uses the example of a flat beings living on the surface of an egg. An egg has a higher curvature at the top than in the middle. Thus, a triangle with sides of a certain size would have a lower angle sum on the top than in the middle. Therefore, one cannot move a triangle on the surface of an egg without changing its shape. Thus, Hilbert's axioms do not hold for these fictional beings. Helmholtz comments on the mathematical investigation of this paper in a way in which very interesting for us, our understanding of Hilbert. I offer these remarks at first only to show what difficulties attend the complete analysis of the presuppositions we make in employing a common intuitive method. We evade, evade them when we apply to the investigation of principles, the analytical method of modern algebraic geometry. The formulation analysis of the presuppositions we make in employing the common intuitive method has an interesting similarity to Hilbert's notion of analysis of intuition and analysis of our intuition. Both authors want to further analyze what is traditionally by Frege and Kant taken to be ultimate foundation for which our geometric axioms rest, intuition. For both authors, this means that we have to make explicit what distinguishes the Euclidean geometry from other geometries. Therefore, it seems plausible that Hilbert borrowed this expression from Hemholtz. The thought experiment with the beings living on the surface of an egg shows that the property of a space that figures can be moved in all directions without changing their shape is not a logical necessity. Therefore, the property needs to be explicit in the axiomization. The analysis of intuition via axiomization aims for this kind of understanding of what distinguishes a correct picture of reality from an axiom set that does not fulfill this property of correctness. Hilbert explicitly puts this axiom approach to geometry in relation to the analy analytic and synthetic approach by claiming that in both disciplines, 
the principal questions are not treated of and supports this claim by pointing out that in analytic geometry, one starts with the introduction of number. As seen earlier, this was criticized by synthetic geometries who developed a geometry that does not use metric notions. We have also seen that Hilbert broadly followed Van Stout in his lectures in the early 1890s after adopting his own geometrical approach. Hilbert criticized synthetic geometry. Thus, in projective geometry, one appeals to intuitive intuition from the start, whereas we want to analyze the intuition in order, so to speak, to reconstruct from its individual components. Analysis thus has to be understood literally as breaking up into parts in order to identify the necessary and sufficient conditions to obtain mediated by the system of things, a picture of geometrical reality. It is crucial from this project that axioms are not perceived as true sentences, otherwise they could not be understood as particles, which are the result of our analysis and which form may form entirely different geometries when combined with other particles. Over, therefore, thereby goes beyond Van Stout, his former idol, and also Frege, who both simply presuppose intuition as given. Despite Hilbert's use of Kantian terms like intuition and his argument against Gauss's anti-Kantian philosophy of geometry, Hilbert is obviously not a full-blooded Kantian. As we pointed out earlier, for Kant, it would make no sense to challenge geometrical claims through physical experiments. However, Hilbert and Hertz influenced the neo-Kantianism of Cassier, influenced uh, the neo-Kantianism of Cassier with the idea of different pictures of the world as early as the 19th 10, um, but also later, 1921, in the third volume, uh, 1928, Cassier praises Hertz and Hilbert for recognizing the creative character of theoretical concepts in physics and mathematics. Mathematical concepts are the intelligent, intellectual establishment of constructive connections. They cannot be gained from physically present bodies by simple abstraction. The idea receives its clearest expression in Hilbert's axiomization. Later in the philosophy of symbolic forms, he extends this Hertzian Hilbertian idea into the scope of human culture, including art, religion, and myth. They all live in a particular picture world, uh, which do not merely reflect the empirically given, but which rather produce it in accordance with an independent principle. Symbols are created by the intellect itself, therefore they are no passive images and are different from the Kantian notion of intuition insofar as we can create different symbols. What makes this approach neo-Kantian is the object is that the object of experience depends on the subject of experience. We find that the idea of Hilbert and Hertz, who acknowledge that our theory axioms, pictures, frames, and our knowledge of the outer world, but not in Frege, who is less Kantian in this respect, what makes this neo-Kantian breaking with the Kantian conviction is that the subject can deliberately change the form of the experience. Something Cassier takes from Hertz's picture theory and its reception in Hilbert. In this respect, Frege is the more conservative Kantian. A. John Wolf, good to see you. God bless. Conclusion. We have seen in this paper that Frege and Hilbert came from a similar mathematical backgrounds. Their controversy cannot simply be explained by Frege's ignorance because Frege was well aware of the developments of the mathematics of the time and did not dismiss them. The Frege-Hilbert controversy is rooted in a disagreement that goes well beyond the subject matter of geometry and logic. It concerns the general question of how our theoretical terms can relate to the real world and how we can generate theoretical knowledge. Similarly, this controversy cannot be explained as a disagreement on the issues of logic or philosophy of language. Instead, Hilbert developed his non-referential understanding of axioms motivated by his epistemological concern, which were influenced by Hertz's picture theory of physics. Thus, Hilbert's model theory, Reddick logic, emerged from this epistemological perspective, not the other way around. Keeping this in mind might help to avoid an anachronistic reading of the Frege-Hilbert controversy. In this paper, we focused on the Hilbert of the 1890s, as Corey already pointed out, Hilbert's reference to intuition shifted after he started working on the general theory of relativity in a more empiricist direction. The question of why and how precisely Hilbert's philosophical convictions changed in that period is an interesting one. Its answer would help to get a unified picture of Hilbert's rich and diverse work. However, it is a research question that goes beyond the scope of this paper. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad I read that one all the way through, and you know, hopefully... A handful of people are still watching Orfeo, KL, you know, anybody hope that you gain from that. And I thought there was a lot of information there. We'll see when we get to Heidegger, hopefully very soon. Um, actually, right right next, I'm going to get to Heidegger uh, right away, that it will 
somewhat be the Judeo aspect here of the difference between Frege and Hilbert of you know, this kind of Judaic concept of truth being determined by man, you know, specifically by the Jewish people uh, from a Judaic concept, but from the neo-Kantian mechanism that man makes truth as opposed to the Fragian um, concept of truth, which is completely mind independent. And, you know, that's why you know, the, uh, when I, Church of Entropy, we used to stream and talk and I would, you know, harp over and over again on this um, mind independence. Um, so let me just say Kriya Shema. I'm going to say Shema Yisrael. And then we'll look at Heidegger and we'll see how much energy I have. Like I have enough. I could probably go to like two in the morning, although, you know, I'll definitely go to midnight, God willing. So let me just say Shmai Yisrael. And see what happened. Brundle, Ricardo in the chat said he's here in Detroit. I'm not sure business or whatever. So we'll see if he wants to meet up maybe tomorrow. Um, see what happens. Okay, let's pour myself tea. I was drinking coffee. I'm going to switch to tea. And we'll continue with Heidegger in a minute. Okay, so let's look at Heidegger, and we'll see, you know, as I mentioned, the 1929 um, debate between Heidegger and Cassier, which was on Kantianism. And so, you know, this background between Frege and Hilbert, which is somewhat of an interpretation of um, Kant and Hilbert somewhat falling into the school of neo-Kantianism as well as Hertz and Hemmholtz are considered neo-Kantians leading into the Vienna circle and Hilbert even being like a transition from neo-Kantianism to the Vienna circle um, that we've talked about uh, previously. So let's First, just a general background to Heidegger and his counter-Semitism. You know, I, I looked at these slides earlier, and then we'll go more in depth into it. Martin Heidegger's anti-Semitism, the personal and the political. History is often torn when it comes to Heidegger's personal philosophy and political dispositions. Can his anti-Semitism truly be separated from his being? German philosopher Martin Heidegger was born in 1889 in a small town in southern Germany where he received a Catholic education. He published Being in Time while working at the University of Marburg. He claimed the book contained the first two parts of the rest of his six-part philosophy. He never completed the rest of it, but the first two parts were sufficient to secure him a permanent spot in the philosophy as one of the most original and sufficient thinkers to have ever existed. In 2014, however, Heidegger was dragged 
into a sphere of scrutiny and disenchantment. The black notebooks were proof of Heidegger's fabled anti-Semitism, and philosophers and scholars are divided in undertaking Heidegger since. This article looks into the black notebooks to answer the age-old question of separating the personal from the political, and ultimately, in the case of the philosophical, in doing so, it discerns how one may read Heidegger in light of his anti-Semitic beliefs after 2014. Heidegger on being. What does it mean to be? Why do we not tackle the question of being? Is it possible to actually answer such a question? In trying to answer these questions, Heidegger secured an unpresented precedent to position on the philosophical stage as an original thinker. The object of Heidegger's philosophy is to counter not supplement the subject of the most Western philosophical discourse. The question that take the form of does X a particular object subject exist, uh, does God exist, are questions Western philosophy has catered to for most of its history since Plato. Heide Heidegger contests these questions and begins with admitting that we do not know what it means for something to exist. Instead, with being in time, Heidegger takes on this immensely complicated question, what does it mean to be? Do we, in our time, have an answer to the question of what it really means by the word being? Not at all. So it's fitting that we should raise anew the question of the meaning of being. But we are nowadays even perplexed at our inability to understand the expression of being. Not at all. So first we must reawaken an understanding for the meaning of this question. Heidegger is discomforted by Descartes' ma famous maxim, I think, therefore I am, because it presupposes what it means to be. For him, being is the first experience the, of the human condition. In between being and thought, Heidegger presupposes the design. Literally, design is translated into being there. But Heidegger used it to denote being in the world. With this neologism, Heidegger muddles the distinction between the subject, the human person, and the object, the rest of the world ultimately freeing his philosophy of any other philosophical undertaking of what it means to exist. It is impossible to exist as a human disjointed from the world. This also means that it's impossible for human beings to conduct philosophy as subjects that observe an object. For Heidegger, this ontological method, which has been dominant ever since the Enlightenment era, undermines design what it means to be in the world. Being is the precondition for all that constitutes living, be it science, art, literature, family work, or emotions. This is why the work of Heidegger is so important, because it is universal in the character insofar that tackles the question of existing as a person or even an entity. Heidegger classifies the being of human beings into conditions of authenticity and inauthenticity. Inauthenticity is the condition of Verfallen, wherein a person is subject to social norms and conditions, where they live in a methodological and predetermined life, he says that there is a process by which they can find their authentic self again, called befindlichkeit. When Heidegger talks about design, he attributes the interaction of human beings with the time in which they exist as being central to the condition of being in the world, being in that particular time. The understanding of the present is rooted in the past and arches towards the future, it is anchored by birth and anxiety about death. We reach out towards the future while taking to our past, thus yielding our present activities. Note how the future and hence the aspect of possibility has priority over the two other two moments. Heidegger finds that death, the universal character of it, is an underlying structure in the human condition. When a person engages with the world, with the anxiety that comes from the structure, they become authentic. That is to say that the condition of the very fallen becomes futile because the all-encompassing nature of death. After this realization, a person begins to do what they want to do, liberating themselves from the social diet dictates of everyday life. The only way for a person to approach this condition of authenticity and to engage with the time they live in is by challenging the concepts that seem to surround them. As such, for Heidegger, human beings are beings that bring their own being into question. His philosophy essentially deals with the condition of being with reference to the existing structures within the global community persist Americanism, Bolshevism, capitalism, world Judaism, military warfare, liberalism, and national socialism are some concepts he tackles in his phenomenological undertaking of the human condition in his time. Black blemishes, tainting Heidegger. Heidegger's black 
oilcloth notebooks titled Considerations and Remarks were published in 2014. The author of Being in Time became the subject of international controversy after the four volumes were revealed to be a careful installation of anti-Semitism in his philosophy. To any of the contemporary followers of Heidegger, his considerations, the first three volumes, and remarks, the last one of his black notebooks, wouldn't come as a surprise. Heidegger was a national socialist and wrote about the Jewification of Germany in 1916 to his wife, his involvement with the NSDAP, and his damning seminars as the rector are sufficient to understand what his political affiliations were to other philosophers and students. However, these publications are too large a grain of salt to swallow in post-Holocaust world. In Ponderings 7 to 11 of the Black Notebooks, Heidegger talks about Jews and Judaism. Some of his undertakings, which are explicitly mentioned, Judaism include Western metaphysics has allowed the expansion of empty rationality and calculative capacity, which explains the occasional increase in the power of Judaism. This power abodes in the spirit of the Jews who can never grasp the hidden domains of their rise to such power. Consequently, they will become all the more inaccessible as a race. At one point, he suggests that Jews have, with their empathetically calculative giftedness, been living in accord with the principle of race, which is why they are, are also offering the most vehement resistance to its unrestricted application. England can be without the Western outlook because the modernity has inst instituted is directly towards the unleashing of the machination of the globe. England is now playing out to the end within Americanism, Bolshevism, and world Judaism as capitalistic and imperialistic franchise. The question of world Judaism is not a racial but a metaphysical one concerning the kind of human existence which in an utterly unrestrained way can undertake as a world historical task the uprooting of all beings from being. Using their powerful and capitalistic underpinnings, they extend their homelessness to the rest of the world through machination to effectuate the objectification of all persons, uprooting all beings from being. He includes some observations about World War II in its third year of commencement. World Judaism incited by the emigrants out of Germany cannot be held fast anywhere and with all of its development power, does not need to participate anywhere in the activities of war, whereas all that remains to us is the sacrifice of the best blood of the best of our own people. His statements about Judaism show an inclination towards eugenics, something he deliberately frames as a metaphysical inclination. Jews are inherently calculative, and they have taken over the world because of their persistent allegiance to the race. Th through planning and machination, he situates the world Judaism in his conception at the end of being, thus constituting an important part of what it means to be in the world. By attributing this characteristic to the Jewish community, Heiger places it at the center of a reach towards the purification of being, the personal and political. Akin to most forms of political subjection and discrimination, anti-Semitism manifests itself in various modes of thought and behavior. In the Dialects of Enlightenment, 1944, Theodore Adorno identifies some elements of anti-Semitism, which includes Jews are seen as a race and not as a religious minority. This allows them to be separated from the population, presenting them as an anti-race in comparison to an inherently superior race obstructing their happiness. Jews are responsible actors of capitalism and oriented towards monetary interest and powers. This justifies scapegoating Jews for the frustrations with capitalism, attributing certain natural characteristics to Jews, which are expressions of their tendency towards human domination, making it impossible to defend them as a people because they inherently possess a domineering tendency. Jews are considered to be especially powerful because they are constantly subjected to a dominion within society. Society feels the need to suppress the Jewish people as a measure of self-defense against their expansive powers. Otherizing, projecting hatred towards the community is an irrational behavior. The role of philosophy before the Holocaust is no longer contested philosophers and eugenicists work incessantly and against staggering odds to establish Jews as a race and ultimately to characterize their entire population as a threat. In this context, it appears Heidegger's characterization of Jews and his concept of world Judaism are sufficiently anti-Semitic to blemish his entire body of work. After the Black Notebooks were published, philosophers and scholars have come forth with their own interpretation and defenses of the extent of Heidegger's anti-Semitism and its effect on his philosophy, 
They have sparked an inquiry into his relationship with Herschel, his professor, to whom he dedicated being in time, and to his lifelong friend and lover, Hannah Arden, both of whom were Jews. In Ponderings, Heidegger designates the Judas calculative capacity to Herschel and goes on to use his designation as a ground for criticism, further weakening the case for Heidegger's lack of an express anti-Semitism. Arden has, on behalf of Heidegger, clarified that the involvement of Heidegger with the Nazi party and of subsequent letters to peers and family and several anti-Semitic lectures, which would become the Black Notebooks, were all mistakes on his part. History and Heidegger. We have arrived at the time in history where every published work is subject to strict scrutiny for bigotry, irrespective of the time within which the work was constituted. There are, generally speaking, three approaches one may take in understanding and making use of the works that are explicitly bigoted, rejection of the work altogether, selective application of the work if it's possible to do so, or forgiveness out of a compassion for the time wherein the work was conceived. A similar practice is seen in the study of Heidegger since the Black Notebooks were made public. We can begin with the Justin Burke's defense of Heidegger being in time is considered to be an extremely influential piece of 20th century philosophy, and Burke in his lecture in Seattle 2015 claims that being was the work of the secured Heidegger, his place in the history of philosophy. Since it was published in 1927, Burke expressed discontent with the supplementation of being in time by the Black Notebooks. He finds that the Black Notebooks were published about 40 years after Heidegger's death so that they have no bearing on Heidegger's primary philosophical contribution. He goes on to say Heidegger's involvement with the Nazi party was compulsory as he had to save his place as the rector of the University of Friedberg. For Burke, his position that Heidegger must be discarded as a credible philosopher because the Black Notebooks is preposterous because his philosophy or the only Heideggerian philosophy that really matters is the being time of 1927. This exoneration act is constituted by a quantitative approach, stacking Heidegger's expressively anti-Semitic work against the magnitude of the rest of his work and qualitative approach, which distinguishes the philosopher from the man. The qualitative approach is defeated by one of the first account of Heidegger on his anti-Semitism. Heidegger's student Karl Loeth published The Political Implication of Heidegger's Existentialism in 1946. Loeth found that Heidegger's anti-Semitism cannot be separated from the philosophy, and this was clearly evident to him much before the Black Notebooks were published. In fact, Loeth made this reference almost 70 years before the Notebooks were published. Victor Farias in Heidegger and Nazism, 1989. Tom Rockmore on Heidegger's Nazism Philosophy, 1997. Emmanuel Fay on, in Heidegger, The Introduction of Nazism and Philosophy, 2009, further substantiate the affinity of Heidegger's Nazism with his philosophy. The effect, this effectively only refutes the quantitative exoneration, which assumes that only published anti-Semitism should be accounted for in assessing Heidegger's numerous lectures and sessions supplemented the notebooks, and they cannot be avoided. Peter Ton Troni finds that, well, there is no point in pretending that Heidegger's philosophy is not anti-Semitic, it is not useful to reject the work or even to accept it without scrutiny, he asked and said, in the individual text about Judaism are situated within a larger framework of anti-Semitism, and to which extent the anti-Semitism manifests itself. Twani goes on to say that the nature of anti-Semitism is such that it can be grafted onto philosophy, but that it does not make the philosophy itself anti-Semitic, much less what follows from that philosophy as such. It is futile to look for the presence of or absence of anti-Semitism in a text because Heidegger's works were conceived in a historical context where anti-Semitism was everywhere. So Heidegger should be treated with compassion and acceptance, and his work should be sub Objected to complete anti-Semitic interpretation to see which parts of his philosophy can withstand scrutiny, which parts cannot. To this end, Twani presumes that a scholar of philosophy will read his works and discern for himself whether his works are anti-Semitic or not, suggesting that there is no objective measure of the degree to which his works are anti-Semitic. But what happens when a non-philosopher or scholar attempts to read Heidegger without any context of his philosophical and historical propositions? If, according to Heidegger himself, the condition of being is constituted by thought, action, and perception, creating a unity in the phenomenology of the being, we must ask, can one thought really be separated from another when Heidegger tells us that German thought was different and superior to other traditions of thought, that the Jews are a race inherently turned for, to, tuned for world domination through machination, that the Jews are powerful because they take refuge in their race, 
and that real Judaism reproduces itself as at the expense of the blood of the best Germans, does he make it possible to see beyond his words anymore? Does it matter if Heidinger was anti, an anti-Semite? Heidinger is a philosopher who dabbles in existentialism and phenomenology. His style of work is characteristic because he doesn't attempt to answer questions which do not bear significance to the actual condition of being, so everydayness becomes relevant. When he explicitly invokes politics or geopolitics, even he pre purposely puts himself in a position of vulnerability. Out of the hundreds of volumes in his work, Heidinger wants the black notebooks to be published last, as if to say the notebooks are his concluding remarks. And it, is, it turns out that he did not conclude his own philosophy for good with the heavy and tainted lid of anti-Semitism. To read and to read philosophy in particular and to allow oneself to be indoctrinated to permit someone else to tell us how to think and to go about the world, scholars tirelessly scrutinize written texts for discrimination because they acknowledge the value that reading has and the way in which it can affect the reader. Literature and philosophy are not the only reflections of the aims of the times in which they are created, but they are capable of birthing revolutions and wars. So when one picks up Heidinger without any pretext, they put themselves in an extraordinarily susceptible position. A long time before notebooks, Heidegger's contemporaries were disappointed, skeptical, and vocal about Heidegger's anti-Semitic undertakings. Notebooks then aren't capable of exonerating Heidegger on counts of anti-Semitism in his early works. If anything, knowledge of his anti-Semitic dispositions are necessary to read Heidegger, even if he were to treat the reader as an intelligent person, the genius of Heidegger would likely be beyond them. The only way in which there is any chance that Heidegger can be read and given merit for the rest of his philosophy would be to inform the reader of his political positions and to leave the task of acceptance and rejection at their discretion, given the devastating history and the effects of the big of works. However, this compassion would truly be a gamble. Okay, so that's kind of a critical view of Heidegger and his counter-Semitism. This is from a whole book on Heidegger's black notebooks, which as mentioned, like less than 1% of the black notebooks talk about Jews, and there's thousands of pages. So here is an article from Michael Fagenblatt, Heidegger and the Jews, and it's a little bit long, so I'm just going to skip the opening. And this talks about Rabbi Soloveitchik, and you know, as I mentioned, Heidegger is actually reasonably popular among Jews, uh, American Jews, Reformed Jews, Israelis, and Zionism, and even modern Orthodoxy. I mentioned that um, Rabbi Salvechik was present in Davos at the Cassier Heidegger debate in 1929. It's absolutely unbound or the role of world Jewry in uprooting all beings from being. There are two ways Heidegger's anti-Semitism is expressed in the Black Notebooks. These confirm for what it's worth, the distinction he relied on in December 1945 to justify his rector's address of 1933, namely the gap between his private national socialism and that of the party. Just as Heidegger thought he could distinguish between his private national socialism and the popular one, so too does he invoke the distinction between his private philosophical anti-Semitism and the vulgar common one. The distinction goes back at least to 1929 when he worried that Germany's indigenous spiritual life was being eroded by the process of Jewification. In the broad and narrow sense, at once introducing the distinction and allowing for unhindered passage from private, broad, and spiritual anti-Semitism to vulgar, narrow, and authentic racism, the Black Notebook show where Heidegger conceives the distinction at a philosophical level, even as he himself crosses from the metaphysical to vulgar anti-Semitism according to the opportunism of the moment. It must be supposed that Heidegger's vulgar anti-Semitism proceeds and makes possible his attempt to legitimate it philosophically. This conforms to the scheme of being in time, according to which Dasein makes sense of the world by first immersing itself in inauthentic idle talk. Heidegger's anti-Semitism is in the first instance an expression of his own inauthentic adoption of the anti-Semitic idle talk with which Thus, man understood Jews in everyday Germany existence in the 1930s. The Black Notebooks confirmed this type of folkish anti-Semitism. Heidegger expressed to Karl Jaspers on June 30th, 1933, when he referred to a dangerous international alliance of Jews that gave the protocols the elders of Zion to bring a truth despite his admission that it is a forgery. 
for example, world jewelry spurred further by immigrants that Germany let go is ungraspable everywhere. And even though its power is widespread, it does not need to participate in military action, whereas we are left to sacrifice the best of our blood for the best of our people. Here too, Heidegger adopts the deposited stereotypes that Dustman propagates, thereby falling into or falling prey to vulgar anti-Semitism. The more notable development, however, involves the emergence of a philosophical rationale for this vulgar anti-Semitism. Given Heidegger's philosophical objection to biologicism, it was to be expected that vulgar racialized anti-Semitism would be subject to critique in the name of a more philosophical anti-Semitism. Indeed, Heidegger's private national socialism finds its correlate in the private anti-Semitism that is more authentic than garden variety racism, but for the same reason also more radical, more primordial and originary than biologicist anti-Semitism. The question of the role of rural Jewry is not racial, it is rather a metaphysical question and the nature of the type of humanity, the absolute unbound that can assume the world historic task of uprooting all beings from being. This philosophical dimension of Heidegger's anti-Semitism is already subtly glimpsed in Being in Time, where the calculative rationalism of Kantian morality is denounced as the type of uh, Phariseeism and the corrupt traditional concept of truth as adequatio intellectus et re is traced to Isaac Israeli, who is, is implied misled Avancina in turn Aquinas, but is in the black notebooks that Heidegger develops and deploys the idea of metaphysical anti-Semitism. It licenses him at once to distance himself from the crude biological racism and at the same time hold the Jews responsible for the Machenschaft and associated catastrophes besieging being in the modern age. The Jews, he supposes, participate and indeed intensify the calculative rationality of modern metaphysics, not because they are racially or biologically disposed to calculative thinking, but because they, more than any other people, are alienated from their concentrated historical existence. The worldlessness of Judaism is grounded on the forms of the gigantic, tenacious skillfulness in calculating, hustling, and intermingling, but it does not ground them. According the, the Jews are not the cause or even a cause of the deracinated rationalism they promote. The relationship between world Jewry and modern Western rationalism is typological, not historical, causal, or biological. The root causes of the overwhelming of sign and modernity are Platonism, Cartesianism, and Neo-Kantianism, and scientism. World Jewry propagates the cardinal sin of empty rationality and calculative efficiency, even if it did not initiate them. If Platonism and later Christian rationalism set the metaphysics of uprootedness in motion, the Black Notebooks confirm that Heiger thinks world Jewry plays a decisive role in internationalizing it, having become an absolute unbound type of humanity. World Jewry can only fiend to participate in spirit. Concretely, it is unable to assess the decision regions belonging to the grounding of truth of being. The Jews have adopted the Volksgeist for themselves and play a crucial though not exclusive role in globalizing it. The history of being thereby reveals the falsity of biologicist anti-Semitism and at the same time grounds its metaphysical legitimacy. Thus Heidegger regards the biologistic ideology of national socialism as a lording of blood that is just sacrifice, surface, and pretense that intensifies the unconditional lordship of the machinations of destruction, even as he seeks the significance of German poetry for the destiny of the world. The nadir of this repeatedly undertaken passage for the vulgarity of ideology to its spiritual truth, which is the philosopher's way of taking responsibility for what he believes to be involving himself in truthfully and authentically in politics, consists of Heidegger's blaming the Jews for the racial anti Semitism that besets them. The breeding programs, eugenics, and killings waged on the account of modern racism result not from the biological constitution of people like the Jews, but from the Machenschaft which, as it happens, is the metaphysical vocation of Jews. The Jews, with their emphatic talent for calculation, have already been living for the longest time according to the principle of race, which is why they also take a stand as vigorously as they can against its unrestricted application. The establishment of racial breeding does not stem from life itself, but from the overpowering of life by mass machination. What mass machination is up to with such planning is the complete deracialization of peoples by binding them to equally assembled, equally divided arrangements of all beings. Deracialization goes hand in hand with self 
alienation of people, the loss of history, that is of the decision regions of being. The Jewish talent for calculation is for Heidegger complicit in the root cause of the racial anti-Semitism in assailing them. The Jews promote a Maschenschaft in which the concept of life is manipulated into what one can breed, which is a type of calculation, and therefore the Jews themselves are responsible for the racialized thinking they hypocritically denounce. The image of the Jewish existence that Heidegger elliptically outlines in the Black Notebooks is thus of a vicious but also a tragic circle, disconnected from the decision reason grounded by Bing's specific modes of appearing. The Jews have become symbolic exponents of the empty rationality and calculative thinking that globalize alienization in the modern age, including racialized ways of determining humanity. The Jews advance a type of thinking that determines the anti-Semitism they themselves suffer. One final example of this passage from inauthentic to authentic anti-Semitism will suffice. Peter Trony has pointed to a shocking remark in the 1938-40 to 40 manuscript that was censored by Fritz Heidegger when he published the text in discussing the greatest planetary criminals of the most recent modern times. The transcript records Heidegger suggesting that one should ask how the peculiar predetermination of jewelry for planetary criminality is grounded. Trani sensibly links this to Heidegger's oblique endorsement expressed to Jaspers as slander of the protocols of Elder Zion. Even so, as Richard Polt notes, Heidegger thinks of criminality in light of the history of being rather than a ju judicial moral way. Criminality refers to the invisible devastation of being under the sway of machination, not the visible destructions of the catastrophes of war. Here, too, then the charge of planetary criminality is not simply aimed at the purpose supposed machinations of scheming Jews, at, uh, but at Machenschaft as such, in which Jews are, he thinks, especially caught up. What we find in the Black Notebooks is not simply vulgar racial anti-Semitism, but it's non-biological reinscription into the apocalyptic history of being. In some for Heidegger, world Jewry stands for the metaphysical movement at work in the uprooting of the modern world. This ontological rather than anti-construer of the Jews makes them not merely an uprooted people, but the vanguard and symbol of the uprooting of the world that characterizes in the modern epoch, uprooted from the proper land and language, world Jewry is everywhere. That form of abstract calculative thinking works to homogenize being. It represents or allies itself with everything that converts being into the global currencies of capitalism and technology, but it also allies itself with forms of political existence that disfigure humanity according to the uniform standards. Thus, with both liberalism and communism, that is why in the blink of an eye it can be conflated with historical processes that far exceed its visible influences, such as those taking place with the imperialist England or Americanism or and Bolshevism, which in Heidegger's schema of an uprooting type of humanity means at the same time world Jewry. The being... The philosophical ground of Heidegger's metaphysical anti-Semitism can be traced to being a time where Heidegger argues that dust science spatiality is not a mathematized extended field, but involves an ontological connection with the world that arises through its ready-to-hand relations with the aroundness of the environment. In the 1930s, this primordial spirit spatiality assumes a political profile. The concept of space is given an essential interpretation that attempts to excavate the sense of spatiality that proceeds and enables the natural sciences. Space is philosophically grounded in an ontologically rather than a naturalistic sense. Place gives rise to the conception of space, whereas the mathematicalized geometric conception of space involves its homogenization. The ontological conception of place on which it is grounded is intelligible by virtue of those beings in place there relationally. And since the Jews, for one reason or another, are inflicted with uprootedness, they are constitutively unable to access this primordial sense of place that precedes the naturalistic mathematized notion of space. His 1933-44 seminar, 34 to 33 to 34 seminar on the essence and the concept of nature, history, and state spells this out for a specific knowledge of a people about the nature of its space. We first experience how nature is revealed to this people. For a Slavic people, the nature of our German space would definitely be revealed differently from the way it was revealed to us. To Semitic nomads, it will perhaps never be revealed at all. This way of being in embedded in a people cannot be taught. At most, it can be awakened from its slumber. On Heidegger's view, spatiality takes on different meanings in accordance with a people's specific modes of emplacement. This is why some people like Semitic nomads 
may never gain access to the specific sense of a place manifest by way of another people's sense of being. Rooted, since they themselves relate to place by virtue of being uprooted. Heidegger clearly seems to have inferred this worldlessness of Jewry. It's lacking a land and language of its own, determined that Jews, as the vanguard of globalizing Machenschaft, abstractly, calculatively, in capitalism, that displace beings from being. Hey, John, thanks for tuning in. God bless. Good to see you. The evil of being. There's little comfort in the thought that real Jewry is a placeholder in the Zeisenkite that others can fill with greater philosophical authority or greater historical efficiency, or that Jews are not the cause of the forgetting of being, but merely its most aggravated symptom. Anti-Semitism remains for Heidegger a proper ontological disposition, one intrinsic to the history of being, like a shadow accompanying in the measure of forgetting of being. Leitard was right to argue that Heidegger's anti-Semitism is more problematic on account of its applying not only to Jews, but to Jews. And this, he followed Levinas, who understood the same hatred of the other man, the same anti-Semitism. It is not incidental accretion that to Heidegger's account of the history of being, but its dark side for being shines only on the enrooted. In this respect, Heidegger's anti-Semitism gives us to think the history of being critically not only as critique of the forgetting of being by the modern rationalism and scientism, but the installing and framing of the evil of being itself. As the Israeli philosopher Adi Ofer has compellingly argued, for the most part, Heidegger accounts for the entire experience of ethics as an epithenomical effect of the epochs and epistemes of being as articulations of the enframing of being into particular formations of knowledge, norms, and praxis in which being manifest itself manifests its reserves of intelligibility if there is an ethics of being it is generally a matter of the attunement or proper relation to the truth of being be that under the exigency of authenticity of having a conscious or a releasement what this approach neglects however is the regimes of significant uh, signification the activity enabled being intelligible as such involving not only a concern for being, but also all, always also possibilities for being with others and being for others. The specific concerns for being with and being for others signifies not only the epiphenomenal register of values, principles, rights, duties, judgments, and even virtues. It is an irreducible condition on the making sense of being itself, one that can neither be exhausted by any determined regime or signification, nor reduced to a mere epiphenomenon of being. Heidegger's attempt to deny the difference between ethics Immorality turns a blind eye to the being's own way, putting itself in question by manifesting itself as evil. Evil is not merely the moral and framing of being. It is being's own excess manifest as superfluous excess that should never have come into being. Evil is the excess of being itself, the manifestation and production of superfluous suffering and the presenting of loss that escapes every historical and framing of morality. Evil is neither a lack nor, as Heidegger usually proposed, a more gestell as in framing of being in opposition to morality. Rather, evil is being's own excess, the excess of being that should not have taken place. Heidegger attempts to account for the sources of normativity of our beholdenness to a being as such or thus is purely ontological terms, authentication, attunement, uh, releasement, misses something essential in being itself for being manifest not merely as is, but as it is for us and others, essential to being itself is its manifestation as it ought to be, namely as evil, as the excess of suffering that should not have been. Beyond the question of intention or motive, cause and effect, evil is being in the mode of should not have been, the surging of superfluous suffering, unwanted loss, and gratuitous indignity. On the occasion Heidegger broaches this idea, which harks back to his reading of Schelling, the essence of evil is the rage of insurgency, which never entirely breaks out, and which, when it does break out, still disguises itself, and its hidden threatening is often as if it were not. An ontological account of evil is intimated here as the insurgency and the turmoil that we presage on all sides, where we encounter a dissolution that seems to be unstoppable and that can neither be abolished nor even mitigated by universal moral condemnation because it involves the devastation internal to being itself. Heidegger never developed the thought of evil as the forgetting of being 
om excess, and that which opens sense by virtue of the meaningless of what manifestly should not have been. The voice of spilled blood cries out from the ground. However, even when it disappears from their view, neither ethics nor ontology, its first philosophy, neither is primordial or fundamental for the appropriation and forgetting of the being with and being for others through which it opens to meaning. Meaning, being itself always already signifies as that which should not have been. Ethics is being its own excess. Heidegger's anti-Semitism thus marks a forgetting, a decisive and will for forgetting on the evil access of being manifested in history. The evil of being which Heidegger's philosophical anti-Semitism betrays thus gives rise to the task of thinking with and against Heidegger in order to attend to the devastating excesses by which being conceals aspects of itself. This task calls for us to stop rather than continue interpreting Heidegger's anti-Semitism so that the question of the self-transcendence of being as evil can be taken up on new ground. Only in this way can the evil of being be deteriorized rather than simply re-territorialized and its concealments of modes of being with and being for brought to light. A philosophical position that is precisely our position. From the outset, Heidegger was surrounded by a brilliant cadre of young secular Jewish thinkers, but it was Franz Rosenzweig who was the first to note the elective affinity between Heidegger's thought and Jewish theology in one of his last writings before his premature death in 1929, Rosenberg remarked that the irony of intellectual history in which Heidegger was emerging as the most passionate articulate exponent of a philosophical position that is precisely our position. Following Rosenzweig and other theologians built on the common ground between Heidegger's philosophy and a phenomenological account of Jewish existence. At point, Heidegger's emphasized better than anyone before him was that selfhood and therefore identity is a matter of a dynamic, social, historical, and pragmatic relation that can neither be formalized nor universalized, and that affords access to the experience of objectivity and indeed of intelligibility as such. Beneath the values of enlightenment, humanism, with its idea that people are equal by virtue of rationality or universal nature that transcends their worldly formations, Heidegger shows how our experience of the world and our capacity to understand ourselves is based on passive, opaque, but insurmountable conditions for numerous Jewish thinkers. Here, finally, was an ontology that made sense of being Jewish. In the course of his captivity as a French POW, Emmanuel Levinas began to adapt Heidegger's insight by wondering if one should think of ontological passivity starting from design or from Judaism. This enabled Levinas to distinguish the passivity of thrownness from that of creatureliness, election, and filiation. With Levinas, then the affinity between Heidegger's account of passivity as Gewerkfenheit and a Jewish passivity becomes a place of reckoning and distinction, but this adaption is based on a fundamental adoption of Heidegger's ontological prioritization of we over me, his anti-liberal, anti-individualistic account of the fundamental experience of being oneself. Alexander Altman, a pioneering Orthodox rabbi and phenomenologist who was to become one of the foremost American scholars of Jewish intellectual history, read Heidegger avidly in Berlin before being forced to flee in 1938. In an essay called What is Jewish Theology, published in 1933, Altman attempts to sketch the meaning structure of a Jewish theology that is to be fleshed out concretely. Like Levinas, Altman understood how Heidegger... Th transcendental account of the existence structure of being which comes before any psychology of anthropology and certainly before any biology made a comparable account of the conditions of Jewish theology possible, whereas Levinas concentrated on the passivity of the Jewish subject, created elected, Altman argues that two phenomena, revelation and peoplehood, provide the irreducible elements of every Jewish theology. This argument was pitched against the characterization of Jewish faith promoted by his contemporary Hans Joachim Schulz, who dismissed the law on the grounds that no individual Jew could find the law in his or her ominous relation to, to God, sympathetic to the project, inspired by the dialectical theology of Barth, of retrieving a theology of revelation from the clutches of historicism and legalism. Altman nevertheless faulted shops for being too individualistic and too hastily dismissing the law of his quest for unmediated access to revelation, the theological legitimacy of revealed law, he argues, derives not directly from scripture or from formal exegetical procedures 
or from a sacred intuition such as the church or from a purely local concerns of the community or synagogue. It is rather the fundamental element of peoplehood, the whole people that authorizes the law by being itself the site of divine revelation. The people as the immediate correlation linked to God are the subject of Jewish theology. Having ground religious authority in the revelatory life of the people, Altman explicitly invokes Heidegger's notion of heritage and destiny as decisive for understanding Jewish existence. For unlike liberal Jewish dialectic theology, they legitimate what is Jewishly particular in the spiritual situation of the Jews. Like Levinas, Altman does not simply adopt Heidegger's concept, but adapts them to his critique of liberal Jewish dialectic theology. For the Jew, heritage is revelation, Torah given to the people as a whole, and destiny is providence manifests historically in the life of the people. But the Heideggerian breakthrough remains decisive only through the specificities of Jewish heritage and destiny, one can deduce the tragic singularity of Jewish existence. But within a few months of Altman's Jewish deployment to the concepts of destiny and heritage from being in time, Heidegger himself marshaled in his view in support of Nazism, the destiny of the nations. In the midst of all other peoples, he proclaimed in the uh, Rectorash actualizes the historical spiritual mission of the German people as a people that knows itself in its state. Altman, a Jewish humanist, favor the prospect of the destiny of the Jewish people actualizing itself in a state at a time when Zionism was still marginal in most modern Orthodox circles. Altman lamented in a clear phenomenological tone how the condition of exile renders Jewish theology invisible and thereby prevents it from attaining its full reality in the world. Only the return to Zion could be adequate to the confirmation between tradition and modernity since it alone would allow for the organic reality of peoplehood in Palestine to unfold. Altman specifies three features of this organic reality, the Hebrew language, the biblical landscape, and the fluidity of Jewish life that cannot be mastered through dialectics, and calling for a relation between life and law that exceeds the reflective work of Talmudic and halakhic dialectics. Altman laid emphasis on the halakhic of collective decisions. This position argues against formalistic methods of educating Jewish law on the basis of exegetical principles and their procedural applications by expert rabbis in favor of granting jurisprudential priority to the collective historical existence of people as a collective that concretely animates and shapes the law. Recall that Heidegger's critique of the uprootedness of world Jewry was based on the idea of cosmopolitanism alienated the Jews from the decision regions of being, which by virtue of being's concrete emplacement are primordially related to its grounding of the truth of being attuned to the possibility of the alienation of the individual Jew from the Jew from the concrete grounding of Jewish existence. In its uh, Altman specifies that the ontological priority of peoplehood generates the very capacity that Heidegger found so utterly lacking in Judaism, namely access to the decision regions from whence the truth is being manifest. No doubt Altman's sense of the fragmentation of Jewish peoplehood in an emancipated age bolstered his sympathy for a state, a land, and a language of its own where the people might reach into the decision region of its existence as a whole. Moreover, as Altman notes, the ontological priority of the people as a re revelatory power that produces authority and decides on the law is also what makes revelation itself essentially an open system to which the open-endedness of the Talmud corresponds as is proper form and conception. Altman thus understands the hook of Talmudic life of the Jewish people in complete contrast to the pharisaic picture that German scholars, including Heidegger, imagine. Talmudic life is not a formalism from which rules are derived or others externally imposed, but reflects the open-ended way that the people as a whole live with God's word. Revelation precisely enabling the people to access its decision regions. Since revelation dwells amid them, their being together affords access to the revelatory ground of their existence, which from a sideways point of view seems to stand over and against them in an authority founded peoplehood that exercises an actualized decision function among Jews and not formalistic exegesis dogma mediating institutions like churches or synagogues or even individual experts. Such an external authorities are meaningfully only on the basis of a logically thinking and authority founding peoplehood the lucky atmosphere of the peoplehood produces the authority and it receives in return the decision over the authority to which it bows as belonging to its essence. At the very time that Heidegger was reflecting on the uprootedness of world Jewry from the decision regions of existence, Altman, inspired by Heidegger's concrete hermeneutical ontology, 
was arguing that by the virtue of being rooted together in a shared heritage and destiny, the Jews reach into the decision regions of their specific modes of existence where its non-universal theological truth manifests. But if Altman would have therefore rejected Heidegger's depiction of the Jews as uprooted from the decision reasons that manifest the specific truth of their being, he nevertheless agrees that the absence of a land and language renders this truth invisible. For this reason, Altman was very sympathetic to Zionism, which he saw as the means of rendering the revelatory life of the Jews visible or creating the reality in which ultimately language and spirit would coincide. In the end, then, despite a fundamentally different understanding of Jewish life, Altman agrees with Heidegger in the essentials. As a young Orthodox rabbi enrolled in the University of Berlin, Altman befriended another young rabbi, Joseph Soloveitchik, scanned to the extraordinary dynasty of virtuous or Lithuanian rabbis who would soon emigrate to the United States and become the Rav of modern Orthodoxy, spearheading its remarkable renaissance in the second half of the 20th century. Altman and Soloveitchik were intimate companions studying philosophy and discussing its relation to the traditional Judaism on an almost daily basis. Soloveitchik, consistent with the brisker method of Talmudic study developed by its forebears, regards the halakha as a system conducive to objectification and takes a critical stand against anti-rationalism interpretations of Jewish spirituality. In a footnote to Halakhic Man, his classic exposition of the role of Halakhic consciousness in shaping Jewish self-understanding, written in Hebrew in 1944, Salvation denounces the self-evident falsity of the entire romantic aspiration to escape from the domain of knowledge, the rebellion against the authority of the objective scientific cognition, which has found its expression in the phenomenological, existential, and anti-scientific school of Heidegger and his coterie from the and from the mist from which they rose in various forms and sanctification of vitality and intuition, which have brought complete chaos and human depravity to the world, and let the events of the present era be proof. Salvage's halakhic objecticism and his caution with respect to all things romantic did not, however, inhibit his existential theology desire for the manifest destiny of the Jewish people in history. Breaking from his esteemed family's theological antipathy to political Zionism, Salvage excited with the Mizraki movement, which accorded religious significance to the establishment of the state of Israel and became a leading influential advocate of religious Zionism. Less explicitly, but more conspicuously than Altman, Salvation's account of the religious significance of Zionism recalls Heidegger's discussion of the authentic co-historicizing of the people. In his address delivered on Israel's Independence Day, 1956, Salvation parsed the erotic language of the Songs of Songs in terms of the Jewish people's longing for its land and a state of its own, the salient distinction Salvation develops is that between a covenant of faith that binds the people and the covenant of destiny that unites the nation, whereas fate represented by the Holocaust and secular Zionism was foisted on the people of Israel, destiny is religious undertaking to appropriate the return to Zion by becoming a holy nation in its own land. This is patently analogous to Heidegger's distinction between the inauthentic histor historicality of the people determined by disparate events that befall them and the destiny of a people able to gather itself by appropriating its spiritual heritage in order to manifest new possibilities for existing historically. Though seemingly adverse to some of Heidegger's signature concepts with respect to Salvatic's understanding of religious Zionism as the spiritual historical destiny of the Jewish people, we find a clear Heideggerian tone. Such a tone can be readily amplified if one sounds out a wider range of characteristic features of Heidegger's thought that a phenomenologically phenomenology of Judaism would have to include. A much larger and com more complex project would be required to do this adequately. Here an intim intimation of the resonances will have to defice, Leo suffice. Leo Strauss, who studied with Heidegger in Germany, already identified the biblical elements in Heidegger's earlier thought as the source of Heidegger's dissatisfaction with the limitations of Western rationalism and admired how he deployed such biblical elements while rejecting dogmatic Christian accounts of the eternal troops and divine morality. There are indeed many biblical elements in Heidegger's thought, and not only in his earlier work, for example, Heidegger argued that time is not a homogenous sequence of nows or a moving image of eternity, but a concrete eruption of the future within the present that unsettles the past and thereby throws up unforeseeable possibility. Jewish Wolf calls this Heidegger's de-theologized de eschatology and eschatology without eschaton. It is now known Heidegger developed this account of temporality by way of the phenomenological interpretation of Pauline eschatology, the deformalization of time demanded by the turn towards 
the how of grasping reality that was first exposed in Paul's witnessing the first Christians dying together in their waiting together for the parousia. But as Heidegger noted, the basic direction of eschatology is already late Judaic, the Christian consciousness being a particular transformation thereof, which moreover was covered up in later Christianity. This karyological time became, in the course of the 1920s, the models of Heidegger's thinking of the concrete temporalization of being. <coughs> the Orbat. Nitsky notes that Heidegger's notion of being reveals itself in a language is one that Jewish philosophers would define as fundamentally Jewish. He suggests that modern Jewish thinkers such as Rosenweig, Buger, Hesher, Levinas, and Derrida developed philosophies of language that share distinctive features of Heidegger's position and at the same time distinguish these thinkers from the traditional philosophical account of language as a way of representing the world. For Heidegger, words are not instrumental signs that transparently designate things but are themselves things. Presences that reveal being, one beings, one begins to understand why Elliot Wolfson has made extensive use of Heidegger in his research into Kabbalistic language. Heidegger's subordination of the correspondence theory of truth to the unveiling of an event that reveals being in its concealment is complex and even obscure notion, but it's echoing of biblical and Kabbalistic notions, perhaps through this mediation of Schelling is clear enough, like Heidegger maintained, as does traditional Jewish thought that thinking is saturated with interpretation and therefore conceived philosophy as an endless series of commentaries that forget, restore, and unfold an original truth, as does the Jewish tradition of commentary. In his later work, he proposed that thinking is not foremost logic and representation, but thinking and memory, as Jewish prayer emphasized. Heidegger also described poetry's capacity to disclose the call of being in a way that clearly recalls prophetic testimony to the word of God, similar to the way that Rashi, one of the greatest and perhaps the most normative of Jewish exegetical authorities, describes prophecy as God speaking with God's self while the prophet listens. Mentions should also be made of the metaphysical interpretive of a new thinking that is neither Western nor Eastern, but something at once originally and yet still unthought. A similar effort to perpetually distinguish itself from the accident as much as from the Orient determines much of modern Jewish thought, which is likewise discharged as by returning to the revelation that remains to be revealed. This is not meant to suggest Jewish influence as much as to this call attention to a meaningful confluence between Heidegger's philosophy and some of the existence structures of Jewish thought, which as we have seen, Jewish theologians and scholars have noted in desultory ways. As Zerider has compellingly argued, at almost every point that Heidegger turns away from Western metaphysics and epistemology, he pivots to the Hebraic heritage, even as he himself never thought this through. Perhaps this makes it slightly less astonishing to find Strauss's appeal to biblical elements in Heidegger's earlier thought, extended by Emil Fackenheim, the most famous Jewish post-Holocaust philosopher who found the late, later Heidegger to be engaged in no less startling an enterprise than the Judaization of the entire history of Western philosophy. The numerous ways briefly enumerated above show how the vectors of Heidegger's thought can be traced to cardinal points in Jewish theology. The source of this inversion is the foremost biblical element of Heidegger's thought, the way being calls, addresses, and demands a response. John Caputo summarizes this point. The task of thought for Heidegger is to answer and respond to being's address, to hear the call and be responsive and responsible, to let being be, to let it come to the world's language. The language is not our own, but being's own sprach, even as history is not precisely human history, but being's own history, for being would be our own, even as we would be being's own people. This discourse is borrowed from the biblical tradition of salvation history, from the religions of the book, which are set in motion by the Shema, the sacred commander, call hero Israel, the Lord is thy God, is one, a command that defines the identity of a sacred people, one God, one people, one place. Heidegger uses the structure of this call and response to frame his reading of the text of Greek philosophers who have not the slightest idea of history or salvation. Following Zerider, Caputo notices the unthought depth in Heidegger's thinking that led to some of the most important modern Jewish thinkers, Rosenzweig, Levinas, Altman, Salvechik, uh, Weisskrugrot, Fackenheim, and others to find Jewish theology reflected 
in a clear, if distorted way, in the minor mirror of the text and concepts. The task today, however, is to trace the surface of Klein's bottle in other directions, tracking not only the Hebraic elements in Heidegger's thought, but the becoming Heideggerian of prominent strands of modern Jewish thought. The irony is, Kaputu notes, that when Heidegger performs his comprehensive refashioning of biblical salvation history in terms of the history of being, he seems to land back in the Holy Land, back on Hebrew soil, maybe somewhere on the West Bank, reproducing the dynamics of the Shema or calling and responding around which the Jewish history of salvation is structured. Okay, sure. God bless Orfeo and John. Heidegger Zionism. In the 1930s, while penning the black notebooks and bemoaning the effects of world Jewish metaphysical uprootedness, Heidegger lectured extensively on the Hamet or homeland of being. It is important to note how and why Heidegger distinguished his position from the National Socialist, for whom the homeland is the na native geographic place of the Aryan race, even as he sympathized with them in crucial respects. For Heidegger, the National Socialists are too antic or thinking in their conception of place. They mistake the homeland for the spatial region on the globe where the nation is located. But the homeland is not spatial location on the globe. It is a place where the nearness to being happens, just as National Socialist conception of race is too antic and essentializing in its biological determination of a people. So too does the misconceive the homeland as a spatial thing. For Heidegger's view, National Socialism has the right objects of criticisms in mind, namely liberal conceptions of a people and the sum of juxtaposed individuals and scientific conceptions of place and reducible to a geometric calculus. For in both cases, the concrete specific ways of being of the phenomenon are mistaken for homogenized abstraction. And yet he argues in both cases, National Socialism falls onto a pipe of ontological idolatry by mistaking the phenomenon of a people and place for particular entities, the Aryan race or the fatherland, rather than the ways of dwelling in the uncanny nearness of being itself. Heidegger was then both critical and supportive of National Socialism. He was critical of it because he regarded Nazi ideology as a type of ontological idolatry that confuses the with world of the folk and our being in place with antic things. And despite this ideological vulgarity, he was supportive of Nazism because he sympathized with its attempt to replace the abstractions of liberalism, humanism, and scientism with specific concrete historical phenomenon by virtue of which the intelligible ability of being itself is grounded. To extend the analogy of idolatry, it is if Heidegger thought Nazism amounted to worshiping the right God, a concrete experience of being in the wrong way, whereas liberals, humanists, cosmopolitans, and Bolsheviks, and above all, uprooted world Jewry have, to use Jeremiah's terminology, extend being for vain emptiness and its glory for futility. Their notion of place amounts to homogenous conception of space. Their notion of being together amounts to the sum of individuals regarded in their abstract universality. As such, they do not even concern themselves with being in its concrete ways of being. They have accordingly exchanged the fundamental attunements to in the releasements of being for futile calculation. If the Nazis were idolatrous in their antic way, in Heidegger's view, they were at least failing with respect to the truth of being. Hence his consistent depiction of himself as mistaking National Socialism for the possibility of a transition to another inception. As a philosophical critique of National Socialism, Heidegger argued that the homeland is a place where one can draw near to the unrepresentability of being but never obtain it. For Heidegger, the homeland is always a promised land in which one can dwell in the nearness to being it is not a land that can be acquired or occupied. It is for a similar reason that Rosenzweig rejected Zionism while Levinas was ambivalent about it. In 1961, following the launch of the first human into space, Levinas wrote a short essay called Heidegger, Garrigan and Us, published in Difficult Freedom, in which he reflected on the significance of humanity's breaking with its absolute attachment to Earth, whereas Heidegger saw the modern world as being devoured and disoriented by technology, a world where entities were torn from their context and subject to Machenschaft. In Levinas' view, Gagarin's hour in space exposed another human face to technology, namely the distinctly human capacity to feel free oneself from all attachment to place, the attachment to place in the very splitting of humanity into natives and strangers, and as such the source of all cruelty for this reason, Levinas continued technology is less dangerous than the spirits of place for it drives away with privileges of this enrootedness. Sarah 
Hammerschlag calls the Slovenist ethics of uprootedness, which goes some way towards explaining the slow and initially hostile reception of Levinas in Israel. Contra Heidegger and contra the theologies of Jewish and rudeness in the land, Levinas affirmed the Jewish genius of Jewish diasporism. Judaism has always been free with regard to place. He said the Bible knows only a holy land, a fabulous land that spews forth the unjust, a land in which one does not put down roots without certain conditions. Hence, Levinas' deep ambivalence with respect to Zionism, at times identifying with the ethically ethical destiny of the Jewish people, and at other times deeply suspicious of its territorialization of the spatial destiny, destiny and both for Heidegger-inspired reasons. But other no less influential strands of modern Jewish thought have taken the opposite route. In the course of their re-territorialization of the, in the Holy Land, they display further signs of becoming Heideggerian of major trends in Jewish thought. This has especially been the case since the mid-1970s, when a distinction emerged between religious Zionism and the theology of Zionism. The former, as we have saw in the case of Altman and Soloveitchik, emphasizes the religious significance of settling the land within a theological program that seeks to actualize the objective of halakhic reality as a whole, a task in which settling the land plays only a partial and inessential role. By contrast, the theologies of Zionism, as exemplified by the Gushimunim movement that arose in the mid-1970s and drew inspiration from the teachings of Rav Avram Isaac Cook, dwelling on the sacred land attains a status as elementary as that of revelation and peoplehood, becoming a constitutive part of the very existence structure of being Jewish and thus determinative of all other doctrines and values. For these theologies of Zionism, the uprootedness of diaspora Jewish life distorts the fundamental categories of Jewish existence, such as revelation and peoplehood, co-signing it to artificial institutions like the synagogue or community fostering reliance on top-down formal exegetical rulings and sustaining the illusions of individualism. Consider Rep. Svi Yisrael Tao, one of the leading proponents of the theology of Zionism, an influential interpreter of the works of Rabbi Isaac Cook and a disciple of his son, Reb Sri Yehuda Cook, his 11-volume work, For a Time's Faith, the Amunat de Tenu, embraces all the Jewish existentialia adduced too quickly in section four above while correcting the fundamental mistake of neglecting the theological significance of place in accounting for the historiality of Jewish theology. The primary relation of the view of Ratao and other Cookist theologians in the Gushimunim movement is between the people of Israel, the Torah of Israel, and the land of Israel. In Tao's word, only superficial understanding stemming from the spiritual intellectual laziness grabs the concept of the whole as a collection of many individuals juxtaposed together. But it's only when the people sanctify the land that their being whole enters into the nearness of being holy. Likewise, Tao adapts a similar view to Rosenzweig and Altman's accounts of the revelatory authority of the people as a whole, rather than the formalistic exegetical procedures for the external authorities the life of the holiness is one with the natural, vigorous, and holistic life. The manifestation of the name of the world is not revealed like a memo falling from the sky in which one finds instructions and commandments. The more Israel is a whole, the more holy. Just as for Altman and Rosenzweig here too, the Talmud is in no way abandoned, but Talmudic formalism gives way to the life of a people that's capable of reaching into the decision regions of Jewish existence. But for Tao, unlike Rosenzweig and Altman, this life can properly revealed and lived only in the land, the actualization of our life as a people, and the land is being holy in a strikingly Heideggerian tone. Tao suggests whereas the spirit of the nations of the world is of heaven, which means that the nations share the universality of spirit, the spirit of the Israel is on earth, and we sanctify the name of heaven on earth. As Heidegger might have put it, it is origin and destiny. This people is singular, correspondingly to the singularity of being itself, whose truth this people must ground but once in a unique site and unique movement. Like Heidegger, Tao thinks the specific contribution of the national spirit goes to meeting the homelessness of the modern age at large. In the letter on humanism, Heidegger proposes that the singular German spirit manifests its unique place and through its unique language does not have the purpose of conveying some German essence that would exemplify the concrete universality of humanity, but that form a destinal belongingness to other peoples, they might become world historical along with them. In other words, by becoming singularly historical in their being, the Germans 
through their poet's specific relation to their heritage, people, place, and destiny, will show other peoples the way back to being, back to the specificity of being, inceptive relationality by virtue of which is concretely meaningful, a homecoming to being, to the mystery of the nearness to an origin. What is most characteristic of the homeland, what is best in it consists solely in its being this nearness to the origin and nothing else besides this. This is why in this homeland, too, faithfulness in the origin is inborn. This is why anyone who has to is loath to leave the place of nearness, but now the homeland's being is a place of nearness and the most joyful is what most unique about it. What then is homecoming? Homecoming is the return to nearness of the origin. In much of the same way as Heidegger theologies of Zion view Jewish uprootedness as a symptomatic in Malays and the epoch of overcoming the way of restoring access to the place to use a traditional rabbinic name for God. The homecoming is not just a political expediency, but a matter of emplacement of being on the becoming historical place of the revelation, a call issued of the sacred language through its new inception, not a new Torah, heaven forbid, reptile insist, but existence renewed in our return to Zion and renew our days in the inception. A singular people, a singular call, a singular place, whereby dwelling in nearness to the origin is made possible. It is not surprising that both Heidegger and the Cookus at various times conflate this tight relation between people and place with that of the relationship between people and state. In a famous address just weeks before the fateful war of 1967, Rab Svi Yehuda Cook proclaimed the new inception of Israel as the state envisaged by the prophets. He and his followers would agree that a people and the state are not two realities that we might observe isolated, as it were, from one another. The state is the preeminent being of the people. Rosenzweig and Levinas expressed in a Jewish key some of the distinctive contributions that Heidegger brings to modern philosophy were rejecting the notion of the meaning of being must be grounded in the specificity of place. Altman and Salvatric were more sympathetic to the idea and both for Heidegger-inspired reasons, but thinkers like Tao and Cook, who did not read Heidegger, articulate by virtue of a capitalistic theology of history that is not foreign to Heidegger in account of the existence structure of being Jewish in which the elements of place becomes indispensable. Accordingly, if for Rosenweig and Levinas, the absolute unbound nature of Jewish existence, Marx's genius for Tao and Cook, as for Heidegger, it is symptomatic of the fundamental malaise of modernity. Needless to say, theologies of Zion are not conflated with Zionism as a historical ideological ideology and movement, but since they play an increasingly prominent role in contemporary affairs, perhaps only Heidegger could save the Jews from the danger of the new inception of Israel. Perhaps even in my era still have the power to provoke an age of overburning with correctness that of long black truth. But where the danger is, there grows saving powers. Could beings errancy come good? Writing the prophetic ass, the man Heidegger, Balaam Heidegger's comes to curse the people of Israel, standing at the mountain's edge that overlooks the, dever, the desert. He pauses to curse Israel's disparate tribes that he beholds communicating and struggling with one another, setting his face towards the wilderness bowl, and lifted his eyes and saw Israel dwelling tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he bore his figure and said, How good are you, your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings of Israel? Okay, so I hemorrhaged all my viewers. John still sticking out. God bless. Orfeo, have a great night. Appreciate you tuning in. So, yeah, I thought the article was pretty important. I read it all the way through. Um, so, I'm going to read more on this Jewish-German distinction. So, I'm not going to read this. Here's a academic paper kind of describing the background to this nature article so here in 1938 in nature um professor stark wrote an article in the philosophy of science and about german jewish differentials in the Nature of Science. This was published in Nature magazine in 1938. And Stark was a Nobel Prize winner for something in like radiology, the Stark effect. So this one's shorter. The Pragmatic and the Dogmatic Spirit in Physics. Professor Stark, president of uh, the Reichenstadt uh, in Berlin. Um, and Stark had lost his position and then became a Nazi 
and became one of the heads of German science with the rise of the Nazi party. He was one of the early supporters of the Nazi movement. And he was a big name as he was a Nobel Prize winner um, in physics. The aim of the physical science is the investigation and formulation of the laws which govern the property and processes observed with objects of imminent nature. These inherent laws are independent of human existence, action, and thought, and are the same all over the world. For this reason, the object of physical science is the intentional, the, uh, the international, but the manner in which physical Research is carried out and described depends on the spirit and the character of the men of science engaged upon it, and the spirit and the character differ individually as do men, nations, and races. When In what follows, I speak of two principal types of mentality in physics. My observations are founded on experience. I have inquired into the mental characteristics that have led to the great physicists of the past, to their discoveries, and in the course of 40 years of my scientific life, I observed very many more or less unsuccessful contemporary physicists and authors of theories and books and endeavor to discern the mainspring of their work. On the basis of the wide experience, I've come to recognize that there are two main types of mental attitude among workers in the fields of physics. The pragmatic spirit from which have sprung the creation of successful discoverers, both past and present, is directed towards reality. Its aim is to ascertain the laws governing already known phenomenon, to discover new phenomenon and bodies as yet unknown. Even before they tackle a particular problem, physicists in this school of thought have acquired a certain feeling of the reality of the phenomenon to be investigated by giving careful attention to all previously a certain facts connected with the problem. On the basis of the feeling, they form a conception as to what the body or process to be investigated may look, be like in reality. For them, however, such a conception is solely the means to the end of devising experimental arrangements for the empirical formulation of their question, true reality itself. If the observation made with their apparatus chosen does not conform, confirm the initial conception, as very frequently happens, they reject it and without hesitation and seek simulate stimulation from experience for a new conception for the purpose of a new experiment. Their final goal is always to establish reality, whether they gain new knowledge or are led to obscure and still unexplored features of the phenomenon investigated, the mathematically formulated theory, is to physicists of the pragmatic spirit not an end of itself, but solely a method for the purpose either of presenting the knowledge gained from experience in a qualitative manner and as briefly and simply as possible, or of deriving mathematically for special cases results which follow from general laws obtained from experiment. The physicists of the dogmatic school operate in a quite different manner in the field of physics. He starts out from ideas that have arisen primarily in his own brain and form arbitrary definitions of relations between symbols to which a general and so also a physical significance can be ascribed by logical and mathematical operations. He combines them and so derives results in the form of mathematical formulae. He then seeks to give these a physical meaning by applying them to the results of experience insofar as they are found to be in accord with experience. He underlies this agreement with the greatest emphasis and makes it appear as though the results of the experience have been established and gained scientific importance only by virtue of his theory. If there are any experimental results available that are not embraced by this theory and which stand in contradiction to it, he doubts their validity and considers them to be unimportant, that he is not designed to mention them. Dogmatic physicists further present things as though their theories and formula exhaustively covered the whole range of phenomena treated by them. They can see no further problems in this field and thought and inquiry are ice mind in their ice bound in the formula. The aim of the pragmatic spirit is reality, and his aim to this goal is the appropriate and careful observation. The goal of dogmatic spirit is the dogmatic formula, and his way is one of logical mathematical construction. For the pragmatic spirit, physical research is a process of ev evolution from what has been established to the new experimental knowledge. For him, there is no such thing as classical physics or modern physics. But only physics for the dogmatic spirit. Physics is a field for his logical formalistic activity towards a revolution against existing principles and towards the accomplishment of general acceptance of his theories or indeed of his new world picture. The pragmatic spirit advances continuously to new discoveries and new knowledge. The dogmatic spirit leads to crippling of experimental research and to the literature which is an as effusive 
as it is unfruitful and tedious, intrinsically akin to the theological dogmatism of the Middle Ages, which was opposed to the introduction of pragmatic natural sciences. The research of Venard and Rutherford present us with obvious recent examples of the manner in which these pragmatic spirit works in physics. By his experimental investigations on the cathode rays, Leonard paved the way for the greatest discovery of the last 50 years, that of the electron, and furthermore, in the photoelectric effect, he is revealed by careful measurements from the connection between the electron and light, from his intuitive sense of reality, by the convincing and measurements Rutherford derived our knowledge of radioactive transformation and chemical atoms and their nuclear structure, knowledge which could never have been derived by dogmatic methods, the relativistic theories of Einstein, which are based on the arbitrary definitions of space and time coordinates on their differentials, constitute an equally obvious example of the product of a domatic spirit. Another example of this kind is the wave mechanistic old theory of Schrodinger. By an amazing feat of physical mathematical acrobatics, he obtains as the final result First, a differential equation. He then asks what sort of physical significance this function that occurs in his equation may have. And for this, he makes a suggestion according to which the electron is arbitrarily smeared in a large spatial region round about the atom in characteristic fashion. However, the other dogmatic physicist, born Jordan Heisenberg Sommerfeld, give to the Schrodinger function another dogmatic significance contrary to the fundamental laws of experience. They make the electron dance around the atom in an irregular manner and allow it to act externally as though it were simultaneously present at every point around the atom with the charge corresponding to the statistical duration of its sojourn at each point. There's still another important difference between the pragmatist and the dogmatist in physics, which has to do more with the characteristics of these two types. The physicist of the pragmatic spirit does not conduct propaganda for the results of his research in order to gain authority and influence, he finds his satisfaction in obtaining new knowledge and trusts that it will receive recognition from the experts as a representation of reality and that it will serve as a step towards new advances. How different are the protagonists of the dogmatic spirit? They do not first wait for at least five years to see whether their revolutionary fashion theories may perhaps prove to be inadequate or erroneous when examined in the light of experience. On the contrary, almost before they have been published, a flood of propaganda for them is started by articles and journals and newspapers, by textbooks and lecture tours, if possible, right around the world. So far as I'm aware, Rutherford never undertook lecture tours to make known the results of his researchers or the NARD. I know that he detested speaking about his researches before wide public and that he only twice took part in the German Congress of Natural Science. On the other hand, other older physicists will probably still remember with what pertinency propaganda was carried out all over the world and before the widest public for Einstein theories of relativity. Matters have not been quite so bad with the newer dogmatic theories, which have been advertised under such terms as quantum theories, quantum mechanics, and so on. Nevertheless, for the purpose of propaganda on their behalf, innumerable lectures have been held throughout the world, and very many textbooks have been written about them. Insofar as the task of physics and the investigation of bodies and laws concerning the reality of nature, only the pragmatic attitude of men of science is qualified to solve them, and hence also alone entitled to do so. When the dogmatic spirit does not confide itself to theology and sociology, but also chooses physics as an arena for its intellectual gymnastics, one might tolerate this, but only under the condition that physical research of the pragmatic school of thought does not suffer in consequence. But for about three decades, this condition has not been satisfied, at any rate, not in Germany, where during this time the representatives of the dogmatic spirit have gained a dominating influence. By their collective actions and their connection to earlier ministries, they were able to acquire numerous chairs in physics and, above all, theoretical physics. In consequence of this, and because of the lively propaganda for modern dogmatic theories, academic youth was predominantly educated in the scientific ideal of the dogmatic spirit. Not men like Leonard and Rutherford, but Einstein is dogmatic imitators who are held up to them as models for scientific thought and work. I've taken the field against the dogmatic spirit in Germany because I've been able to observe repeatedly its crippling and damaging effect on the development of physical research in this country. In this conflict, I've also directed many efforts against damaging influence of Jews in German science because I regard them as the chief exponents of propagandists of the dogmatic spirit. This reference brings me to the national aspects of the mental outlook of men of science and research. It can be adduced from the history of physics that the founders of the research in physics 
and the great discoveries from Galileo and Newton to the physical pioneers of their own of our own time were almost exclusively Aryans, predominantly of the Nordic race. For this, we may conclude that the predisposition towards pragmatic thinking occurs most frequently in men of the Nordic race. If we examine the originators, representatives, and pro propagandists of modern dogmatic theories, we find amongst them preponderance of men of the Jewish descent. If we remember, in addition, that Jews played a decisive part in the foundation of theological dogmatism and that the authors of the propagandists of Marxian and com communistic dogmas are for the most part Jews, we must establish and recognize the fact that the natural inclination to dogmatic thought appears with a special frequency in people of Jewish origin. Establish these facts, of course, I do not maintain that there are no Aryan men of science who are not actively engaged in dogmatic spirit in the realm of science, nor do I maintain that Jews cannot produce valuable experimental work carried out in a pragmatic spirit. I wish solely to make a statement the frequency of occurrence of these natural tendencies to a pragmatic or dogmatic ways of thinking. It must also be taken into consideration that by training and practice, Aryans can become accustomed to the dogmatic and Jews to the pragmatic habits of thought. I acknowledge scientific achievements and new discoveries, irrespective of the nationality of the discoverer, and I combat the harmful influence of the dogmatic spirit in physics whenever I encounter it in my scientific work, and regardless of whether the culprit is a Jew or not. Moreover, I've been engaged in this fight not only since 1933, for as long ago as the year 1922, I denounced in the strongest term the formalism and dogmatism in German physics in one of my publications entitled The Present Crisis in German Physics. Okay. So, hemorrhage down. I only got one person watching, but uh, God bless. A lot of important research here. And let me pour myself a little more tea. Okay, so let's look at Herman Cohn and Kantianism. And we're seeing some of these recurring themes between this, similar to critiques on Hinduism and a mind independent truth reality of Frege, Kant, and Heidegger to a mind-dependent form of truth of Judaism, and we saw even the mind-dependence that could be Judaic-centric, as we saw last week in um, Judaism. So let's look at this article on Herman Cohn, who tries to combine his Judaism and Kant. Against the heteronomy of Halakha, Herman Cohn's implicit rejection of Kant's critique of Judaism by George Kohler. Moses did not make religion a part of virtue, but he saw and ordained the virtues to be part of religion. Herman Cohn, 1842 to 1918, was arguably the only Jewish philosopher of modernity whose standing within the general philosophical developments of the West equals his enormous impact on Jewish thought. Cohn founded the influential Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism, the leading trend in German um, Cathard and Philosophia in the second half of the 19th to the first decade of the 20th century, Marburg Neo-Kantianism cultivated an overtly ethical that is anti-Marxist and anti-materialistic socialism that for Cohn increasingly concurred with his philosophical reading of Messianistic Judaism. Cohn's Jewish philosophical theology, elaborated during the last decades of his life, culminated in his famous religion of reason out of the sources of Judaism, published posthumously in 1919. Here Cohn translated his neo-Kantian philosophical position back into classical Jew Jewish terms that he had extracted from Judaism with the help of the pro progressive line of thought running from Plato through Maimonides to Kant. In a nutshell, God for Cohn is the idea in a Kantian regular sense of the normative infinite realization of the good in the world. This realization is known in religion as the establishment by the means of the imitation of God or the messianic kingdom on, on God. 
is the intention of the present study to show that therefore halakha Judaism's religious law and Cone's thought became the specific positive historical Jewish instantiation as it were of Kant's categorical imperative. Cone's fundamental rejection rejected the approach to halakha developed by German Jewish reform theology throughout the 19th century and returned to an argument of Moses Mendelssohn for keeping the law if only in a more sophisticated and philosophically refined form. Mendelssohn argued in a private letter to Hertz Hamburg from 1783 that the ritual laws of Judaism served for the purpose of closing the ranks of the believing Jews because the mere articles of faith were simply not enough to, would not be enough to unite the true theist against the onslaught of all forms of idolatry. The reformers, although actually they too are in agreement with Mendelssohn's idea that it is the purpose of the law that they must justify its validity, nevertheless saw this purpose first and foremost as a romantic edification of the observant Jews that is in the spiritual uplifting of the definitive yardstick for answering the question which parts of the law should be abandoned in the light of modernity. Avram Geiger, the founding founder of the reform movement, wrote, for example, Judaism looks upon religious ceremonies as the means for strengthening our religio-ethical sentiments. These ceremonies serve as reminiscence of past events whereby we think of God's paternal and wise providence or humbled they serve also to strengthen our good intentions or to preserve or regain our spiritual purity. The establishment of historiography as an academic discipline and the critical scholarship made it impossible for modern historians like Geiger or Heinrich Graz to uphold the Halevian version of authorization of the Torah to reveal a witnessed historical act, but then again, the edification criterion for legal reforms essentially generated a new Spinozian dichotomy of religion and politics. For Cohn, the spiritual approach led the reform movement into the trap of interpreting large parts of traditional law only in terms of the national political needs of the Jewish people, which are no longer required after emancipation. While for the reformers, fitting in with the zeitgeist was the norm by which traditional Jewish law was to be judged, Cohn suspects this method of eudaimonism, the inconvenient cultural isolation of the observant Jew, is still necessary for Cohen as long as no universal religion of reason has emerged. This isolation, however, is not inherent in the law itself. <coughs> as Mendelssohn assumed, for the law's sole purpose is the preservation of the idea of the one God. For Cohen, the distinct nation known as Israel was only necessary as a precondition for the formulation of the Jewish religion, and this is the only meaning of the concept of the chosen people. Therefore, the reform movement was wrong to see the commandments as exclusively motivated on a national level, a preconception which led them to the project of combating the laws of the source of a national isolation in opposition to reform, especially during the last decades of his life, Cohn was increasingly inclined to appreciate the importance of the protective screen of fixed ritual, a shield that was felt by him necessary for the survival of a community. As long as pure Jewish monotheism is not devaluated, replaced, or replicable by other forms of monotheism, its continuity is necessarily bound to the isolation of the Jews, not as an independent nation, but as a nationality within a nation. The real purpose of the law for Cohn is to guarantee the continuity of Judaism as the carrier of pure monotheism and is therefore to be found only in an abstract philosophical level. But even if we see the purpose of law is generating a sufficient amount of cultural isolation in the Jewish community from the preservation of the strict monotheistic idea until the Messianic age, Halakha's law must necessarily satisfy another, also another probably more difficult criterion for the Kantian philosopher. It must be observed by the free decision of the autonomous human will. It is not enough simply to reject supernatural revelation at Mount Sinai. For Kant and also for Hermann Cohn, only the free autonomous will is the source of truly ethical action. The a priori ethical laws arise from the self-legislation of human reason, not from any source of influence outside it. What makes matters even more Complicated here is that Kant excluded Judaism explicitly from his understanding of religion as grounded in ethics, and this is the very accusation of heteronomy. There are three reasons for Kant that Judaism was not a religion of, in an ethical sense. Its laws deal only with external action and lay no claim at all on a moral disposition. Um, Mosaicism has no belief in life after death without which no religion can be conceived. 
and Judaism is not missionary but rather exclusive. It is no claim to universal truth of its belief. Judaism for Kant is thus a collection of merely statuary laws supporting a political state. This often quoted phrase is usually misunderstood ever to be a political critique of Judaism focused on its purported legalism, since for Kant, as his argument has it, enlightened Christianity of his own time was closest to religion of reason, and Christianity generally reads the Apostle Paul to criticizing the central Jewish belief in a correlational legal covenant with God, and instead favors allowing only for divine grace. Kant necessarily rejects Judaism as an expressive and immoral and obsolete antique system of dry legal legislation, Frequently, Kant's rejection is even interpreted as open anti-Semitism, or at least as a self-serving, since Kant himself was not at all neutral in his argument against Judaism. He wanted to convert German Christians to his own religious philosophy with an idealized Christianity at his focus. Therefore, he preferred a derogatory view of Judaism fitting his goals. In truth, however, Kant is far from supporting classical Christian supersessionism. For Kant, Christianity arose suddenly but not unprepared from Judaism, and while Christianity's Jewish founder indeed tried to replace their silver faith to the Jews of his time with a moral faith, his effort ended with his undeserved death. After this historical event, thus all, also all actual reason to imitate Christ was obsolete for Kant. In his influential book on the philosophy of religion, we rather find several long passages of scolding the 1700 years of church history ever since, a history which weighed down the people with heavy chain of blind superstition. The real problem of Kant's view of Judaism for the believing Jewish Kantian is therefore not accusations, but first and foremost, that is the very contradiction between legal compulsion of the believer by divine law and the free virtue, the discrepancy between the purported heteronomy in following the divine revelation and the authorizing power of halakha and the autonomous rational will of the individual as the one and only source of moral action. this The will is rational, according to Kant, when it operates by responding to what it finds to be a prior moral reasons, not according to outside influence. Herman Kong committed to, as he saw, to Kantian ethical thought in much more than a general sense, was not ready to understand Kant as an anti-Semite, and that for good reasons, as we will see, Kong held that Kantian ethics directly continued a certain central line of Talmudic legal, legal thought. Kohn therefore chose a different way to confront Kant's critique of the Jewish religion. He declared to the extent that Kant critiqued it, he was simply ignorant of Judaism. Group Smosen and Moses Mendelssohn, his two teachers in the theology of Jewish religion, were both particularly unsuited for the task, according to Kohn. Spinoza's Tractatus, Theologia Politicus, attempts to establish the independence of philosophy from politics and positive religion. Hence, it understands Mosaic law as the civil law of the Jewish state of antiquity. The alleged theonomy of the secular state law was intended in Spinoza's view as a mere pretext to educate the people to be obedient and to live in peace with each other. At the same time, however, to lie about theonomy creates a wrong concept of God, and therefore for Spinoza, the root of all future evil that grew out of this first fraudulent interrelationship of state and church. Mendelssohn supported this theory from a different direction. He not only advocated strongly the separation of church and state, even at its price of reform of Judaism, depriving the community of all political means of punishment. He went as far to separate ritual Jewish law completely from the rational universal law, which although it is also contained in the Pentateuch, is transparent and binding for all of humanity and needs no revelation. Jewish ceremonial law, however, contrary to Spinoza's view, is indeed historically revealed for Mendelssohn, but valid exclusively as the legacy for the congregation of Jacob, Thus, Mendelssohn is depriving Judaism of all its positive doctrines of belief and turns the law into the mere historical truth, independent of pure reason, therefore also disconnected from a priori rational ethics. Both views have left clearly detectable traces in Kant's understanding of Judaism, but those influences still do not explain Judaism's heteronomy problem for Kohn. To solve this, Kohn needs to argue against Kant on Kant's own terms that he needs to begin from the premises of Kant's philosophy of ethics, while others have shown convincingly how much Kohn's theory of autonomy in Judaism thought is indebted to Kantian philosophy. The purpose of this present article is to explore the essential points where Kohn advanced over Kant. Kohn suggests, as Lear Botnitsky wrote, that Kant should have recognized on his own terms that far from being antithetical to ethics, law is the basis of it. So the question arises, what is the relationship between moral law of reason to a law 
the religious law of Judaism in terms of the autonomy of the will? Is there a parallel in justifying the observance of both laws that could guarantee the ethical nature of Judaism? And finally, what caused Kant to ignore this parallel that Cohen attempts to construct out of the sources of Judaism? In the first step, Cohen established that halakha is law in the first place. He strictly differentiated between a commandment, a personal directive of God, and the notion of Torah as law that is in the teaching. It is most remarkable development from all the polytheisms to mosaic monotheism that the one God would no longer give individual instructions to a single human. Cohen explained, but a coherent set of commandments that are valid law of a collective for a collective eventually for all of humanity. These commandments is isolated order. Torah seeks to become the constitution of the moral world for the beginning. Thus, the philosophical implications of the Jewish idea of legal monotheism became the key concept for Cohen in his argument against Kant's critique of the heteronomous Judaism. In the second step, Torah must be analyzed within the autonomy, heteronomy paradigm of Kant's own ethical theory. As we know, Kant introduced the idea of autonomous will in order to bring to light the first principle of all morality. No wonder all previous efforts in that way have and must have failed, he wrote, because although most philosophers agree that man is bound to law by duty, it did not occur to one that man was subject only to his own and yet universal legislation, and that he was obliged only to act in accord with his own will, which, however, in accordance with its natural end, is a universally legislative will. As long as the law did not arise from the human being's own will, it must have brought with it some interest for us to observe in it either a stimulus or a coercion. By this way, Kant argued it was never the sense of duty that motivated the keeping of the law, but always simple necessity according to this interest, even if it was not my own but someone else's. The will motivated by interest in the, is then called heteronomous. The autonomous will, however, determined in its own but yet universal law. In other words, what distinguishes heteronomy from the autonomy of the will for Kant was the influence of the senses of human desires, instincts, urges, pleasures, but also the influence of detestation and aversion. Only by excluding these influences, the human will is free, rational, and ethically lawful. The autonomous ought of this will makes the moral imperative to a categorical one. Translated onto religious landscape, this moral demands excludes the millennial old theological idea of reward and punishment as motive for keeping religious law, fear of God in a simple biblical sense, or the hope of divine rec rec recompense would turn the observant Jew into a morally inferior human, according to Kant, but much to his satisfaction, Cohn could point here to the striking number of ancient and medieval Jewish sources that straightforwardly reject the heteronomous notion of reward and punishment and proclaim that the divine law must be kept for its own sake. Torah lishma, as the Hebrew expression of the Talmudic sages put it for Cohn, ideally there is no reason to say that Judaism would prefer the keeping of the law for fear or hope for earthly or even heavenly reward. The locus classica for this apparent Kantian ethical thought in the rabbinic source is, is the mission of those where Antigius of Sokio is quoted saying, do not be like the servants who serve the master in the expectation of receiving reward, but be like the servants who serve the master without the expectation of receiving reward and let the fear of heaven be upon you. <coughs> A text into which Goodman recently commented, even kind of excludes heteronomy no more vividly. For Cohn, furthermore, the text is not an isolated saying rabbinic sources, but its best ethical expression. Cohn immediately referred to yet another striking example of the Talmudic notion that his view anticipated Kant's moral thought in a footnote to the critique of practical reason. Kant writes thus, it is a very beautiful thing to do good to men from love to them and from a sympathetic goodwill or to be just from love of order. But this is not yet true moral maxim of our conduct, which is suitable to our position among rational beings as men. When we pretend with fanciful pride to set ourselves above the thought of duty like volunteers and as if <coughs> we were independent of the commandment we want to do of our own good pleasure what we think we need no commandment to do. The rejection of ethical volunteerism as identified by Cohn with the Talmudic rule that those who are greater who keep the law because they are obliged to than those who volunteer to keep it. It is if Kant has learned this notion from a Jewish philosopher or from the Talmud itself. Cohn once explained in connection with this passage, later Cohn further comments on this Talmudic saying concerning the autonomy of the laws of Judaism. Apparently, because of its instruction, the act loses its autonomy 
and its origin is put in God's commandment, but this also eliminates from the act any egoistic motive. Every thought of success, not to mention reward, is far removed from its origin. The commandment comes from God. He is the unique good. His commandments is therefore the com commandment of goodness. With regard to the good, what meaning could a reward have? What is left unsaid, however, is how much Kant, Cohen, and Judaism stand at this point in contradiction to traditional Christian ethics that build rather on volunteerism as the superior moral attitude compared to the compulsion of law. In general, though, Kant tends to uphold the voluntaristic anti-compulsion view when it comes to the yardstick of morality of all legal obedience, especially religious laws. Stephen Schwarzschild remarked it. It is interesting to watch the Jew Cohen put his finger on Kant's Protestant Pauline abhorrence to the law. E. Cohen points out that all law, positive as well as ethical, has for its purposes the compelling of the will, and the compulsion is therefore not sufficient reason for regarding law as heteronomous. Therefore, for Cohen, the most convincing example of all Kantian thought in rabbinic sources is a short line in Avos attributed to Ben Azai, Cohn translated into the German in a Kantian fashion, the reward of duty is duty. Uh, mitzvah, mitzvah, schar mitzvah, mitzvah, the reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. The word mitzvah, Cohen explains, has a double meaning. It means law from the side of God, but it also means duty for a man who accepts it by his own free will is the yoke of the law. There's no contradiction between the two sides. For Cohn, there can be no other reward than the infinite unceasing task of morality itself. Any other reward would turn morality into heteronomy and therefore injure its purity. Whether or not these or similar examples are actually close to Kantian ethics, there are probably even more numerous rabbinic and medieval Jewish sources which propound very clearly a system of reward and punishment as the motivation for the observance of a walker. But Cohen is a neo-Kantian philosopher, is not committed to an historical, that is, empirical totality of the literal tradition of Judaism. Here, exactly like his off-criticized reading of Maimonides' philosophy, Cohen applies the neo-Kantian method of a regulative idealization to Judaism's textual history. Cohen was interested in precisely these aspects of actual historical Jewish thought that supported or even confirmed his own view of Judaism as rational, ethical monotheism, and therefore those same Jewish concepts are not so much historically true as rather universally valid in the a priori philosophical sense, contradictory or rational aspects as much as they belong to empirical Jewish history of thought can and should be philosophically neglected. Having thus established halakha as the law that must be kept, not for the reward, but of its own sake, even according to Jewish tradition itself, exactly in the same methodological sense as moral law must be kept for its own sake, according to Kant, Cohen now proceeds to discuss the problem of a divine lawgiver himself. Would not the transcendent deity of the Jewish belief constitute a source of law that is clearly outside of the autonomous human will? Therefore, in order to salvage divine authorship of Jewish law, as a last step, Cohen needs to solve the heteronomy problem by discussing the concept of God himself that stands between his refutation of Kant's rejection of Judaism as an ethical religion. Which God for Cohen is the God of Judaism, the biblical personal God, or Kant's postulated God of practical reason in the rejection of Judaism, even Kant seems to be committing a cardinal error of Protestant theology that Cohen attacks at many places in his writing, but without ever mentioning Kant personally to turn the God of the Old Testament to the national God of the Jews. This short-sighted triumph over Judaism, in fact, stupidly applied to the acts of monotheism itself. Cohen wrote, for if the God of the prophets is no longer also the God of the Christian world, monotheistic faith is losing its source and origin. Kant's alternative, a God postulated out of rational necessity of his ethics, however, Cohen had rejected from an earlier on as a return to eudaimonism, eudaimonism because Kant's God became thus a distributor of happiness. In fact, Cohen eventually rejected all three of the Kantian postulates' freedom because it is not a postulate but rather a basic law of ethics and the idea of immortality that Kant positioned against Judaism as a precondition for an ethical religion, as we saw above, because for Cohen, immortality was the very opposite of pre-religious myth that must be strictly separated from the pure monotheism of Judaism. The Jewish concept that comes closest to Kant's own concept of God is the Maimonidean God without attributes, who is almost an idea in the view of Cohn. In Cohn's reading, God's ways from Exodus 33.13 for Maimonides, identical with the attributes of action, that is the only attributes of God we can understand are essentially 
of ethical character. These attributes define God solely as a moral being, as the essence of morality. God is merciful, gracious, long suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Uh, Erica Pienberg of Chesed Viemets. The way of God described his dealings with man. Cohn writes in 1900, there are therefore the norms of morality in his epistemological advance over Maimonides. Cohn held that God is indeed a transcendental idea. But while traditional religionists and realists usually say that according to Cohn's view of God was only an idea, Cohn, as an idealist, insisted that God, insisted that God, that his God was even an idea because an idea for Cohn and Kant is more real than experientially reality from 1877 on. Cohn reintegrated this concept of God into a systematic neo-Kantian philosophy as the idea of truth, the logical legal truth of the necessary connection of knowledge of nature and the knowledge of morality. More specifically, God means for Cohn, the accordance that is the systematic unity of theoretical causality and ethical theology. If we say God in Cohn's language, we assume that the heuristic theology of natural sciences accords with the theology of ethical action. On this very share, the share of the religion ha has in human reason is based in terms of religion. Cohn wrote, if there is to be truth in the belief of God, God must be integrated into the science of ethics, only thus built on the rationality of science. Belief can be freed from clinging to tradition and all external authority and be truly autonomous. It is only based on the conception of God that Cohn is able to develop his understanding of an autonomous compliance with the law. Pure ethics in its application to man cannot do without the concept of duty. Ethics must transform the moral law into duty. The analogous change is completed in the religion by transforming moral law into law that is commanded by God. The commanding concept of the divine command then is nothing but the religious expression of the principle of autonomy of the will. The difference is one of method, not one of essence. For Stephen Kepnes, the equation is not even Cohn's innovation, <coughs> but follows a Jewish model in which morality is determined by divine commandments and halakha. Halakha mediates all moral relationships. Jewish law in this model is not Kant's heteronymous law that renders the self passive and obedient and destroys moral autonomy. Rather, Jewish law is both part of and a support and guide of the autonomous self. We have arrived here at what appears in Plato as the dilemma of Yithripo is what is morally good commanded by God because it is morally good, or is it morally good because it is commanded by God? <coughs> Kant has clearly resolved the dilemma in Yithripo's favor. So far as practical reason has the right to lead us, we will not hold actions to be obligatory because they are God's commands, but will rather regard them as divide commandments because we are internally obliged to them. For Kant's God stands somewhat outside of ethics. In fact, the notion of a moral ruler of the world eventually grows out of a rational necessity to reconcile the irreconcilable for Kant, the apro university of the moral law, with the need to find law within the individual's autonomous reason. Truly ethical society cannot be a democracy for Kant. It needs an autonomous will as lawgiver of absolute authority, Otherwise, the law was merely politically legitimate, not truly moral law. And here is the crucial point. Neither can this moral law be thought of as proceeding originally from the wills of this lawgiver, Kant argues, because the duty to commensurate to them would not be free virtue, but extensively enforceable legal duty. Logically for Kant, there is only one way out of this dilemma. The supreme lawgiver of the ideal ethical community must be one with respect to whom all true duties, hence all, also all ethical duties, must at the same time be thought of as his commandments. This is the concept of God as the moral ruler of the world. Therefore, for Kant, morality leads to inevitability to religion and not vice versa. And we are logically forced to conjecture the ruling of God as we want to be more moral human beings. For Cohn, Euthypro's dilemma is less simple. He denied the contradiction between what Kant called internally obligated and what he constructed as the philosophy, philosophical idea of God, now no longer a postulate, but an integral part of Cohen's neo-Kantian ethics. In addition, defending Judaism, Cohen wants to refer to the God of religion not exclusively as a necessary outcome 
of human ethical thought as in Kant, the God of religion is the God Cone read out of Jewish sources. For him, critical idealized reading of rabbinic texts is able to produce something very close to his own concept of God, he assumed. Thus, in a historical but also in a theoretical way, God stands for Cone as the beginning of philosophical ethics, not as its end. In the words of Rockover, while well, Kant maintains that the moral self must postulate God, knowledge of God for the sake of the rationality of our action, Kant understands God as the very precondition of our morality. For Kant, God is a synthetical propositional a priori because God exceeds the concept of duty that morality contains. In other words, if there was a God at all, this God was will then command the moral law that is be synthetically added to the concept of morality as the notion of duty. Cohn's God idea, however, can in a certain way be thought of as analytic. God is the guarantor of the success of the moral law and thus not in addition to it, but the condition of its realization. That is because the one God represents the unique, that is non relativistic truth of rational a priori ethics. Probably here Kant and Cohn are furthest away from each other and it is again the abstract philosophical consequence of pure monotheism that divide them so decisively. Kant recommends to the Jews that they should rather have faith in many mighty invisible gods if they could only think of them as united despite their departmental differences in deeming worthy of their appreciation only the human beings who adhere to virtues with all their heart. Contrary to having faith in one God, whoever makes of mechanical cult the main work, Cohn ironically finds even in the traditional exegesis of the foundational verse of Jewish monotheism, the Shema Yisrael, textual proofs that the love of God with all your heart essentially refutes Kant's accusation of the mechanical service of God, again without mentioning Kant, but more importantly, Cohn believes for logical reasons that only monotheism can lead to virtuous action, and what is still more in his view, only monotheism can lead historically to one messianic humanity of the future. Simply put, Kant's moral laws are human duty as if they were divine commandments. Kant's moral laws are divine commandments. As we saw above, Cohn would not adopt the Kantian distinction between morality and legality based on the heteronomous nature of compulsion. In Kant's view for Cohn, autonomous acts are compelled to, not by external forces, however, but the power of human reason. Concerning the divine source of Allah, Cohn's view would consequently mean that there is no heteronomy involved if divine Jewish law is followed not for a word and if divine here means transcendent idea of the infinite realization of the good in the world ideally halakha is but a religious instantiation of the autonomous moral law as Cohn repeatedly claims if ethics demands that the will fulfill the moral laws of the law of the moral reason then it can only be a methodological distinction when the religion of reason teaches one to think of the will of reason as a commandment of God Daniel Weiss has shown what exactly constitutes the mere methodological distinction. Cohn mentioned here and at several other places, but for the purpose of the present study, it suffices to note that the distinction is no longer essential for Cohn, that it does not prevent Jewish law from ideally being morally true. True, Cohn can identify divine command with autonomous moral will, essentially because for him, God is an idea of practical human reason, but it must also be emphasized for the neo-Kantian idealist ontological status that is the reality of ideals at a much higher level, more real than the actuality of material objects of empirical reality, Cohn's idealization of the monotheistic God of the Jewish sources rather turns God into the only, the unique being, while everything else is appearance, thus crucially going beyond and even and not even dismantling Kantian theology. In addition, it is true that Cohn's halakha is an idealized version of Jewish law and not identical with all traditionally observed regulations, let alone in their orthodox interpretation, but not only is Cohn well aware of this, his purpose is rather to demonstrate in general that observing halakha would not necessarily violate the autonomy of the human will and would thus not distinguish Jewish law from moral law. Once this is achieved, Cohn also enters into a long discussion of traditional Jewish rituals, their meaning, and especially their contribution to the moral law of God. Concerning ritual regulations, Cohn falls back on a common explanation in Jewish theology, from Sadia through Maimonides to Mendelssohn, all laws that cannot be directly be identified with a moral end follow pedagogical purposes to educate the keeper of the legal regulation to eventually observe pure moral law itself. This distinction, however, would not harm the unity of halakha for Kohn, for what is not moral law in itself is a means to the promotion and education in the moral law, 
this education, however, Cohn knows well, in reality might take wide detours in the course that often may appear roundabout. It is not even clear that the existing halakhic regulations can be squeezed in this model, notwithstanding his unequivocal call not to abandon halakha in order to facilitate social and cultural contact of the modern Jew of his surroundings. Cohn's is still pronouncedly critical of practical halakha's attempt to penetrate with the minuteness of miniature paintings the whole life with it, all its obligations, dominating actions that seem most insignificant as well as most intimate. Humans have also the cultural concerns that exclusively moral or religious ones, and while moral law must be the supreme guide over all human activities, both halakha and moral law must still necessarily be the immediate guide of all our activities. Kahn's writes, let alone the unique and sufficient one, in the traditional Jewish approach of granting absolute power over Jewish life to Halakha, there lies a real danger for Cohn because the one-sidedness of ethical orientation ignores human interest in natural science and exudes aesthetic needs and sometimes even theoretical thinking. But eventually, excluding nonsensical or mystical customs and enduring Jewish law's usurpatory aspirations, it is the indivisibility of all halakha that is decisive for Cohn's identification with the autonomous moral will with the rational acceptance of divine law. While Cohn's referring to the educational purpose of the many ritual regulations of halakha is nothing new in Jewish thought. His insistence on the inextricable interwovenness of ritual and moral mitzvah is an original defense of halakha both against Jewish reform and against Christian or even the Kantian critique of Jewish legalism. At the beginning of his chapter on the law and the religion of reason, Cohn introduced an extensive discussion of the practical and deed inseparable entanglement of several hygienic, dietary, clerical, political, or cult dominated mitzvah with moral laws such as the laws of charity or workers rights given the dialectical and penetration in Cohn's view it would ultimately damage also the moral law if one were to fight religious rituals of Judaism the distinguishing criterion for Cohn is only the rational autonomy of the observant Jew in keeping whatever mitzvah ritual or moral Cohn's Judaism has room for the affirmation of true religious rituals because ethically Cohn can demand the adoration or of the idea of God in addition to moral action. As he once wrote to a student, the radical reform rabbi Ben C. and Kellerman in a critical reply to Kellerman's rejection of all ritual law. In summary, as much as Christianity is in no way identical with the religion of reason of for Kant, neither is traditional historical Judaism per se a religion of reason for Cohn. But contrary to Kant, who reduces the morality of Christianity to some moral teaching of its founder, Cohn claims a consistent thread of ethical doctrine running through the millennia of Jewish literary history, this thread being begins logically at the idea of strict monotheism, while Kant seems to have no concept of the rational consequences of strict monotheism, and Cohn, his reintroduction of the God idea into modern philosophical thought, justified the eventual identification of divine command with the autonomous will, thus turning the observance of a law ideally into a moral act. For Cohn, Judaism as a religion simply denies that there is a contradiction between its God and rational ethics, for the monotheistic Jewish God is the guarantor of the realization of moral law. Thus, to be obedient to this God is not forcing heteronomous principles upon human reason. Obedience to law does not pose an ethical problem for Cohn, even on Kant's own terms. In the words of Stephen Schwartzstiles, theonomy is not only incompatible with, but is positively conduct conducive to Kantian autonomy properly understood, if that is the God who is regarded as issuing imperatives is understood as the God of truth, God of philosophical reason. The Jew Kohn has thus salvaged his fundamental commitment to a lock of the law for his ethics and rational autonomy. Interesting, however, this ethical commitment to a lock comes at the price of severe philosophical theological criticism of Kohn's teacher, Immanuel Kant. While being careful to nowhere attack Kant directly, Kohn implicitly refutes all of Kant's criticisms of the Jewish religion, not only had Kant described Judaism as a mere set of statutory laws that must be followed mechanically, because as a good Protestant, he struggled to see legal compulsion as ethically more valid than virtuous volunteerism. Consequently, upon this Kant's own religious philosophy, especially his postulated God, falls short of the possibility of solving the problem of heteronomy the way Cohn solved it. The decisive contradictory Cohn emphasized is not the one found between statutory law and religious belief, as Kant claimed in his critique of Judaism, because for Cohn's even belief can be statuary as the law with its works, Kant's two prerequisites for ethical action, that man was subject only to his own 
and yet universal legislation will best be met for Cohn by a religious person taking upon himself the yoke of God's law. Again, the other article I shared at the beginning <coughs> on Herman Cohn is ethical monotheism. Um, talked about Noahidism and the Noahide laws. <coughs> Although Cohn had more of an allegiance to the halacha, you could see the precursors of like Felix Adler's ethical cultural society in uh, Cohn's neo-Kantianism also. Okay. So I had two more articles on Gottingen, the history of mathematics. So let's look at the shorter one on mathematics and Gottingen under the Nazis by Saunders McLean. The Mathematics Institutes of Gottingen 1931 had an outstanding tradition. Gauss, Riemann, Dierschlitt, Felix Klein, Minkowski, and Hilbert. It was located in the new and ample building thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation, which had also provided such buildings for mathematics in Paris. The library was ample, included famous thesis filling a trunk and giving an explicit construction by ruler and compass. The faculty was small, but superb with a large representation of young people. Before my time, many American mathematicians have studied in Gottingen. Here I will summarize my own experience there, quoting at some length from a few letters which I wrote at the time in 1933, since they record my reactions on the spot in 1931 after graduating from Yale and spending a vaguely disappointing year of graduate study in Chicago. I was searching for a really first-class mathematical department, which would also include mathematical logic. I found both in Gottingen. Hilbert had retired from his professorship, but still lectured once a week on the introduction to philosophy on the basis of modern science. His successor, Herman Weil, lectured widely on the differential geometry, algebraic topology, and on the philosophy of mathematics. From his seminar on group representation, I learned much, but I also failed to listen to his urging that algebraicists should study the structure of Lie algebras. I also was not convinced by his assertion that set theory involved too much sand, and Edmund Landau lectured to a large audience with his accustomed polished clarity, and with assistance to wash off used blackboards, Richard Current, administrative head of the institute, lectured and managed the many assistants working on the manuscript of the current Hilbert book. Gustav Herglotz delivered eloquently his insightful lectures on a wide variety of topics, Lee groups, mechanics, geometric optics functions with a positive real part. Felix Bernstein taught statistics but left in December 1932 before the deluge struck. These were the then the Ordenlich professors of Gottingen. The Osterdelentic professor in included Paul Bernays, Paul Hertz, Emily Noth, em, Emmy Noether. Hertz lectured on causality and physics. Paul Bernays worked with Hilbert in logic and the preparation of the perspective of Hilbert Bernays book. He also taught the famous Felix Klein course, Elementary Mathematics from the Higher Standpoint. Emily Noether taught enthusiastic but obscure courses on her current research interests on group representation on algebra. Her inspired students include Ernest Witt and Oswald Teichmuller. There are many young private Dostin and assistant, including Hans Louis, from whom I learned about PDE, Otto Nurburg, History of Mathematics, and Arnold Schmidt, Logic, as well as Herbert Busemann, Werner Frankel, Franz Reilich, and Wilhelm Magnus. Often we went to find restaurants at the nearby railroad station <coughs> for good food and discussion. There were many eager students, including Gerhard Gensen, Fritz John, Peter Zak, Olga Tolsky, and Ernst Witt. The social life included one time dancing party, at Professor Wiles' apartment. If on a Sunday you called at the palatial home of Edmund Landau to leave your card, the action would ensure an invitation to the subsequent Landau party, complete with a competitive games. At one pound, Landau had invited G.H. Hardy for a visit. So Landau went to the train to meet him. Hardy in a trench coat and dark glasses. Stepped down from his car, Landau pounced on him and asked for the latest results on the minor arcs. 
used in the analytical number theory. Hardy responded to Lando's dismay. They had lost all interest in the subject. It turned out that the dark glasses hid not Hardy, but a Landau student anxious to play a trick. There were many other visitors. Paul Alexandrov came to the present the latest formulations of algebraic topology. Emil Artin came from Hamburg to expound the obscure beauties of classic class field theory. Oswald Veblen lectured on projective relativity theory. As always, the colloquium was preceded by T and display of the latest issues of journals. Richard von Mises was then a professor at Berlin. He gave an evening lecture on his foundations of probability theory and his notions of a collective. The whole Gottingen establishment listened and then Hilbert Bernays, Bernstein, and others denounced his approach. In brief, new ideas were forcefully presented and discussed. There was plenty of personal contact, for example, for a period I lived at Kern's house in order to teach him the use of English in preparation for his planned visit to the USA. Thus, the Mathematical Institute at Göttingen in 1931-32 was a dynamic and successful model of a top mathematical center. In 1931, Germany faced massive economic and political problems, the Great Depression had caused much unemployment in Germany, and many Germans still recalled clearly the painful post-war inflation. The German chancellor did not have a secure majority in the Reichstag, so it ruled by emergency decree. The people I knew were concerned by these issues and often had liberal or left-leaning sympathies, but I recall no one who correctly foresaw the future. I arrived in Germany first in Berlin to learn German and to absorb the culture. There were communists and social democrats competed with Nazi stormtroopers, I carefully studied a pamphlet, the 27 political parties of Germany. The Weimar Republic had managed to get politics badly fragmented. Once I settled in Göttingen, I could note every Sunday the young student with bandaged faces. They came from practice duels of the color corpse fraternities. Perhaps they anticipated general admiration for professors of law who sported impressive dueling scars. Once in the winter, I defended a street urchin who had unwisely lobbed a snowball at a corpse student. The student thereby challenged me. I had no calling card on me, so I declined the challenge. The student responded, we do not associate with such people, and indeed he did not, passing me often on the street with wordless disdain. Perhaps I was lucky. Martin Kessner told me that in 1912, George Polio was in Göttingen, was challenged by a student, declined, whereupon the rector advised him to leave the university. I managed to stay to my great profit. In 1932, German politics was turbulent, with street battles in Berlin and elsewhere between Nazi stormtroopers and communist groups. Then in January 1933, there was an election in which the Nazis made common cause with the German Nationalist Party. Then nationalists probably thought that they could control Hitler. The combined vote was sufficient to make Hitler Reich Chancellor. His speeches and his picture appeared everywhere. On February 12, 1933, I took a study break to visit Weimar. On arrival, I went to the Opera House, bought tickets for the next day, were all sold out. It was the 50th anniversary of the death of Wagner. Fortunately, by standing outside the opera house the next morning, I managed to get a ticket. The first half of the opera, Wagner, of course, was splendid. In the intermission, I walked out to the lobby. There, 25 feet away, stood Hitler and Goring. At the time, I did not fully re realize the prospects of evil. In later years, I vividly recall the sight of Hitler, but thought it took place later in May 1933. It was later seemed to me to be the one occasion where I might have personally changed history. On March 5th, 1933, the government coalition held a second election, preceded by the vast propaganda effort. It produced a much larger vote for the government. The resulting situation is describable in two letters, which I wrote to my mother, one dated March 12, 1933, and the other undated. The first letter is a tongue-in-cheek praise of propaganda. I'd never seen what official propaganda could do to alter opinions by the time I left Germany in August, I felt so misled by continued propaganda that I did not know what was really going on in the world. In the second undated letter, I seemed to be worried that my mail might be censored. I now think that this worry was groundless, but I was a bit concerned about my copy of Dust Capital. I recall that I hid it in the drawer under some shirts. Actually, there was a book burning in Göttingen on May 10th, 1933 at about that time, the copies of the Literary Digest, what my mother sent me, were no longer allowed to come. After writing these letters, I went on to the student-organized two-week skiing trip in Oberstdorf in Tyrol. We returned by train, stopping for three hours in Nuremberg. This was the day which Hitler decreed 
a peaceful boycott of all Jewish stores. <coughs> Leaving my skis and baggage on the train, I went to explore the town. There in a big shoe store, I saw a seating looking man piercing into the display window. The store was closed, but nevertheless, police spotted the man and at once hustled him off. Since I was supposed to boycott, I suppose the boycott to be peaceful. I was curious and followed along. Soon I too was arrested. The Ernst policeman assumed that I was one of the Anglo-Saxon supporters, reporters who were collecting lies about the Reich. He unbraided me as I, I tried to assure him that I was not a reporter but only a student. He thereby observed that if he were visiting from the USA, he would not intrude on the police. I tried my best to report that all my possessions were about to leave on a train. I was let go just in time to catch it. I returned to Gattingen to my lodgings. There, my landlady regularly provided me with evening tea and talk. I rapidly discovered that two weeks of propaganda had converted her from mild conservative views to adherent Nazi uh, discipleship. In Germany, professors, uh, private docent and, and assistants are all government officials. On April 7th, 1933, a new law about such officials summarily dismissed all those who were Jewish, except for those appointed before 1914 to those who served as soldiers in the First World War. In addition, dismissal awaited all those officials who were not at every time completely committed to the National Socialist State. The fact that the Mathematical Institute was drastic. Current, Noether, and Bernstein were immediately dismissed. In Current's case, his service in the First World War did not spare him. Evidently, his earlier political views and his wide mathematical influence made him disliked. With his departure, Neuberger was made acting head of the Institute, but he lasted only one day when he too was dismissed, apparently because of his political sympathies, but perhaps because he failed to mow his own lawn. On April 27th, Bernays, Hertz, and Louis were dismissed. Landau was advised not to lecture on the coming summer session. He followed the advice as a result of this. My letter to May 3rd to my mother read, so many professors and instructors have been fired or have left the mathematics department is pretty thoroughly emasculated. It is rather hard on mathematics, and we have but the cold comfort that is the best thing for the folk. Uh, for that summer semester, things strug struggled along somehow. All the students who could do so hurried to finish up degree requirements. I had lost my thesis advisor, advisor, Paul Bernays. Herman Wilde took his place and subsequently gave me a tough oral examination. I managed, but in the definition of Herseldorf space, I forgot the separation axiom, but did not dare mention the fact that Weil had once forgotten it in print. <coughs> For another oral exam, I took a course on the philosophy of mathematics by Professor Moritz Geiger. Though Jewish, he had served in the First World War, so was still left in office. However, in every lecture, I could notice his nervous anxiety about the future, a justified anxiety. On July 14th, I wrote my mother, just recently has been proclaimed that the German Revolution is now at the end. Now things must proceed in evolution in a strictly legal fashion. That somehow gives the impression that up to the present, everything has not proceeded in strictly legal fashion, or at least that the essay has on occasion taken <coughs> onto itself the rights and privileges of the police. How far that has happened, I cannot very much tell. My fiance Dorothy Jones, had come to Gottingen from New York to help me finish my thesis. She learned much about the political situation when she and I went to Standensat to get a wedding license. We were surprised to find that my fellow student, Fritz John, and his friend Charlotte, they were troubled to have discovered their, their presence. He was Jewish. She was not. They were very anxious to get married quickly because he feared the prospect of a law that would prohibit such intermarriages. We agreed to secrecy. They invited us to their to their uh, party after the wedding. Among the other guests were a blonde German youth and his evidently Jewish girlfriend. Dorothy wrote to my mother, there is adventure amid romance in such a marriage. On July 25th, I wrote my mother, politics continued to be absorbing as ever. Friday night, Dorothy and I went to a Nazi speech on the new order of things in the German universities. It turned out to be the most sensible speech. The speaker a prominent Nazi professor in Berlin did not demand that Wiesenschaft be completely burned down by politics. He said that Wiesenschaft should be independent but not autonomous. After the meeting, we went downtown to drink coffee with my friend Gebhardt. There again, we discussed politics, the influence of Catholicism upon Hitlerism. And so far into the night, I've recently become impressed 
with the great variety of opinions within the Nazi movement. All Nazis do not think alike, even though it may externally seem as if they did. Note 1995, I no longer recall this discussion of Catholicism. I was then largely ignorant of German Catholicism and a great admirer of my grandfather's powerful sermon, Favoring Tolerance. My oral exam still threatened one of the geometric function theories with the redoubtable professor Gustav Herglitz. I consulted my experienced friends what to do. They reminded me that he loved to lecture. This I bore in mind during the exam. Herglitz, what is the Erlinger program? Um, everything depends on the group. Herglax, what is the group for complex analysis, the conformal group? This suffice to start Herglax in a suspended lecture on the geometric function theory in terms of the conformal group. My thesis was done, and I was through. <coughs> but for the Institute, there was added loss. Herman Weil was not Jewish, but his wife was. This meant that their two sons were so counted. So at the end of the summer semester 1933, Weil left for a professorship at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. All told, in 1933, 18 mathematicians left or were driven out of the faculty of the Mathematical Institute of Göttingen. This included Landau. He was not officially dismissed, but when he again started to lecture in the winter semester of 1933, the students ordered uh, organized a complete boycott of his lecture. He thereupon resigned and returned to Berlin. Mathematics of the University of Berlin was also seriously disrupted. There are 23 faculty members including Richard Brower, Max Den, Hans Brunthal, uh, Newman, Hannah Newman, and Richard von Mises left. The specific effects at other German universities have been carefully tabulated by Max Bielen Pill in four articles. Detailed analysis of the situation in Gaudgen has been presented by Schapper as part of his book on Gaudgen under the Nazis. One observer had summarized the effects on mathematics in the following words. Within a few weeks, this action would scatter the winds of everything that had been created over so many decades. One of the greatest tragedies experienced by human culture since the time of the Renaissance was taking place, a tragedy which a few years before would have seemed an impossibility under 20th century conditions. There were attempts to rebuild mathematics in Gottingen, them in algebraicist Helmut Haas became professor and director of the Institute for a period of difficult dealings with several mathematicians with Nazi enthusiasm, Oswald uh, Teichmuller, Werner Weber, Edmund Tornier. Tornier was briefly co-director of the Institute. At one point, he hoped to get Haas removed from the dictatorship, directorship. Tornier favored the party. For example, he later wrote in then the New Journal of German Mathematics, 1936, pure mathematics too has real ob objects. Whoever wishes to deny this is a representative of Jewish liberal thought. Like philosophical sophisticates, every theory of pure mathematics has the right to exist if it's really in a position to answer concrete questions with concern, real objects like whole numbers or geometric figures, or at least it serves from the construction of things which happen there. Otherwise it is incomplete or else a document of Jewish liberal confusion born from the brains of rootless artists who by juggling with objectless definitions, misleading themselves, their thoughtless public in the future, will have German mathematics. Eventually, the four professorships at Göttingen were again occupied, but even with Carl Ludwin Siegel, the former glory was not restored. At one point, Haas hoped to increase his influence with the authorities. So according to his son-in-law, Martin Knieser, he applied for membership in the Nazi party, but it turned out that one of his grandmothers might have been a Jew. His application was put on hold till after the war. After the war, Haas was dismissed as part of the denazification. Since then, the Göttingen Mathematical Institute has gradually reconstituted as one of several such institutes at other German universities, but it still not succeeded to reclaim its original brilliant dominance. As Dorothy and I left in August of 1933, I carried with me as a treasure something of the version of the earlier Göttingen, the unique model of the great mathematics department. I mourn the loss, but not only for the sake of science. I did not foresee the Holocaust, but I was aware of the power of the state propaganda, and I was actively fearful of the prospects for a second war, world war. Although prevention seemed beyond my powers, now in retrospect, the whole development is a decisive demonstration of damage done to academic and mathematical life by any sort of ordination to populism, political pressures, and proposed political principles. Okay, so I thought that one was pretty interesting, a personal account of 
the change of Gottingen under the Nazi rules. We got Dave back in the chat. Good to see you, Dave. And I got one last article I was hoping to read. This one's kind of long, too. So hopefully I'll try to read this and then wrap up. So that was about Gottingen in 1933. This is Jewish mathematics at Gottingen, the era of Felix Klein. And Felix Klein was the director before David Hilbert. And Felix Klein, as we'll see, he was not Jewish, although some people thought he was Jewish, but the name Klein is very common among Jews. And Klein, as I mentioned earlier, married the granddaughter of Hegel. Jewish Mathematics that got into the era of Felix Klein by David Rowe. And David Rowe is the author of quite a few books on you know this history of Gottingen and uh, Jewish mathematics and immigration to America. In 1936, the Gottinger Tagablatt, a right-wing newspaper, printed an article with the headline, Felix Klein was an Aryan, which no one in Gottingen at least doubted. According to the Tagblatt, Klein's ancestry was cleared by his family after the Volkischer Buerbacher official mouthpiece for the Nazi party reported that he was of Jewish descent. The source of the error was said to be the Jewish Encyclopedia, but the tag block added is well known that Jews love to stamp famous men as Jewish in order to increase the prestige of their people. Of course, the Nazi party was very diligent when it came to tracing a suspicious family ethnic background. So one might wonder what led them to chase Felix Klein Gloss ghost some 10 years after his death in 1925. What apparently prompted the Nazi investigation was a memorandum sent to the Bavarian Ministry of Culture by Hugo Dingler in November 1933, which quickly found its way to the offices of the Prussian Minister of the Interior. Its subject was the dominance of Jews in the fields of mathematics and physics, and it was accompanied by a cover letter from Philip Lennard, the father of Deutsch physics. The memorandum presented a 20-page historical synopsis of how Jews invaded the fields of mathematics and physics after being granted legal equality in 1869. According to Dingler, their ringleader was, ringleader was none other than Felix Klein, who at least from one side of his family was of Jewish descent. Dingler went on to describe how Klein perverted German mathematics by imposing a self-styled dictatorship over the field. This began when he circulated a proposal among the mathematics professors calling for the organization of research through one central university, namely, <coughs> namely Gottingen. When this idea failed to win support, he convinced the plan of codifying the subject by publishing the Encyclopedia of Math and Science. Through this instrument, Dingler asserted Klein was able to control developments in the field since those who worked outside of his empire were never given any recognition. Eventually, all of the leading journals became dependent on him, and no one could obtain even the lowliest position without his approval. Yet even this could not satisfy Klein's ambition, wrote Dingler, for he also wanted the mathematicians of other countries to submit to his rule. Thus, he drew foreign students to Gottingen and gave them work of great interest, while young Germans, unless they happened to be Jewish, were forced into the background. The atmosphere of Gottingen was not only international pacifist, it was already in the 1890s decidedly anti-German. Any expression of national sentiment by young German automatically jeopardized his career. In fact, Dingler contended that Gottingen's influence was so pervasive that it even created a new style among German mathematicians whose behavior, posture, gesture, and manners of speech were altered in imitation of Jewish prototypes. Only those non-Jews who could adopt this style had any hope of furthering their career. Klein's dictatorship eventually led to a barely visible but all-powerful organization across the academic landscape, and practically every institution of higher education in Germany had its Gottingen Jew on the faculty. The character of Gottingen's mathematics is patently ludicrous, yet despite its exaggeration, Dingler's memorandum is rather suggestive in some respects. The perception that everything new and exciting in German mathematics came out of Gottingen often made colleagues in faraway places like Breslau and Freiburg rather envious, even Berlin, the traditional center for mathematics in Germany, was relegated to a position of secondary importance beginning around 1900. During the next 15 years, Klein's colleagues included the illustrious mathematicians David Hilbert, Hermann Minkowski, Karl Runge, and Edmund Landau, as well as the astronomer Karl Schwarzschild, and the physicist Ludwig Pantel, Peter Durbe, and Emil Weichart. This stunning array of talent attracted no less than 18 uh, private docentin 
in mathematics and mathematical physics to Gottingen between 1890 and the outbreak of World War I. Their names read like a who's who in German science. During the Weimar era, era Hermann Weil, Arnold Sommerfeld, Sommerfeld Constantine, uh, Karl Theodori, Gustav Herglotz, Eric Heck, Max Born, Richard Current, Theodore von Karaman, Otto Blumenthal, Ernst Zermelo, Paul Kobe, Robert Frike, and Otto Toplitz. Gottinger's prominent position vis a vis Berlin and other universities was bound to intensify traditional rivalries, but these were further aggravated by Klein's aggressive academic politics and the influence he enjoyed in extra scientific circles. Klein was a trusted confidant of Friedrich Althoff, the kingpin of the Prussian university system, so his opinions carried considerable weight in the Ministry of Culture. It is well known that he could sometimes make or break the career of a young mathematician. Klein also developed contacts with a number of leading industrials, and at the turn of the century, firms like Krupp, Bayer, Siemens, and Halsk, and AG, and Norderstrup Lloyd were pumping considerable amounts of money into the new research institute through the newly founded Gadgen Association for the, promotion, for the promotion of applied physics and mathematics. A nationalist and anti-Semite like Hubert Hugo Dingler could hardly fail to notice that soon after the war, Gadgen was filled with foreign and Jewish mathematicians. The paranoia that echoes through Dingler's memorandum is particularly striking in those passages where he describes the difference between Jewish and Aryan modes of mathematical thinking. Although he claims that Jews made no fundamental contributions to the mathematical knowledge prior to 1870, incredible assertion given that the uh, Jacobi's importance in German mathematics, he insists that they still pose a very real danger to the Germans because of their cleverness, speed, and sure memory power. Jewish mathematicians are everywhere in the foreground. Naturally, they're, these are only apparent strength reflecting on the depth, lack of depth of Jewish thought. Dingler quickly points out that the non-Jewish mentality therefore only appears slower as more secondary associations are taken up. All this fits with the classical pattern of racist hysteria at the time. German Geist, that frail but sacred essence, was being threatened by the dirty world of Jewish moneylenders with their sharp, keen, reckoning minds. Special stereotypes developed in the world of mathematics, where it's commonly believed that Jews were innately inclined towards algorithmic, analytical, or abstract thinking, whereas Germans tend to think intuitively and synthetically, often drawing their inspiration from natural phenomena. The distinction between these two modes of thinking in mathematics, one internal and purist, and the other external and applied, is commonplace even today, although without these racial overtones. What is ironical about the Dingler Memorandum, however, is that Felix Klein himself was largely responsible for giving this distinction widespread currency. Moreover, he did so as a champion of the externalist tradition rather than the purest approach so often associated with Jewish mathematics. That this was the case did not remain a secret to the Nazi regime for long. Only a few months after the Dingler Memorandum appeared, Ludwin Bierbach delivered a well-publicized lecture entitled, entitled Personality Structure and Mathematical Creativity, in which he invoked the example of Felix Klein as a model for Aryan as opposed to Jewish mathematics. One of Klein's last doctoral students, Bierbach, was appointed as decan of the Berlin Philosophical Faculty shortly after the Nazi takeover and became an official member of the party in 1937. His staunch supporter was Theodore Vallin, who had been an outspoken racist since the early 1920s and was head of the Division of Higher Education in the Ministry of Culture after 1934. Vallin and Bierbach were publisher and editor, respectively, of the journal uh, German Mathematic, an enterprise undertaken under the same spirit as German physics, promulgated by Leonard and Johannes Stark. In pursuing this course, Bierbach believed that he was following the lead of his Rever teacher acclaimed he supported by citing the since infamous passage from Klein's Eviston colloquial lectures. <clears throat> it must be said that the degree of exactness of the intuition of space may be different in different individuals, perhaps even in different races. It would seem as if a strong, naive space intuition were an attribute preeminently in the Teutonic race, while the critical, purely logical sense is more fully developed in the Latin and Hebrew races. A full investigation of the subject. Someone on the line suggested by Francis Galton, his research on Reddy might be interesting. Thus, Bierbach not only called attention to Klein's healthy German mathematical style, he also emphasized that Klein himself had known the stylistic distinctions were grounded in racial types. On the other hand, he never troubled to consider how it was possible for such an influential figure as Klein to have been surrounded by so many Jews 
and white Jews, non-Jews, who were considered to have been corrupted in spirit, inclination, and character by Jewish culture. Once the mystery surrounding Klein's racial background had been settled, it was safe for Bierbach to use Klein's immense prestige as a vehicle for launching his own career as a Nazi mathematician. He helped advertise Klein's family history to the German mathematical community and continued to set forth his theory concerning the interplay between race and mathematical style, despite the outrage it provoked among many foreign mathematicians. However, by drawing on Klein's numerous pronouncements regarding mathematical style while divorcing this issue from the familiar stereotype of Gottingen mathematics in the Weimar era as a manifestation of the Jewish conspiracy to undermine Jewish culture, Bierbach conducted an apparently successful campaign to rehabilitate Klein's legacy as a, pro a proto-Nazi thinker. The central task to this essay will be to reassess the disputed legacy in the light of the unpublished documentary evidence. I begin with some brief remarks on the plight of Jewish mathematicians in the German universities, together with a sketch of Klein's early contacts, with some of them, the emphasis here falls on Klein's pivotal role in building a power base and network of contacts outside of the mainstream tradition of Berlin. In the next section, Klein's seminar, on the psychology of mathematics and his famous lectures on the history of 19th century mathematics serve as a primary vehicle for the reassessment of his views on Jewish mathematics. They are compared with the opinions of other contemporary figures and contrasted with the racial theories forward by Bierbach and Nazi psychologist Eric Jens. The essay then concludes with some remarks directed towards the interpretation of Gottingen mathematics as a phenomenon of Weimar culture. Here the Jewish question forms part of a larger complex of social political issues that led to a divisive and ultimately untenable situation within the Gottingen philosophical faculty, alienated from their colleagues of the humanities, Gottingen mathematicians and scientists carried on a persistent battle with members of that group to ensure equal and just treatment for Jews, foreigners, women, pacifists, and other left-wing political dissidents. Led by David Hilbert, the most prestigious mathematician of the period, their efforts steadily polarized opinion within the philosophical faculty and until a crisis in 1918 led to its permanent dismemberment. These events and circumstance illustrated the inadequacy of Fritz Ringer's Mandarin thesis regarding the reactionary character of the German professorate when it is uncritically extended from the humanists to the community of the mathematicians and natural scientists. The German universities with its centuries, oh, Klein's rise to power. The German universities with, for centuries enjoyed a semi-autonomous corporate status have sometimes been likened to the medieval craft guilds. As for the many former institutions were founded in the late Middle Ages, the resemblance is not entirely fortuitous. Moreover, the neo-humanist value system that dominated the scholarship of the early 19th century tended in many respects to reinforce patterns of training reminiscence to the apprenticeship required by the craft tradition. Non-humanists rested the twin pillars of Leeren Leerfenheit, the freedom to teach and to learn. These emphasized the autonomy and self-sufficiency of the academic disciplines, ideals that made the inner sanctum of the universities rather similar to the insulated and closed societies that developed around the guilds. After obtaining his PhD, the apprentice student was promoted and became the journeyman doctor who often studied at a number of universities for commencing his habilitation to reach this rung of the academic ladder it was necessary to present the faculty with a finished masterwork, the habilitation script. This was found to be, if this was found to be satisfactory, the candidate was granted the venia legende, legende, which gave him the right to lecture as a private docent, do, docent. This meant that he collected the usual course fee from students while the university paid him nothing. It was next to impossible to maintain oneself as a private docent without substantial private means. And as the 19th century wore on a bottleneck development of the system that left many of the state of limbo for 10 years or more, not that it had ever been all that easy to break in. Immanuel Kant taught for nine years as a horseler and 15 as a private docent before they finally attained professorship. <coughs> <laughs> After about 1860, it was no longer customary to apply for a university position when a vacancy arose. To obtain an appointment for the rank of private docent, one needed to receive an unsolicited roof or call to the position. The two basic types of appointment were as an ordinary liquor professor or as an oyster liquor professor. But until the end of the century, only the ordinary 
enjoyed full faculty privileges, and there was a gross disparity between their incomes and that of the other docenten. To be appointed as an ordinariat, to become a master in the guild, as it were, was the coveted goal of every aspiring academic. Yet, as Max Weber once remarked, the dominant characteristic of German academic life was that many were called, but few chosen. Even David Hilbert spent many years as a private docent before moving up the ladder amid the extensive reshuffling positions that took place in 1892. Felix Klein, on the other hand, was a great, the great exception that proves the rule. He took the doctorate in 1869, shortly after the death of his teacher, Julius Plucker. He then went on to study with Alfred Klepsch and Gottinged and made brief sojourns to Berlin and Paris, where he met Sophus Lee and finally returned to Gottingen in 1871 to become a short stint as a private docent. The Gottingen faculty waived the normal requirements that he submit to habitualization shift and less than two years later, he was appointed an Orden Liquor Professor in Erlangen at the practically honored age of 23. It was on this occasion that he presented the faculty with his famous Erlinger program, an impressive achievement considering that throughout his student days, Klein was intent on pursuing a career in physics. During the era of Friedrich Altorf, the Prussian University expanded at an unprecedented rate a development largely due to the long-term trend towards specialized research, especially scientific and medical research, undertaken in special seminars and institutes. The growth was occupied, accompanied by an immodest improvement in the placement and promotion of non-Protestant minorities. Bernard von Brock had described the earlier situation in these terms. In Prussia, before Altop's time, it was impossible for Social Democrats, nearly impossible for unbaptized Jews, and seldom possible for Catholics to become ordinarian. Even during Altov's first 15 years in the office, the situation of the Jews improved only slightly. As the figures in Table 1 indicate, the jump from private docent to ordinaries remained exceedingly difficult. One must exercise extreme caution in drawing conclusions from these and other statistics, above all because they are based on the confession alone and therefore fail to take into account the considerable number of non-religious Jews. Nevertheless, all sources seem to indicate that despite the rapid expansion of the German universities, that accompanied the onset of the economic boom in 1895, the position of Jewish scholars, baptized or not, grew worse rather than better. A breakdown of the number of Jews gainfully employed in the academic and freelance professions in 1907 reveals that only about 1-5% were docenten, the vast majority preferring careers as doctors, teachers, lawyers, and artists, whereas the number is Jewish ordinary and at all German universities during the period of 1882 to 1909 remained relatively stable, fluctuating between 20 and 25. By 1917, there were only 13, or approximately 1% of the total. 11 universities, including Berlin, had none at all. Moreover, a number of fields, it was virtually impossible to find entry. No Jew ever held the chair in German literature, classical languages, or antique culture before the Weimar era. Of the roughly 200 Jewish docents in in all the institutions of higher education in Germany in 1910, more than half were in medicine, and most of the remainder were members of the philosophical faculty, which normally included mathematics and the natural science. Very few held positions on the law faculty, which was one of the preferred means of entry into the civil service and other distinguished careers. One of the academic fields that particularly attracted the Jewish scholars, no doubt partly because of its relatively value-free status, was mathematics. In fact, the first non-baptized Jew to be elevated to an ordinariat at a German university was a, the Gottingen mathematician Moritz Abraham Stern, born in 1807 in Frankfurt am Main, which for many years had the largest Jewish population of any German city. He was educated at home by his father and grandfather, hoping that he would become a rabbi. They also hired a tutor who gave him lessons in Latin, Greek, Chaldaic, and Syriac. When he matriculated at Heidelberg in 1826, however, his major subset was mathematics. One year later, he began his studies at Gottingen, where his teachers were Bernard Freilich Diebold, Tobias Mayer, and the younger, and Karl Friedrich Gauss. Stern remained in Gottingen for the next 60 years, retiring in 1885, when he was seated by none other than Felix Klein. Stern was an active member of the Gottingen Jewish community all his life, and during his student days, he wrote, home in Hebrew. He befriended Klein during the latter's brief tenure at Gottingen as a private docent, and their correspondence from the 1880s suggests that he hoped to win Klein's service for the university sometime in the future. 
Although he was a cabinet fixture for so many years, Stern's career was filled with hardships. In 1829, he was awarded the doctoral degree with distinction, Gauss having been one of his examiners. In 1830, he was made private docent to supplement his meager income. He translated Simon Dennis Poisson's textbook on mechanics and published two popular works on astronomy. Eight years later, the Hanoverian ministry agreed to pay him his yearly salary of 150 Thaler with an explanation that as a Jew, Stern cannot become a professor. In 1840, he was recommended by his colleagues for the position of a sword and then the click professor. Five years later, the ministry sent its reply as a Jew is completely out of the question. The winds in 1848 apparently changed the climate and opinion enough so that he was finally appointed a Soren Dentlicher professor. And through the 1850s, he received a small salary increase. Still, he had to wait until 1859, nearly 30 years after he'd won his career at Göttingen, docent before he was finally made an ordinarius. Stern's career clearly reflects the nearly insurmountable obstacles faced by Jewish scholars intent on pursuing academic careers prior to the founding of the Second Reich. It was only after the North German Confederation passed laws in 1867 and 1869, which were incorporated into the Constitution of the Reich in 1872, that eliminated politically sanctioned discrimination against Jews in the public sec service sector and freelance professions, that the 50-year process that led to the legal emancipation of Prussian Jewry came to an end. After this, baptism was no longer imperative for Jewish academics, although it was clearly a more prudent course than the than remaining of the Jewish boy, uh, faith. By the end of the 1860s, two more mathematicians, Lazarus Fuchs and Leo Koinesberger, had managed to overcome the stigma of being unbaptized Jews and were appointed the position or ordinarian. A third, Leopold uh, Krachnecker, declined Bernard Riemann's chair in Göttingen, preferring to remain in Berlin, where he taught at the university by virtue of his membership of the Berlin Academy. Yet the gains made by German Jewry in this ensuing period were purchased dearly. The wild speculation occasioned by the founding of the Reich led to the financial collapse of 1873 and the economic depression that lasted well into the 1890s. One of the side effects of these events was modern anti-Semitism. The evils of capitalism and Jewish banking interests soon became one of the minds of many Germans, particularly those whose livelihoods and station life were almost immediately threatened by rapid modernization. At the universities, the situation was aggravated by the swift emergence of a formerly repressed Jewish element that was being drawn to the academic profession in large numbers at a time when the cost of higher education had become increasingly onerous. In the meantime, Felix Klein had begun laying the groundwork for a new school of German mathematics. To a large extent, he inherited this role as the leading student of Alfred Klebisch, who had died just after Klein was called to Erlinger in 1872. A number of Klebisch students had gotten your file Klein to Erlinger shortly after, and at the same time, he looked on to the major responsibility of editing the journal clubs that founded Math. Through the annual, Klein maintained close working relations with most of the leading members of the Klebisch school, Paul Gordon, Max Dother, Alexander Brill, Jacob Lorath and Ariel Voss. It was largely through the influence and support of these men that Klein was able to build the network of contacts among German mathematicians that he later expanded into a small empire. Among these early supporters, the most important were Gordon and Noether, both of whom were Jewish. Gordon was a rather cantankerous character, 12 years Klein senior. After working with Kleps in algebraic geometry, he turned to the more formal aspects of the subject where he made his fame as the king of invariants, a title that lost most of his distinction after Hilbert proved the finite basis theorem in 1892. Gordon joined Klein on the Erlinger faculty in 1874 and remained there all his life, producing exactly one PhD student who happened to be his colleague's daughter, the great Emmy Noether. Ludwig Birnbach later considered Gordon's algorithmic style a perfect model of Jewish mathematics in direct opposition to Klein's dramatic approach, but he failed to point out that these styles, what admittedly pulls apart, apparently complemented one another rather well. A great deal of Klein's work in Glois theory was undertaken with Gordon, with whom he often met during the semester breaks after he accepted a call to Munich Institute of Technology in 1875. Their joint efforts culminated in Klein's famous lectures on the icosahedron, about which the author had to say this in the preface, is now far-reaching theory has grown. I attribute this result primarily to Professor Gordon. I'm not here referring to his trench and profound labors, which shall be fully reported upon hereafter, 
in this place, I must report what cannot be expressed in quotations and reference. The name of the professor Grunan had spurned me on when I was flagged in my labors and that he's helped me over many difficulties, which I should never have overcome alone. Max Noether and Klein began their lifelong friendship as a fellow students at Klebst and Göttingen. When Gordon was called to Erlingen in 1874, Klein's second choice for the position was Noether, which leaves little doubt that it was Klein's recommendation that brought him to Erlinger one year later. The appointment was as a oyster dentalker professor, but Klein hoped that through his influence, Noether would soon become an ordinarius. These hopes were unfounded. Eight years after Noether's appointment to Erlinger, Klein wrote to say that despite his best efforts, he was unable to win support for Noether's candidacy in Friedberg and that the situation in Tübinger was even worse as the faculty there was opposed to the principal accepting a Jewish colleague. Max Noether never received a call to another university and had to wait 13 years before Erlinger finally made him an ordinarius. During the five years Klein taught alongside Alexander Brill in Munich, he expanded his base of potential resources considerably. There he befriended the engineer and entrepreneur Carl van Lind, who was later instrumental in helping him establish new institutes for technological research in Göttingen. His most important contacts, over were the two young students, Walter van Dyck and Alfred Horowitz. Dyck was a talented teacher and organizer who served as the workhorse for many of Klein's larger projects, such as the Encyclopedia of Math and Science, he later inherited Klein's chair at Munich and for many years was managing editor of the mathematical annual journal. Mathemat Hurwitz, on the other hand, was strictly a mathematical talent. He also happens to have been Jewish. After studying with Klein in Munich, he went on to Berlin before returning to his mentor in Leipzig, where Klein was called to a special chair for Geometry in 1880. Shortly before graduation, Klein wrote a letter to Horowitz's father expressing his view of the young man's future. Above all, I want to stress that among the totality of young people of whom I have up until now worked, there was not one in specifically mathematical talent could measure up to your son. From now on, your son will enjoy a brilliant scientific career, which is all the more certain because his gifts are combined with enduring personality traits. The only dangerous point is his health. Your son probably already long ago weakened himself through overworking his studies. Let me close with the assurance that no one will be happier than I when your son's health fully returns. I need his thoroughgoing collaboration for my latest mathematical investigations. As this letter illustrates, Klein has an uncanny eye for spotting mathematical talent, which was certainly one of the keys to his latest success in Gottingen. Hurwitz went on to make fundamental contributions in function theory, as well as in Austrian and Dentlicka Professor at Koenigsberg, he became good friends with two students named Hilbert and Minkowski. Klein had a long-standing interest in building a mathematical center in Göttingen that would rival Berlin, but it was only in, it was only in the mid-1890s that he began to develop its resources necessarily to do so. As a student of Plucker and Klepscht, Klein had inherited the, the strong antipathy for the purism of the Berlin tradition. Silly seems to have been on fairly good terms with the leading Berlin mathematicians, throughout the early stages of his career. The first sign of the serious tension developed in 1885 when Klein, who until then had been teaching outside of Prussia, accepted a call to Göttingen. Against strong opposition, he managed to secure the chair in geometry at Leipzig from his Norwegian friend Sophus Lee, a relatively unknown figure who was in fact the greatest geometer of the day. As it turned out, Hermann Amanda Schwartz, Klein's future colleague at Göttingen, and a leading representative of the Berlin School, coveted the position, even expected to be offered it. He and his teacher, Karl Weertraus, were incensed to learn that a foreign mathematician had been favored above everybody in Germany. Weertraus wrote Schwartz, a uh, pretty beginning to the new era we shall begin under Klein's presidency. Paul Du Bois Raymond sometimes really does hit the nail on the head. Already years ago, he called the triumph very Klein, Lee, Mayer, the Society, Mutual Admiration Society. Rear Strauss and his allies had no difficulty in regarding Klein's, in reading Klein's intention. They were well aware that the bringing Lee to Leipzig, Klein hoped to broaden his front against the Berlin School, while still remaining unclear with, was his long-term plan to rehabilitate the Göttingen tradition of Gauss and Riemann with a strong emphasis on the interplay between mathematics and physical reality. The strategy, however, could hardly have been realized without the strong support of Friedrich Althoff, 
head of the Prussian system of higher education, although nominally accountable to the Prussian Minister of Culture, Altov managed to carve out a vast sphere of influence of his own, which he ran with all the sovereign authority of a powerful prince. When a change in the ministry led to his dismissal in 1907, it was necessary to appoint four new functionaries to fulfill his former duties. It was an official, unofficial yet central feature of Althoff's educational policies that certain universities were given preferential treatment as outstanding research centers in selected fields. This was a marked departure from the earlier situation in which Berlin, as the capital and wealthiest university city, was invariably regarded as the final destination of a brilliant academic career. Under Althoff, Berlin continued to dominate in classics, history, and the arts, but in the natural sciences, and particularly mathematics, Gottingen became the new standard bearer. A critical turning point for these developments occurred in 1892 when Krakener's death and Weir Strauss's retirement brought the golden age of Berlin mathematics to an end. It is interesting to follow some of the behind the scenes maneuvering during the period of transition. On the 22nd January a Committee of Berlin faculty members met to propose candidates to fill the vacancies. In one point, there was unanimity of opinion as ex certs from the committee's protocol indicate under no circumstance would any of them contents the candidates of Felix Klein. Hemmelt's chronicler spoke very disparagingly of Klein. He regarded him as a charlatan. Wiesentraub, Klein dabbles more a bluffer. Fuchs, I have nothing against this person, only his precarious manner when it comes to scientific questions. The committee nominated George Frobenus to fulfill chronicler's chair and Gottingen's H.H. H. Schwartz to proceed Weir, Weir Strauss these recommendations were approved by the Prussian ministry, and one month later, Klein wrote Adolf Horowitz. Altroff was here for three days, and he decided on the calls to Berlin. Concerning Schwartz's replacement, you will probably have guessed that I want to recommend you and Hilbert as the only two who, together with me, are in a position to assure Gottingen is a place of scientific distinction. Naturally, I will name you first and Hilbert behind you. There are, however, a series of difficulties associated with your being called first, there's the problem of your health. Secondly, there is the much more subtle difficulty that you are not only personally, but also in your mathematical style, much closer to me than is Hilbert. You're coming here, could therefore perhaps give our guidance in mathematics a two one sided character. There's thirdly, I must touch on it as repugnant as the matter is to me, and knowing full well your justified sensitivity, this is the Jewish question. Not that uh, your call as such would present difficulties. These I would be able to overcome the problems that we already have. Arthur Schoenfiles, from whom I would like to create a firm position as salary extraordinaris, and having you and Schoenfiles together is something I will not be able to get past either the faculty or the minister. Two weeks later, Klein wrote again, this time informing Horowitz that he was now the only serious contender for Schwartz's position. It had been impossible even to get Hilbert's name on the list as he was still a private docent. The assessment However, it did not accurately reflect the real state of affairs. After a long, intense debate between Klein and his colleagues, Schwartz and Ernst, sharing the Gottinger faculty, had compromised on the following list of candidates in descending order. Heinrich Weber, Horowitz, and Friedrich Schottke. Thus, Klein was counting on Althorff to support him in passing over Weber and choosing Horowitz instead. He even made it clear that Althorff, that in his view of the anti-Semitism within the fact philosophical faculty, he would be willing to sacrifice Schoenflies in order to get Horowitz. This plan might well have been realized had not an unexpected circumstance diverted Klein from his original objective. Forbinius, who had not yet accepted the call to Berlin, began to consider openly whether he might not prefer the position in Gottingen and said. Klein was delighted by this turn of event and ensured Althoff that not only would Frobenus be welcomed on, by the faculty, but as a leading representative of the Berlin School, he would also be a perfect complement for Gottingen. He even wrote Hurwitz that he had known, had he known that there was any possibility of winning Fraubenus, he would have placed his name first on the list of nominees. Klein's invited Fraubenus to visit him, and Gottingen followed this meeting. There was great suspense as everyone awaited the candidate's decision. Not surprisingly, he accepted the chair in Berlin, and immediately afterwards, Alter offered the vacant post in Gottingen to Heinrich Weber. Klein was spurious when he learned that Althoff had chosen the honor of the faculty's wishes rather than that of his own, although it was not impossible, implausible that his own opportunistic fence jumping may have ruined Hurwitz's chances. Another possibility is that Hurwitz was the victim of an anti Semitic backlash within the Prussian ministry, suspicion Klein himself raised. For this reason, he wrote to Hurwitz 
he considered the latter's chance of succeeding Weber in Marburg or obtaining a call anywhere else in Prussia is unfavorable. The prophecy turned out to be true, although Horowitz did receive an offer shortly thereafter from the Zurich Polytechnic, where he taught for the remainder of his career. Whether or not Klein really believed that anti-Semitism was quashed towards candidacy, there's no question that he was disappointed not to have won in Forgottenchen. But Paul Gordon, who was 38 years old before he became an ordinarist and therefore presumably knew something about anti-Semitism in the German universities from firsthand experience, had a different perspective as he wrote Klein, I'm sorry to hear that you were not called to Berlin as your all-embracing spirit would have brought order to the mathematical relationships in Germany. It was just that you recommend it, Hurwitz for Gattingen. Hurwitz deserves this distinction that your recommendation not go through. However, is a fortune for which you cannot thank God enough. What would you have done with Hurwitz and Gattingen? You would have taken on the complete responsibility for this Jew, every real or apparent mistake that Hurwitz would have fallen on your head. And for all this utterances and the faculty and Senate would have been regarded as influenced by you. Hurwitz would have been considered nothing more than appendage of Klein. Although disappointed, Klein was not one to take such a defeat calmly. He fared, fired off an angry letter to Altor, complaining about the loss of faith he had suffered with the Gattingen faculty, and he fought tenuously for Hurwitz's cause, only to have Weber, the candidate proposed by his opponent Schwartz, and Schoen called instead. This situation, he asserted, could only be somewhat remedied by having Schoenfeld's name extraordinarius. On the one hand, it is known that I've been working on this appointment for years. On the other, my efforts have only met with resistance, so I only dispense from doing so as Horowitz calls stood in question. Should Schoenflies now be passed over, this impression will become a virtual certainty. I would then be forced to advise young mathematicians not to turn to me if they hope to make further advancements in Prussia. Shortly after this letter was written, Arthur Schoenfritz was appointed Ossian Ordenlicher Professor in Göttingen, where for the next seven years he attracted droves of students to his classes in descriptive geometry. Three years later, Heinrich Weber accepted a call to Strasbourg, thus paving the way for Hilbert, who had since become an ordinarist in Königsberg, to come to Göttingen. Klein had his eye on Gilbert for several years. Already in 1890, he described him to Altor as the rising man, and this time he was taking no chances. He wrote up the faculty's list of recommendations himself, and it consisted of just two names, Hilbert and Minkowski. Hilbert was delighted to accept the call, and as it turned out, the hard part was not so much winning Hilbert as keeping him once the rest of the world realized that Gottingen had another Riemann on his mist. No mathematician before Hilbert had ever declined a formal offer from Berlin, which was still the most prestigious mathematical center in Germany. Hilbert not only turned down offers from Leipzig and Bern, he twice refused a chair in Berlin. The first of these calls, which was a true test of strength from Gottingen Mathematics, came in 1902. Klein, who was aware Oh, was, of course, willing to do almost anything to keep Hilbert, urgently appealed to Altorf, who obliged by creating new ordinate and Gottingen out of thin air, as it were, in a calling Hilbert's longtime friend, Herman Minkowski, to fill it. The unpresented action was all the more daring in that Minkowski's appointment also overturned the unofficial apology in Gottingen that restricted the proliferation of Jewish docenten within a given discipline. Schoenflies was this was by this time gone, but in the meantime, Karl Schwarzschild, with strong backing from Klein, had been appointed professor of astronomy in 1901, inheriting the chair once held by Gauss. Therefore, thereafter, the former residence of the Prince of Mathematicians in the West Wing of the Sternwarte became a lively meeting place for the Gottingen mathematical community. Schwarzschild later accepted a call to the Post Dam Observatory and then volunteered to serve in the Army during World War I, a decision that cost him his life. He is remembered today as one of the founders of astrophysics. Schwarzschild's sensitivity to the Jewish question was poignantly revealed by his son Martin, also a renowned astronomer. In his will written before he entered the army, Schwarzschild advised his wife not to let their children know he was Jewish until they were older. She followed this advice after his death. Schwarzschild's decision to join the army in the first place, certainly an unusual step for a professor in his 40s, was prompted by his conviction that German Jews could not expect to overcome anti-Semitism if they were unwilling to go above and beyond the call of duty in their support for the Reich. A number of prominent assimilated Jews, the industrious Albert Ballin, the public servant Walter Rathenau, and the chem chemist Fritz Haber, to name a few, share this conviction. In 1909, Minkowski died suddenly after suffering an attack 
of acute appendicitis. A number of apocryphal stories have since circulated describing how Klein and Hilbert chose his successor, but none of these squares with the facts, which indicate that the Gottingen faculty was not at all clear whom it wanted to nominate. The faculty ended up nominating, naming Hurwitz, Otto Blumenthal, and Edmund Landau in no particular order. All three were considered of equal merit. All three happened to be Jewish. Blumenthal, as ordinaris at Aachen, was a former student of Hilbert's and succeeded Dyke as a managing editor of mathematics and NLM. During the Nazi era, he was stripped of this office and eventually died in concentration camp. Blumenthal and Horowitz both had strong connections with Gottingen, but the call went instead to the private docent Landau, a gifted number of theorists, and outstanding representative of the Berlin School. His appointment illustrates, once again, the characteristic feature of Klein's mathematical outlook that had a profound impact on Gottingen's mathematics, namely his consistent pursuit of breadth and balance. Klein was no more mere ideologue pushing a particular approach to mathematics. More than anything else, he respected talented accomplishment regardless of the packing. The Landau style later became one of Bierbach's principal targets of his attacks on Jewish mathematics, and shortly after the Nazi takeover, its leading proponent was forced to resign his position in Gottingen. Another important Jewish mathematician, Gottingen, was Felix Bernstein, who became an austere looking professor for statistics and actual mathematics in 1911. For a time, he was vice president of the local organization of the German Democratic Party, but he also gave up politics when it became clear that his outspoken support for the Weimar Republic was so unpopular that it interfered with his standing in the academic community. A number of leading Jewish mathematicians came to Gottingen from abroad. The Swiss Paul Bernays, the Ukrainian Alexander Ostryky, the Hungarian Theodore von Karman, and John von Neumann, and the Yugoslav Willi Feller. Four others, Richard Curran, Ernest Hellinger, Max Born, and Otto Toplitz, all came from Braslow. Curran took his degree under Hilbert, was decorated during World War I, and later returned to Gaudin as an heir to Klein's position as Wiesenschaftlicher Führer. The height of the Jewish influx came during the Weimar era, but as with so many other aspects of Weimar culture, the pattern was well in place a decade before the outbreak of the war, and with so much else, its demise came quickly on the heels of the Nazi takeover. When the first series of dismissals reached the German university in April 1933, Gottingen lost six faculty members, and four of the six, current Bernstein, Born, and Emily Noether, were Jewish mathematicians or physicists. James Frank did not wait to be fired. He resigned a few weeks earlier in protest against the impending action. Klein's view on Jewish mathematics. During the war years, Peter Klein busied himself with a series of lectures on the history of 19th century mathematics, originally intended for the series Culture de Gegenwart. They remained unpublished for some 10 years until Otto Neuberger and Stephen Cohn Vassen prepared a revised edition shortly after Klein's death in 1925. Since then, this two volume work has become an acknowledged classic that crystallized a lifetime of rich experience spent in the service of mathematical ideas and culture. And yet, like many of Klein's accomplishments, these lectures were very much a communal effort that grew out of the intense interaction with the Gaudian Milieu. He prepared for them by holding a colloquium of the mathematical literature of the period during the night, summer of 1914. Among those who attended were current. Carthia Theodori and Debye. After the war broke out, however, it became clear that most of the younger mathematicians with whom he had been counting on to help him with the lectures would be called into the army. Thus it happened that during the first two semesters, they were written up by Klein's daughter Elizabeth, who had studied mathematics and physics at Bernmart and Gottingen rather than by one of his assistants, assistants, as was the custom. During the second semester, these lectures attracted 28 listeners including the professors Runge, uh, Cara Theodori, Bernstein, and Edward Reek, and six women. Among the latter was Emily Noether, who came to Gottingen in April 1915 and played a large role in assisting Klein from the moment she arrived. Her lecture notes are full of references to meetings with Fräulein Noether, who became even more frequent after he began to concentrate on the mathematical foundations of relativity theory. Klein's interest in the field dated back to the days when Minkowski was laying the mathematical groundwork for special relativity. His interest in the general theory was ignited after Einstein gave six lectures on the subject in Gottingen during the summer of 1915. Shortly thereafter, Einstein wrote, to my great joy, succeeded in convincing Hilbert and Klein completely. This satisfaction wore off rather quickly, however, as by November, both Einstein and Hilbert had serious misgivings about the Einsteinian Grossman theory 
and were engaged in intense correspondence that eventually led to the discovery of the 10 gravitational field equations for general relativity. In the wake of the exciting activity, Klein began a new lecture series on invariant theory and its applications of classical electrodynamic theory and special relativity. He also began a related investigation of the mathematical foundations of general relativity theory, which resulted in three papers published in 1918. And all this work, he, like Hilbert, relied heavily on Emily Noether's expertise in differential invariant theory. She went on to generalize their work by demonstrating the underlying connection between variation principles and conservation laws in physics. The capstone to this elegant theory to, uh, is today known as Noether's theorem in the calculus of variations. Having suggested some of the circumstances surrounding Klein's lecture, in, it remains to consider the content insofar as it relates to his views on Jewish versus German mathematics. The ed editor of recent English translation, the first volume of Klein's lectures, Robert Herman offers the disturbing assessment of their character. Klein certainly spoils his case for us by his blatant nationalism and racism. Judging from a statement here, he hated most in descending order Frenchmen, Jews, and Axiomatists. It is a good thing there were no Franco-Judaic Axiomatists. It would be almost funny if there had been no Hitler to pander the disease of the German intellectual mind. Exaggerated by the verdict may be, it was certainly worth examining what Klein actually said in these lectures that could have prompted such harsh words. The Jewish question surfaces most often in Klein's remarks about individual mathematicians, such as J.J. Sylvester. As a personality, Sylvester was outwardly lively, witty, and sparkling. He, had a splendid, he was a splendid speaker who often distinguished himself with his striking, clever, versifying, in the brilliance and versatility of the spirit, he was a true representative of his race. He was descended from a purely Jewish family. Klein's portrait of Jacoby was not nearly so flattering. Less deep and originally than Abel, yet much more versatile, Jabel pos Jacoby possessed not only the impulse to acquire pure scientific knowledge, but also the desire to impart it. This drive to activate other manifested itself on the one hand in brilliant pedagogical talent and on the other in strong determination to assert his personality, even to the point of inconsiderateness. The keenness and versatility of his brilliant mind together with the infamous and often feared sarcastic wit supplied him with the most effective weapons for his incessant battles, although he was often seduced into using them imprudently. Crying went out to point out that Jacoby's encountered difficulties in gaining acceptance as a member of the Koenigsberg faculty, as it was reported that he had said something unpleasant to everyone on it. In closing, as account of Joe Jacoby's career, he had this to say. It is well known in the year 1812, brought with it the emancipation of the Jews in Prussia. Jacoby was the first Jewish mathematician to take a leading place in Germany. In doing so, he was again at the forefront of great and for our science significant development. This measure opened up a large reservoir of new mathematical talent for a country whose power, along with those of French immigrants, very soon bore through, born fruit. It appears to me that our science has won a strong stimulant through this type of blood replenishment, although with the already mentioned law regarding ships and productivity from country to country, I would like to designate this phenomenon as the effect of national infiltration. This unfortunate choice of terminology was later exploited by the Nazi psychologist Eric Jantz, who argued that Klein was a forerunner of his own pseudoscientific racial theory. Jantz first introduced the jargon of S-type and J-types that Berenbach borrowed to characterize the thinking of Jewish and Aryan mathematicians, respectively. Later, Jantz got into the act himself in his 1939 study uh, dedicated to Felix Klein as German educator, early champion of German-oriented sciences. He even claimed that it was Klein who prompted him to investigate the connection between race and mathematics. This prompting allegedly took place during the winter semester of 1909 to 10, where Klein held a seminar on the psychology of mathematics. From the passages cited above, it seems clear that Klein accepted uncritically the racial views that colored the thinking of his time. The Jewish question, as Klein perceived it, centered on an ethnic type rather than the number of a religious faith. Jacobi, after all, had been baptized. Still, the biological metaphor, German mathematics regenerated by new blood, made it clear for Klein, unlike Jensen Bierbach, this intermixture of Teutonic and Semitic peoples was a sign of health, not a disease in German society. According to Jens, Klein was intrigued by the conflict between German spirit and the preponderance of a completely different type of thinking in mathematics, and continually returned to this scheme in his seminar, despite the fact that it was intentionally repressed 
by several of the participants. And doubtful, however, that Jentz ever attended the seminar and his name does not appear on the protocol book. In any event, the document gives a detailed and very different impression from that conveyed by Jentz and what actually went on in the seminar. Although the topics discussed were problems in the space of perception, the work of Pesnozoli and Herbert, Reckoning Prodigies and Blindfolded Chess Players, George Cantor's Philosophy of Mathematics, and the philosophy of space perception. Klein's keen interest in these questions is evidenced by the fact that this was one of the few seminars for which he wrote out the protocol himself. Moreover, he dominated the podium throughout, discussing the working methods of Gaussley and other figures. The ratio did not surface, did surface on one occasion when a student asked Steckel, named Steckel, spoke about his teaching experience in Eastern Europe. On the basis of these, he maintained that Jews and Germans conceptualize differently when performing calculations to subtract three-fourths from seven and one-fourth. For example, the German would first reduce each by one-fourth and then calculate seven and a half, seven minus a half to six and a half. The Jews, on the other hand, would convert seven and a quarter into 29 over four and then subtract to obtain 26 over four. This example is no doubt meant to illustrate the usual stereotype that Jews excelled in logical thinking, whereas Germans thought intuitively. In another meeting, Felix Bernstein stressed the environment and training, even at an advanced level, play a more important role than heredity in determining a mathematician's outlook and style. Outlook and style. But to return to Klein's lectures, perhaps the most telling of his remarks about a Jewish style of mathematics is his passage on Leopold Nackenecker, in that he was mainly concerned with arithmetic and algebra in later years, however, settling upon definite intellectual norms and for all mathematical work. He appears as the specifically Jewish t talent, although in a special individual form, to be sure. Kronecker was certainly a controversial character who made a great many enemies in the course of his career, George Cantor being the best known case in point. When the time came to a point, his successor, Klein, wrote, Altor for a lengthy report on Berlin mathematics that began with the following observation. Without question, the positive aspects have been born primarily to Conacher. In this respect, I must not withhold my praise that Conacher, even in the last years of his life, was able to bring new ideas to science and with such useful, youthful ambition, and thereby to uphold Berlin's old fame as a center of mathematical research in a new form that is on that is an accomplishment one can only admire without reservation. My critique merely concerns the one-sidedness in which Conacher, from a philosophical standpoint, fought against various scientific directions that were remote from his own. The one-sidedness was probably less grounded in Conacher's original talents than it was in the disposition of his character. Unconditional mastery, if possible, over all German mathematics became more and more the goal which he pursued with all his cleverness and tenacity he could muster. Little wonder that there is no one to take his place now that he's left the arena. There's no question that Knack revealed an immense influence in those in his Berlin University, a member of the Berlin Academy, is co-editor of the journal. In the all-important spirit of academic appointments in the mathematics, he was probably the most powerful figure in Germany during the 1880s. Thus, it is ironic that Klein, the heir to the title during the Wilhelmian era, should have criticized Nackner's lust for power, a trait that was more than readily apparent in his own character and that he normally admired in others as well. Still, as Klein well knew, power and popularity seldom go hand in hand, and Conkler's Jewish background meant that he was all the more likely to come under attack, considering the following remarks made by the his colleague Weir Strauss in his letter to Sonia Kavaletsky. Conkler is different from their mutual colleague Ernst Kummer. He quickly makes himself familiar with everything that is new. His ready ability to grasp enables him to do so, but not in a penetrating manner. He does not possess the talent to engage himself in a good but unfamiliar work with some scientific interest that he pursues his own studies. Beyond this, he shares the shortcoming that one finds in many intelligent people, especially those of Smithic stock. He does not possess sufficient fantasy, intuition, I prefer to say, and is true a mathematician who is not something of a poet will never be a complete mathematician. Comparisons are instructive and all-embracing vision focused on the loftiest ideals distinguishes uh, Niels Hendrik, Abel from Jacobi, Riemann from his contemporaries, Eichenstein, uh, Rosenheim, and Hermann von Hemholtz from Kirchhoff in an altogether splendid manner.
These remarks echoed the very same stereotypes set forth by the anti-Semites like Dingler and Baerbach 50 years later and are a good illustration of how deeply rooted such thinking was in German culture. Indeed, very similar stereotypes were often commonplace in physics. Arnold Sonnenfeld, for example, once wrote Lorentz that Einstein's work seemed to him almost unhealthy in non-constructible and un intuitive dogmatism. An Englishman could hardly have produced this theory, perhaps it expresses like that of Emil Cohn, the abstract conceptual approach of the Semite. What makes this pronouncement especially noteworthy is that Sommerfeld's own institute in Munich was later fingered by Nazi scientists along with Gottingen as being the very hub of Jewish conspiracy in physics. In fact, Jonathan Stark was able to prevent Werner Heisenberg from succeeding Sommerfeld in Munich by attacking him as the Osinski of physics as a white Jew in the Schwarzkarps. The men of integrity like Klein, Weir, Strauss, and Sommerfeld were incapable of freeing themselves from the conventional racial thinking of their day is certainly suggestive of how pervasive these prejudices must have been. On the other hand, it is important to distinguish the views of someone like Felix Klein from those of Baerbach, Stark, and the like. Although Klein believed that Jews probably had innately different mental capacities than most Germans, he recognized their legitimacy as a minority within the society and their positive contribution to German culture. This was certainly not the case with Birnbach and his group identified the dominant style of Jewish mathematicians with a degenerate form that poisoned the souls of Deutsch mathematics. Theirs was a political activist form of racism that sought to avenge the betrayal of the Reich by the international conspiracy of Jews, who they believe aided and abetted enemies both at home and abroad. Thus, Birnbach and Jane sought to discredit the French liberal tradition by including Descartes, Laplace, Augustin Cauchy, Hen Henry Pankier, and the S-types, along with the Jews. And when Edmund Landau, formerly one of Klein's trusted colleagues, was driven from his post in Gottinger's senior mathematical after belligerent Nazi students organized a boycott of his class, Baerbach justified this travesty as a healthy reaction of German youth against Jewish mathematics. Landau, he pointed out, was so imbued with the Jewish spirit that in one of his textbooks even defined the number pi by means of an infinite series. Gottingen Mathematics and Weimar Culture. One of the characteristic features of Felix Klein's mathematics was that his ideas were very much in the air. In the time he expounded them, unlike many of the great mathematicians of the 19th century, Gauss, Cauchy, Abel, Riemann, Weir, Strauss, and Lee, Klein was the antithesis of the lonely genius working away from his study. For him, mathematics was essentially a matter of communication, and much of his best work was undertaken in consultation with his colleagues and students. Thus, he longed for an environment with as much human interaction as possible. In Gottingen, he realized this lifelong ambition. During the Weimar era, Gottingen inaugurated a quiet revolution that has since placed a giant gulf between the mathematics of the 19th century and the mathematics as practiced today. I'm referring not so much to the content of the new mathematics that came out of Gottingen, important as the modern algebra, quantum mechanics, and the metamathematics certainly were. What I have in mind is the rather the development of fundamentally new type of mathematical community that has now rendered the traditional 19th century modes of communication and eventually largely obsolete. Mathematicians today is essentially an oral culture. To keep abreast of it, one must attend conferences and workshops, or better yet, be associated with leading research center where the latest developments from near and afar are constantly being discussed. By the time an important result actually appears in print today, it is probably no longer new. In any case, it will probably be impossible to understand the work without the aid of an interpreter who already knows the thrust of the argument through an oral source. Thus, somewhere along the line, there was a revolutionary shift from a static print-oriented mathematical culture to a dynamic oral culture, and no one played a more distinctive, decisive role in the transformation of the Felix Klein, the architect of the modern Gattinger tradition. Klein had a unified vision of open-ended scientific milieu that was grounded in mathematics but spanned the gamut of the natural science and their applications to technology. Shortly after the turn of the century, when Schwarzschild, Frentel, Runge, and Weichart were all in Gottingen, Klein began conducting a series of joint seminars with his colleagues on topics like hydrodynamics, uh, elasticity theory, technical mechanics, electrotechnology, and the motion of construction of ships. Hilbert and Minkowski also took a profound interest in mathematical physics, but their activity never reached beyond the purely theoretical sphere. It was Klein who provided the real glue that held the diverse aspects of the Gattingen enterprise together. The point I would like to emphasize here, however, is that the Gattingen scientific community had a distinctly modern social and political orientation that scandalized many conservative academicians 
and not just those who attacked it from afar, although the university was founded on enlightened principles in 1737, Gottinger was anything but a bastion of liberalism. In fact, during the Weimar era, it became one of the strongest northern outposts of the Nazi, Nazi party, which had founded a local organization, Gottinger, in 1922, and by the end of 1923, already had 200 men in uniform. The city's largest newspaper, helped fuel the flames of racial resentment during the 1920s by praising Eric Lundendorf on his 60th birthday as a warrior against Jewry and calling Kurt Tukowski a uh, Hebrew schmutzfink. Tukowski, the leading critic for Karl van Oskinski's weak bolt, was generally regarded as the most brilliant satirist in German language after Heinrich Hein was not only slandered but even threatened by the Tagenblatt, which wrote, unfortunately, no one has yet been found who was willing to mark the star David on this guy's face with a writing whip. By 1925, Gottinger's first new paper had openly come out in support of the Nazi party. Its readers were not on, not long to follow its national elections, though the Nazis always feared much better in Gottinger than the country at large. In 1930, when they garnered only 20% of the vote across the country, they won 38% in Gottinger and the great Nazi victory of July 1930. 32, when the party polled 37% of the vote nationwide, Gottingen gave it an absolute majority. The fraternal organizations that dominate student life of had a long history of anti-Semitism were known for their reactionary politics. When the Prussian minister of culture, Karl Heinrich Becker, brought out a constitution for a national student union that made discrimination by race and religion illegal, 86% of the Gottingen student body voted against it rather than accept a student union in which Jews and other undesirables would be granted free access. They evidently preferred to have none at all. Five years after the Nazis founded their own student organization in Gottingen in 1926, they attained an absolute majority of the student congress. This shift to the right largely met with the approval of Gottingen faculty, as its members, too, had strong leanings in this direction, although they were not as radical as the students. Most of those who were politically active belonged to the two traditional parties of the right, the German National People's Party, and the German's People's Party. The German's National People's Party was the more reactionary of the two, and throughout the 1920s, it attracted increasingly greater support. In 1920, 36% of the 98 Gottinger professors were politically active, either as party members or having made speeches for a particular party. The breakdown was as follows. 15 for the German National People's Party, 11 for the German Democratic Party, nine for the DVM, one German Communist Party. In 1927, the activity rate was 42%, and the breakdown 54% for the DMVP, 23 for the DVM, 15% for the DPM. By 1931, the DMVP was even stronger. The Gottingen Philosophical Faculty was composed of two Spartan, one from mathematics and the natural science, the other from humanities, which until 1922 voted together on major matters of business. In most cases, the system function smoothly enough as the concerns of the one group were usually a matter of indifference to the other. Starting around 1910, however, a series of conflicts arose and ultimately made the working arrangements untenable. One of these concerned Emily Noether, who became a test case for the issue of whether women would be allowed to assume the duties of a docent at a German university. The fact that Noether was Jewish and had decidedly left-wing political leanings was in that instance of relatively little importance. The key problem was her sex in 1915. Klein, Hilbert, Landau, Runge, and Cara Theodori forward to Noether's candidacy for the Vinci Legendi in memorandum presented to the ministry. This request never got off the ground, however, as it was repudiated by a number of their colleagues in a separate report this, that effectively stymied the action. Two years later, the same group of mathematicians together with the physicist Waldemar Voigt and Peter Debye petitioned the ministry again, this time voicing their concern that Noether might be inclined to habilitate at the newly founded university in Frankfurt if she were not allowed to do so at Gottingen. The ministry responded by assuring her supporters that there was no need for alarm as there was no possibility that Noether or any other woman would be allowed to teach at any German university. Only with the fall of the Reich two years later did this situation improve. Emily Noether was properly, promptly made a private docent but even so, she never promoted beyond the level of an official Austin Don't Look or Professor. Beyond this particular confidant within the Gottinger Philosophical Faculty, there were large, there was a number of other open disputes regarding the admission and promotion of foreign students, the preparatory education to be required of all students, 
and the qualification of various candidates who were being considered for chairs in philosophy. According to the spokesman for the Humanist, writing in 1918, the two Spartan had completely different principles and viewpoints regarding these and other matters, which would make it impossible to avoid friction in the future. The situation clearly indicates the limitation of Fritz Ringer's assumption that in their attitudes towards culture and political problems, many German scientists followed the leads of the humanist colleagues, far from following the footsteps of their colleagues. The Gottingen scientists' communities actively opposed the politics of the academic Mandarin caste, the figure constantly singled out by the humanists as their archenemy and the ringleader among the scientific factions, David Hilbert, who was by no means an ivory tower dreamer and naive eccentric popular remembered today. To be sure, he was a colorful character, but he was also a hard-headed negotiator who was deeply engaged in academic politics, and his views carried considerable weight with the friendly colleagues as well as the Prussian ministry. In 1915, for example, not long before his unsuccessful campaign on behalf of Emily Noether, he single-handedly prevented Jonathan Stark from being called to the chair of the experimental physics at Göttingen. Hilbert had immense prestige by, all, by this time, but all the same, this was a remarkable incident motivated by sheer politics. Not only was Stark's candidacy strongly backed by the right-wing physicists Willie Wien and Philip Lennard, but nearly everyone regarded his scientific credentials as superior to those of his competitor. Even Hilbert acknowledged this, but he insisted that Stark, as a volkish nationalist and outspoken anti-Semite, was simply unacceptable for Göttingen, and he apparently persuaded Debye to this view. No one was in a position to argue otherwise. Hilbert's last and most spectacular collision with the humanist at Göttingen was part of his long-standing feud concerning the philosopher Leonard Nelson. Nelson was a true counterculture figure and a constant thorn in the size of the Gestalt and Wiesenschaftler, not only because of his unorthodox philosophical views, but also because he was a considered radical fanatic who advocated for causes like pacifism and socialism. The fact that he was of Jewish extraction probably didn't help now that it matters either. Within the philosophical faculty, his sole supporters were mathematicians and scientists. In fact, Hilbert and Klein alone voted in his favor when he made his first unsuccessful attempt to habilitate in 1906. This habilitation was approved three years later, but he appeared to have almost no prospects for promotion, and his name was anathema to most professional philosophers. Nevertheless, he had unusual dedication and gifts as a teacher, and with time became a cult figure in Göttingen, and he and his devotees had numerous run-ins with fraternal organizations, other nationalists, oriented student groups, scenes that became more frequent and intense after the war broke out. Nelson's fight with the Gottingen faculty were mostly of a petty nature, but his notoriety spread. After the Gottinger Tagenblatt falsely reported that he had evaded military service by feigning illness, he took the paper's editor to court, and the ensuing trial, which lasted over a year, was reported in considerable detail by the Tagenblatt in 1917, the vacancy as Oyster and Dentlicker professor for philosophy opened up in Göttingen, but Nelson was not among those nominated by a majority of the faculty. Hardly a surprise. Hilbert felt this was a gross injustice, however, and drafted a minority report in, in which Nelson alone was named. Still, only five of his colleagues agreed to sign it, not nearly enough to induce the ministry to intervene. But then something unexpected happened. Before this position could be filled, an ordinary in philosophy had become vacant, given Hilbert just the operating room he needed. This time, he and nine others filled a minority report in which they agreed to leave the humanist candidate for or not uncontested if the ministry would agree to convert the other chair into a permanent position for philosophy of the exact scientist. This, that is, placed under the purview of the scientist. Hilbert explained his motives in a letter to address Carl Heinrich Becker in the ministry, having earlier fought in vain to keep Edmund Herschel in Göttingen. He wrote he was determined that Nelson, too, would not be forced to leave, before the ministry could respond, however, these deliberations led to an open break between the two Spartan. In a faithful joint session, of the scientists had demanded that they be entitled to choose a voting member to serve in the commission charged with the initial selection of the candidates for the vacancy in philosophy. Neither faction was willing to budge on the issue, and shortly after, the Hermanists urged the ministry to initiate the process that they had been contemplating for some time, namely the formal division of the faculty. In the meantime, the scientist's recommendation was approved, and 19, 19 Nelson was appointed as an Oyser or Dentlicker professor. There are only some of the events of the circumstance could be cited in support of the thesis that Gottingen's scientific community was a true phenomenon of Weimar culture and one of the world's leading centers for mathematics and physics. Gottingen attracted students and scholars, many of whom became world-renowned, many of them who were women 
foreigners or Jews. Certainly there was no deliberate policy behind this, much less an international Jewish conspiracy, as Hugo Dingler would have it. But then neither was it entirely an accident. It was, to a large extent, the indirect result of the principle that Felix Klein had followed from the beginning of his career, a principle that knew only one criterion for a value of mathematics worth talent Klein's legacy lived in on in the world of mathematics but not through Aryan supremacist and Nazi spokesmen like Ludwig Bierbach nor was it at home of Gadjin when the Nazi member minister of culture Bernard Rust attended a banquet in Gadjin in 1934 he asked Hilbert whether it was true as rumored that the mathematics institute had suffered after the removal of the Jews and their friends Hilbert's famous reply suffered it hasn't suffered or minister it just doesn't exist anymore the Gadjin tradition had gone underground like so many other remnants of Weimar culture. It reemerged a short time later in the United States, though Herman Weil joined Albert Einstein at the Institute for Advanced Study. Emily Noether taught at uh, Bayer Marrow until her unexpected death in 1935. And Richard Current gave the Gottinger tradition its most lasting reincarnation by founding a mathematics institute at New York University. Okay, almost seven hours here today. So a lot of information. Um, you know, somewhat like a diverse um, presentation of various ideas. You know, we talked a lot in you know, the beginning. We talked about Hilbert and Frege and some of their disputes. Then we went into Heidegger and you know his black books, and then actually Heidegger's ironic influence on leading Jewish thinkers and on Zionism and Rabbi Soloveitchik. Um, and you know, we looked at Stark and and we went long you know the history of Gottingen and uh, and then also Herman Herman Cohn's thoughts on Judaism trying to uh, um, you know leading neo-Kantianism and still promoting Judaism and trying to reply to Kant's critiques of Judaism. So a lot of interesting things here. A lot of this will be important for my continued work in truth. It will see, you know, to note this distinction we'll call of mind independence of Kant, Frege, and Heidegger that wants some level, well, certainly of uh, Frege and Kant um, versus uh, the neo-Kantianism and a possible Judaic instinct to have mind dependence as opposed to mind independent science and going back to uh, you know, the birth of math and logic. And we saw like last week with the Jewish and typical interpretation where the Jewish people have a role in truth that like truth is somewhat of a, cooperative process between God and the Jewish people, which, you know, from a scientific perspective would uh, be extremely hard. Although, you know, Herman Cohn in his neo-Kantianism possibly tries to tie this in to neo-Kantianism. Um, and, you know, then the pushback that you have against neo-Kantianism, you know, Cassier and Cohn, and, you know, we talked about the Cassier Heidegger debate in 1929 and uh, so a lot of information I'm going to sign off and yeah Brundle said he's in Detroit so we'll see I'm not sure if he's going to stream or anything but you know I'll meet up with him if he wants um, I'm not sure if he's going to want to stream or, or do anything like that but if he does like I'll, you know a message will do that and uh, so have a great week God bless thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week you know, this week, Thursday, Wednesday night is Tisha B'Av, the, you know, the Jewish day of mourning uh, related to the destruction of the temple. And it was partially why I was reading some of the stuff about you know, anti-Semitism and, you know, Jewish-German uh, division specifically related to the truth concept. And this is probably an issue we're going to return to as we look at like neo-Kantianism and metaphysical concepts and the, the logic, because, you know, Frege has a huge influence on mathematics and philosophy, as does Hilbert. But, uh, you know, the somewhat division of how they view truth is 
and also Heidegger, you know, Kantianism with their critiques of Judaism and their understanding that Judaism has a different conception of truth than the one that they're advancing. So it's a topic we'll return to in the future. So God bless everyone. Have a great week. Um, you're fasting on Tishabov. You have an easy fast and pray for better things. <laughs>